Chapter Twenty Four. Mages in the government are usually well treated, not because of risk of retaliation. Few mages are that stupid, but more that they are indispensable when things go very wrong. Always assume any mage you see in the police force is a valued employee and one that will uphold the highest level of ethics, or will make sure you never live to refute that. House of Emrys Internal Memo. Police officers formed a little cordon to keep the onlookers away as they strung up police tape. The captain, a lexant, and a woman I didn't recognize wearing a colorful teal suit walked up. At least it wasn't Detective Stone, so I'd take it. Corey, you okay? Those were the first words out of a lexant's mouth, and I just nodded. Why did people keep asking that? You sure? You're covered in blood. He gave me a funny look. And I glanced down. My shirt and hands were covered in blood. There was blood on my phone, and trickles of it had run down to drip on my pants and legs. I hadn't even noticed. How could I not have remembered to pull on gloves? Cause it was Joe. Joe's blood. I'm fine. Three shots. None of them hit me. The shooter, Captain Jessup asked, looking around warily. I took a deep, shuddering breath. And faced what I'd been avoiding thinking about since I'd done it. Dead. I kept my voice flat, under control. Carolyn pressed against me harder, purring so deeply it felt like he vibrated against my leg. Excuse me, can we start at the beginning? The woman I didn't know asked, a notebook in her hand. I glanced at her bright amber eyes and a face crowned by layers of braids woven with yellow and red in her black hair. Matching the yellow and cheerful red of her tattoo, and telling me she was an entropy mage. At least there was a possibility she wouldn't hate me on sight, like Stone had. Yes, that might be wise. Corey, this is Detective Olivia Jonas. I've asked her to take over all cases involving you. I gave the captain a look, and he just shrugged. You seem to be a magnet for things going on. And it would be easier to have a central person involved. Obviously, you and Detective Stone don't work well. I'm hoping you and Jonas here will. The detective flashed me a fast smile, the signs of heavy tobacco usage clear on her teeth. But I didn't smell any cigarettes anywhere. That struck me as odd. Can you start at the beginning, Miss Monroe, and tell us exactly what happened? I took a deep breath, focusing on the calm and interested question, not accusing, just interested. This I could deal with. I started with the call and me running, taking a different path, then the shot and me creating the shield. Wait, you did what? Alexant burst out, looking at me, his face pale. I stuttered, trying to figure out what he wanted me to explain. I took a deep breath and tried to explain my logic. I don't have any element but earth. I started and saw all of them glance at my temple. I wanted to sigh, but kept talking. I'd been trying to figure out a way to create shields or something. I didn't miss the start from Alexant, but ignored it. Air would be better, but I don't have it. When the shot went off, all I could do was think about protecting us. But I only had earth. But there's earth everywhere, so I took the idea I'd been playing with, and I created a shield from the dirt. Alexant dropped his glance to the line where everything had collapsed when I dropped it. Is that what this is? Yeah, everything I pulled and let drop. I looked at the line, but two inches thick and half an inch tall. Not much when you realized it had stopped two bullets. You said the perp was dead. Olivia asked. Yeah. I killed him. I think, I didn't think. I knew, but his body might still be breathing. How? If he had fired the word from a gun, it couldn't have come out any sharper. Um, I stuttered, trying to figure out how to explain what I'd done on instinct and desperation. I caused the dust in the air to condense, so the bullet created a path that I could backtrack to its source. They all looked at me, and I wanted to shrink back. But I was already against the wall. It created a ripple in the dust that I backtracked, so I reached out with soul and pulled his out. I think, you what? 
All three of their voices merged as they looked at me. Captain Jessup and Detective Jonas looked shocked, but Alexant looked horrified. Well, I think I did. I pulled out his life, or what was his life. I felt him die as it shredded, or I shredded it. I really didn't know which one it was. Alexant turned on the captain, his voice hard and cold. Sir, we need to stop now. We can't have this recorded. Detective, the only thing that needs to go into your notes is she killed in self-defense. This cannot go into the record. Do you understand? He had a tone of voice that I never heard before, even at the stadium. This goes under OMO sanction now. The detective swallowed and nodded. I hadn't really taken any notes, but the official record will only be that she killed to protect herself. Good. Corey, you never mention this to anyone if I'm not there. Do you understand? Either of them. The shield or the killing. You just say you protected yourself. Nothing else. He had leaned in, was so close I could feel his breath on my skin. Carolyn growled and stepped between us. Alexan glanced down, then stepped back. I'm deadly serious. You do not mention it. Got it. I wanted to ask why. What was I missing? But I didn't. He kept looking around, glaring at anyone that might be close enough to overhear anything from us. Miss Monroe? The detective started. Please call me Corey. I don't feel like a Miss Monroe. She arched an eyebrow at me. I can do that. Can you tell us where the building is that your assailant was on? I pivoted and pointed directly at a building across the street and about five stories tall. Roof. I couldn't see him, but I could feel him. Corey? Alexant warned, and I shrugged. What do you want me to do? Lie? Not say anything? I glared at him. Right at that moment, all I wanted to do was go to the hospital, verify Joe was okay, and make sure the Guzmans didn't hate me. Just don't admit to anything outside the normal spells. He growled out, and I looked at him surprised. We've only started going over the first set in one branch. Spirit isn't until next year as the number of people with it is smaller. I've only had time to read a bit on the basic spells. I paused and looked at him. A cold, twisty feeling in my stomach, even as Carolee entwined around my legs. Are you telling me I did something new? Something no one has done? Damn it, Corey, shut up. He turned and looked at the two cops. The detective looked pale even under her French roast complexion. The captain just looked worried and confused. Jessup looked at the three of us and shook his head. I get the feeling I'm missing something. And in a rare turn of events, I'm finding I don't want to know. Jonas, can I trust you with the department's integrity and to not get us on the wrong side of the OMO? Or get anyone killed just because... Yes, sir. I'll take care of it. She responded instantly. Alexant, don't make me regret this. I'm not a Merlin, but I'll have your career in ashes if you screw me over on this. The captain glared at Alexant as hard as Alexant usually glared at me. I won't. She's young and should never have figured out what they are forcing her to figure out. I'll work on it. Good. He nodded at me and headed away. Shouting at people to get to the top of the building I'd identified, I turned back to look at Alexant, who seemed to have aged five years. What? Did you notify the Guzmans and Sable about Joe? He asked, rubbing his face in a manner that made me feel guilty, and I didn't know what I felt guilty for. Yes, Sable should be there, or almost, and Henry had to pick up Marisol from school. She doesn't get off until four. I looked at my phone. Was it really only 3.30? Good. Go there and keep your mouth shut. Corey, I mean it. I don't want to have to execute you. The words slapped me with a physical force and I staggered. Carolyn leaned against me, snarling, his ears back and tail perfectly still. Don't, Carolyn. You don't understand. Neither of you do. Corey, go. Tell the truth, but no details. Don't tell them any details. Got it? He seemed unbearably exhausted and at the end of his rope. Mutely, I nodded. I snapped the leash on Carolyn and pivoted, walking away from all of them, 
as fast as I could get my legs to move. No one called after me, and it took everything I had not to run. Fear rippled up and down my spine as I tried to process what had just happened. A man I respected, almost liked, just implied he had the authority to execute me. Getting yourself sick from stress does nothing. He hasn't killed you yet. Go see Joe, then worry about possible execution tonight. I stopped my rushed walk and pulled an extra shirt out of my bag, used the ruined one to wipe up most of the blood, then changed. I ignored the odd looks as I stood there in my bra, scrubbing blood off me as best as I could. Once the clean shirt was on, I called a rideshare, wanting to be out of sight, protected at least by the walls of a car. Carolyn said nothing, curled in my arms the entire ride. I sprang out and texted Sable. I'm here. Where are you? Third floor. She should be out of surgery soon. Meet you at elevators. I didn't respond, just headed into the elevators, my insides clenching at the thought of Joe being in surgery. I needed to know more, study more. I would have sacrificed every hair in my head to have healed her on the spot. The elevator took an eternity, and I felt magic gathering around me in waves. I took a deep breath. I made sure I hadn't wrapped anything around me, then stepped out, looking for Sable. Corey! I spun at the sound of her voice and saw her waving me into a small waiting room. Once I got there, I wrapped her in a hug that she returned just as tightly. She's okay. Are you? You have blood on you. She touched my neck and arms where Joe's blood had dried and I hadn't gotten it all off. No, it's all Joe's. Surgery? Minor. They wanted to close up the wound, clean and irrigate it. She should be getting out shortly. Did you call her parents? Sable pulled me down into a seat. Yeah, I think they should be here soon. I hoped. If they were still talking to me after, that would be the real question. We sat in the waiting room, hands clenched together, Carolyn on a seat across from us staring at everything. But he wasn't snarling at anyone, so I figured that was better. The door flew open, and Marisol rushed in. Where is she? Is she okay? Sable and I both stood up as Marisol looked at us. Then she pulled us both into her arms. My girls, are you okay? Corey, why are you bloody? Henry stepped in and pulled the door shut, looking at both of us. Tell us what happened, he asked, but it wasn't a question. It was an order, and one that terrified me. He pulled Marisol into a seat, and then they looked at me, waiting for answers. Tell the truth, but don't give any details. Alexant's words rang in my mind, and I fought to swallow. The blood is from Joe. I forced the words out, but didn't stop even as Marisol gasped. Someone, or ones, is trying to kill me, and when they took a shot at me today, they hit Joe instead. Their hands were white where they were clutching each other. They didn't look at each other, but you could almost hear the conversation between them. Corey, Henry said in slow, heavy tones. Why is someone trying to kill you? And why are we just hearing of this now? Marisol's voice demanded an answer, but she fell silent as Henry's left hand patted her arm. My wall broke, and the words came out, tumbling over each other as I tried to explain. There's this big inheritance thing, and if I graduate, I get it. Some spirit Merlin left it to me, but if I don't graduate by June, Japan gets it. As far as I can tell, they figure if I die, then it's theirs, but I don't know. But they're trying to kill me. I ducked, and they shot Joe instead. We didn't want to worry you. I'm so sorry. I'll leave. Forcing the words out and seeing the look of despair on their faces made my knees buckle, but I didn't let myself crumble. Come on, Carolyn. I turned to the door. Coruscant, where do you think you're going? Marisol snapped out. Um, leaving? I quavered. Get back in here. Well, I'm furious you didn't see fit to tell us someone was trying to kill you. This is not your fault. Now sit down and explain everything. Slowly. Marisol pointed at the chair I'd been in, her face unrelenting. I turned and moved back to the chair, sinking into it. Carolyn hadn't moved, just flicking his ear at me. His entire attitude one of, you're an idiot. 
I sat there rigid with my hands fisted together between my legs and started to talk, explaining everything. Well, just why people wanted me dead or to at least drop out. I didn't talk about the magic I'd used or the offerings, and they never asked. When I was done, they just looked at me, and I got ready for the attack. Oh, Corey, this must have been so scary in so much pressure. Why didn't you tell us? Marisol looked at me, and I just stared back confused. I didn't want to stress you. Didn't want you to get caught up in this mess. I muttered as I stared at the floor. Corey, that is what family does. We worry and get involved. Never fear to tell us something. Marisol took a deep breath. But you're sure Joe will be okay? My head bobbed up and down like a stupid doll. But before I could say anything, the door opened and a woman in surgical scrubs stepped in. Josepha Guzman? All of us sprang to our feet. I felt my world stop as I dreaded the next words. She's just fine. She's in recovery now and you should be able to see her in a few minutes. The world restarted and I sagged back down into the chair. I'd do whatever they wanted. I never wanted to put any of them at risk again. Either I give up or I accept protection and I don't want to give up. Chapter 25 Mages are not miracle workers or demigods. The doctor that operates on you is just as likely to be a magic-free human as a mage. Remember that next time you look down on those without magic. We are everywhere. Freedom from Magic It took two days, but the wound had been a clear through and through. Joe got home, and Marisol only stayed through Sunday before she went home. Before she left, she read all of us the riot act and told us to let her know whatever happened. No excuses. She also told Sable she needed to inform her dad immediately. Her absence both hurt and let us fit back into our routines, though this time Sable ushered Joe to every class, and I never went outside with either of them. Even Carolyn wasn't allowed to walk beside me. He skulked in the shadows and under brush until we got into classrooms, though he made his displeasure clear. Alexant had ordered me to stay under the radar until they could come talk to me, but that wouldn't be until Wednesday night. I spent my time fighting panic attacks and trying to concentrate on classes and making sure I stayed far away from everyone. Wednesday night, I almost looked forward to Alexan's edicts. Ladies, how you feeling, Joe? Alexan asked as they walked in Wednesday, both of them carrying bags with the name of a local sushi restaurant on them. Not too bad. I start the therapy next week, which is good, because I'm tired of this sling Joe replied, curled up on the couch. She made it through classes each day, but it wore her out. But I think the more important thing is what's the plan to keep Corey alive to graduate? Her words took the warmth out of the air. Alexant glanced at Indira, and she shrugged. The government is very concerned and very interested. They have assigned me a special duty to protect you until our ambassador has finished discussing this with Japan. Alexant didn't look at me as he talked, but pulled out boxes of food for us. While I would not argue about free sushi, the information he relayed left me stunned. I'm an international incident? I needed to get my voice under control. Indira never sounded this shocked. And then some. The problem is, so far Japan is disclaiming any knowledge of these attempts, and pointing out that what unaffiliated groups do is not their problem. But the money offered for the hit is being held in escrow accounts. Chris is working on backtracking it. It will probably take another month or so, but as long as we can keep you alive, an agreement should be worked out, and the danger should pass. I didn't know what to say. Carolyn whispered in my mind, Powerful, dangerous queen. That didn't help my mental state at all. What does that mean? It means Indira and I will be with you when you leave this apartment. Don't sit out on the balcony and try to keep windows and blinds closed until we can get the bounty on you rescinded. He looked exhausted, 
and I couldn't blame him, but it still didn't mean I liked any of this. We are hoping to have it done before summer, but right now you just need to stay alive until then. My life. How bad do I want this? The problem was, it wasn't that I wanted the house that bad. Oh, I wanted it. But this badly? Probably not. But I couldn't give in to the people threatening me, trying to control me via fear. I just couldn't. Joe and her family, even Sable, were more important. But if they could get me to do things by threatening me, where would it end? I'd been worried about the societies and owing them, but this was just as bad. If I gave in on this, anyone could decide threats would make me cave. And that I couldn't afford. Will you explain now what the issue was at the store and why you threatened to kill me? Both Joe and Sable's heads snapped up as they stared at him and then me. I didn't move, just looked at him. This I needed an answer to. Corey, I swear you stumble into things. His voice wasn't quite a mutter, but he looked like I'd dropped another weight on his shoulders. Yes, I'll explain. Everyone fill your plates. This will take a bit. Even though my stomach roiled, I knew I needed the food. So I got my plate and helped Sable get a plate for Joe before we settled down. As usual, Indira and Alexa sat at the table while we curled up on the futon and chair. This had become so common, we'd reorganized the room a bit to make it so the table and our living room furniture created a bit of a circle, if a rather lopsided one. I poked at my shrimp and California roll. I knew I needed to eat, but my stomach was in such knots that all I could do was move it around on my plate. Carolyn, on the other hand, had no such nerves. He was gleefully eating the raw pieces of fish from the pile they had pulled out for him. The sushi restaurant did a brisk side business and all the pieces of fish that weren't considered suitable for humans to eat. But carnivore familiars had no issues consuming. It was a win-win for both groups. His favorite were eel and octopus. He had mentioned once they were delicacies in the other plains, as most creatures of that type were bigger than elephants. He never explained how he knew so much when he came here as a kitten, and I got the feeling some things would always be a mystery. In the scope of things, his odd knowledge was the least of my concerns. Most mages aren't forced to use their magic to protect themselves, Corey. Those that are tend to be very well trained. These incidents have a large part of the magical community, and the society specifically, in an uproar. You don't target young mages. Part of it is ethics, but the other part is what you are doing now. His voice sounded as exhausted as he looked, and I swore he'd added some gray to his temples since this summer. Which is what? I asked, exasperated. I couldn't figure out what he was talking about, and that worried me. Using your magic outside the prescribed spells. And Deer's voice had a wealth of emotions to it I didn't know how to untangle, so I just looked at both of them, all too aware of Joe and Sable watching with wide eyes. A huge part of college is to train you in how to use your magic. We present it in boring scientific terms, measuring everything out, and beat into you the spells in each branch. Generally, by the time you graduate, you'll argue to the death that this is the only way to use magic, with everything quantified. And that is how most of governments in the world want it. They want you following the rules. By the time you realize it isn't the only way, you tend to be old enough to keep your mouth shut because you see the possibilities of what could happen if people realize that it is damn near unlimited if you're creative. I don't understand. I thought we'd tried other ways to use magic and either the cost was too high or people died, Sable said, watching all of this with confusion on her face. Exactly. That is what you and everyone else are supposed to believe. And if you don't get convinced of that during your draft, or act as if you are, you'll not survive the draft. That's why this is so serious. Not because you get injured or hurt during your service, but because you get arrogant and prove you can't be trusted out in the world. You're eliminated quickly and quietly. Alexan's voice sounded like lead weights hitting the floor. Really? The government kills mages? 
Joe all but squeaked the words and her chopstick slipped from her fingers, hitting her plate with a dull thud. No, the government kills mages that are a risk to the population at large because they are too reckless with their magic. You, Corey, are finding out that magic can be used in many ways outside of the very narrow branch we teach. Most people find it rather boring because of how we teach it and never do much more than what they have to. He shifted his attention to Joe. Joe, how often do you see your parents use magic? Your father shaved his head. How much does he use the magic available to him? Joe blinked and shrugged. Not very often. I mean, mommy will control the heat sometimes or do little things with fire. But I don't remember them using it that much. Her words were slow, and I thought back at the same time. For all that, Shay, Laurel, Marisol, and Henry were mages. I didn't remember ever seeing them actually do magic. That is how most are. They have it. We pound it into you. Keep it in reserve just in case. You might need it, and not having it then would be awful. But most mages below archmages almost forget how to use it outside work unless it is a true emergency. And that is how most governments and the OMO want it. Using magic makes hurting others way too easy. But most other things aren't all that improved by it. Alexant turned his attention to me. You are very dangerous and very much at risk. You are Merlin with more power than they have ever recorded. You have a familiar. You can do things for almost nothing that most archmages can't do at all. The geeks at OMO still can't figure out how Joe managed to break all those nicotine bonds, and we just pointed at Carolyn because nothing else makes sense. Joe focused intently on her food, not looking at any of us. Sable squeezed her hand, but they didn't say anything. Bottom line, we need to keep you safe, and you need to learn to follow the rules or you won't live long enough to worry about doing anything after your draft, much less enjoy the inheritance you are fighting so hard to earn. I flinched back from every word. None of this sounded good. Carolyn growled softly and came to jump onto the chair and lean into me, purring. My queen, powerful is good. No one else reacted, so I figured those words were just for me. They didn't help. While powerful might be good in his world, in this world, it might get me killed. So you're telling me, bow my head, be a good little girl, or I'm going to end up dead either one way or the other? Yes, he said, eyes locked on me. Indira touched my arm lightly. Corey, this is one of the reasons that we urged you to join the House of Emrys at least. You don't normally go after members of your own house and you've proved you're powerful enough that it might tempt some of the other higher-level people to take you out, just to prove they can. Emrys has a habit of slapping down anyone that does that. It is more implied than actual. But yes, you need to lower your profile. I wanted to scream, to rage, to tell them to fuck off. But the pale look on Joe's face and Sable's white knuckles made me take a deep breath and reel it in. Time to grow up. If I shut up and be the good little girl for what, the next 15 years? After that, maybe I'll be mostly free. But only if I live. Very well. What's next? Some of the tension bled out of Indira and Alexand. Indira perked up a bit, and until that moment, I hadn't realized how stressed she looked. You'll join Emrys? She asked, watching me. Yes, I'll contact Joanne tomorrow. I'd like to hold off on the others, but I'll join. And I paused and looked at Stephen, even thinking his name caused a ripple of pain. I'll deal with the bodyguards. Thank Merlin. He muttered, rubbing the bridge of his nose. So, like I said, what's next? You get your degree. You'll get a bulletproof vest to wear, and Indira or I will be with you while you're moving between classes. We are going to get some protections, both normal and magical, put on your apartment, and you will hate every minute. I'm hoping we can lift it by summer, but Corey, we aren't doing this to punish you. 
No, just to control me. Congratulations. But I wasn't bitter, just tired. Eating seemed like too much effort, but I did want to know a few things. So how will you protect me? I mean, you said I couldn't talk about what I did, so how will you do that? Air branch, move spell. What you did with dirt, most can do with air. Create a shield around you that will deflect or stop most things. Again, if they really want to kill you with magical means, they can. But in some ways, the fact that you are so high profile is protecting you from that. The ambassador is pushing, so we'll see what happens. I nodded and forced myself to eat a piece of sashimi. It went into my stomach like a lump of mud. Dealing with reality ruined even the treat of sushi. What about... I wanted to ask about what I'd done with the soul magic, but banging on the door startled me. I got it. Sable jumped up before anyone else could move, before anyone could protest, and pulled open the door. A huge man, at least six foot three, stood there, hair and long braids down his back, dark, angry eyes, and muscles everywhere under skin that looked ebony in the yellow hall light. He glowered down at Sable, and I felt my magic spike ready to respond. Even as I scrambled to my feet, I focused on the green and white tattoo that proclaimed him a transform mage. Chapter 26 Clashes between the OMO and the military are legendary and usually revolve around hair and nails. While Merlins can perform easier with less offering, most others need the genetic material to use their magic effectively. The military has stood by their insistence on short hair and nails while in service. While women find it easier, being able to put their hair up, it requires a member of the military to fight to keep their long hair and nails. While it is illegal to force them to remove it, pressure to do so can be intense if the service member doesn't understand the laws that protect them. Magic explained. Dad! Sable threw herself into his arms, and the mage standing in the hall wrapped her tight. Baby girl, he murmured as he held her tight. I felt my magic subside, and my knees went weak as I sank back into the chair. If this was how I was going to react to everything, ready to attack, I really wasn't safe around either Sable or Joe. Maybe I should get a place by myself a hotel or something, for a while. Sable released the death grip she had around him and stepped back. Come on in, I need to introduce you. He followed her in and I saw the military in his every movement. His eyes scanned the room, lingering on the Merlin tattoos of Indira and Alexand. Then his eyes somehow got darker as they landed on me. She made introductions and lingered on Joe. And, Dad, this is Joe. Everyone, this is my dad, Colonel John Lancet. John smiled, but I noted that it didn't reach his eyes. That was probably my fault. Just John. I retired last year. I woke up in Aberdeen for the DOD. He shifted his attention to Sable. I believe you sent me a note that someone had tried to kill your girlfriend's best friend. He looked pointedly at Joe, who still had the sling on, and needed at least two more weeks to finish giving the wound time to heal. Hi, she said weakly. Nice to meet you. I could see the panic in her gaze. Meeting parents had never been her strong suit. You must be the friend people are trying to kill. He looked directly at me. Um, yeah, sorry. I didn't know for sure why I was apologizing, but I wasn't sure what else to say. He shifted his intimidating stare to Indira and Alexant. While they didn't flinch or pull back, I saw them react to his gaze. Mentors or government flunkies? Both in my case, Alexant said, rising to stand between John and Indira. Why do you ask? My daughter has never been one to back down from a fight, which means she won't go anyplace safe. And I can't imagine the government not being involved when there are hits out on Merlin's students. So what are you going to do to keep them safe? He crossed his impressive arms and stared down at Alexan. This guy might become my new hero. 
Can I trade him for Alexant? Alexant sighed. Ugh, take a seat. He waved at the other chair, and the three adults started to talk. Or it felt like that. The adults talking and the kids waiting for orders from on high. The three of them deciding my life without including me in it. But for now, I just sat and listened. What else could I do? I picked up my food as they went over plans, but other than John casting a sharp eye at me and stating, She needs to get in better shape. I wasn't part of the conversation. I curled up more and more, wanting to yell and shout, but I didn't dare do any of that. Maybe this stupid house wasn't worth it. I listened to them talk, making plans as to what I was going to do, what needed to be done. I felt like an object, the precious grail they needed to protect, not myself. Enough. Everyone, out. Joe's voice snapped out, and the three people at the table turned to look at her, surprised and shock on their faces. Mine probably looked the same as I stared at her. What? Was I not clear? Everyone who doesn't live here, out. She struggled to her feet, the grayness under her skin tone telling me how exhausted she was, and I surged to my feet, guilt adding fresh pain to my misery. What are you talking about? We're figuring out the best way to keep Corey safe, to keep all of you safe, Alexant said, dismissing Joe with a wave of his hand and turning back to John. Indira narrowed her eyes as she watched us. She hadn't said much in the last 20 minutes or so. No, said Joe. You're trying to run our lives, and we're done. We are not 12. We're not your responsibility. I'm exhausted, need to take pain meds, and pass out. Corey is on the verge of tears, and Kerlian is ready to shred all of you for making his mage miserable. Until she said those words, I hadn't registered how agitated Kerlian was. Like me, he wanted to do something. Escape, attack, defend. But there wasn't anyone to attack. His rumble wasn't a purr, but a low, steady growl as his tail twitched and claws extended and retracted. Now look, Corey's agreed she needs protection, but it isn't that simple. Alexan started, and John matched his expression, his gaze locked on his daughter. Yes, it is. Joe cut them all off. Get out, and when you show up tomorrow to escort Cory to class, you can then explain to her how you will work with her to stay safe and not treat her like some mindless piece of fluff you need to work around. We haven't... He started, and Joe just stared at him, her face getting grayer. Yes, we have, and she's right. Indira rose and nodded to Joe, and then to me. We are forgetting this is your life, too. And you need to be actively involved if we want you to succeed, much less thrive. Ladies, thank you for your hospitality. Stephen will be here in the morning. Well, I'll see you in class and probably walk you between classes. Time bubbles are perfect for protection, and I'll see about training you on how to create and use them. Indira walked to the door, then turned, lifting an eyebrow. Gentlemen, this is what is known as a subtle hint We've overstayed our welcome. Alexant growled under his breath, but stood looking at me, then his face softening a bit as he looked at Joe. I'll be here in the morning. Corey, don't you dare leave without me, and we'll talk more as we walk. You do need to be part of this. He sighed and shook his head as he headed out the door. They closed the door behind them, leaving John looking at his daughter. I uh, did it again, didn't I? He asked, hunching his shoulders and sinking into himself a bit. For a man who must top six feet, he suddenly looked like a little boy about to be put in the corner for a timeout. If you mean coming in and taking over with no cares as to what I want or need, only what you think is best? Yes. Sable sighed and walked over to her dad. <sighs> I love you. But we aren't kids, and Cory might be the most powerful mage on the face of the earth right now. People really need to quit treating her like this, or they may lose her. And you, Dad, aren't helping. He sighed and rubbed his head. Why don't you go put your girlfriend to bed? She looks like she's about to fall over. 
Then come out and talk to me. Tell me what's been going on. Please? Give us a few. She grabbed Joe, and I jumped up to support her other side. Together, we ushered Joe to bed as she really was about to fall over. We got pain pills in her and tucked her in. I think she was asleep before we walked out of the room. My dad's a good guy. Just a bit too gung-ho sometimes. Talk to him. See if he has any input. If nothing else, having another point of view can't hurt, right? Her tone had too much pleading in it, and I nodded. There wasn't anything to lose, and right now my stomach churned too much to even think about going to bed, no matter what time class was in the morning. Dad, Corey's going to tell you everything about what is going on, and then maybe you can give her some ideas. Anything, baby girl. And I'm so sorry, Miss Corey. I see a problem, I dive in and fix it. Even if no one wants me to be the one fixing it. Sable here never managed to beat that out of me. Though she at least got me to listen if she told me she just wanted to vent. Otherwise, I tend to jump a bit fast. Bad habit in an army officer. His tone had mellowed, and I sat down, feeling silly. Carolyn rubbed on my legs as he passed by but he didn't seem to pay much attention now that Indira and Alexit were gone. I'll try, but I need to go back a bit to explain everything. I glanced at Sable one more time, and she nodded encouragingly as she made us hot chocolate in the kitchen. Just the scent helped steady me, so I started to talk. And talk. And talk. We'd started at around 6.30, Alexant and Indira had left at quarter to nine when Joe kicked them out. But something about her dad and the fact that Sable just let me talk, likely hearing aspects of the story that were new to her, kept me going. By the time I finished spilling everything, it was 10.15, and exhaustion lay on me like a layer of concrete, cracking here and there. You've been through a lot in the past year, and... It doesn't look like it's getting any more boring. He gave a sidelong look at his daughter. You sure you want to stay around all of this? The smirk and relaxed stance of his body told me he was joking, but I still tensed a bit. After all, who wanted to stay around my brand of luck? No place else I'd rather be. Besides, who doesn't want the most powerful Merlin on the planet as a friend? She winked at me as she said that, and Carly purred in my head. Silly queens. We both snickered, though her dad just looked at us with a slight frown. Inside joke? Something like that. Any thoughts after listening to my tale of woe? I spoke lightly, but I couldn't help but pull the cup closer to me, wanting more of the hot, sweet liquid. You need the bodyguards, but I get not wanting to give up your life. If this was going to be a long-term problem... My advice would be different. But now... He leaned back, looking at me, and then his daughter. They're that important to you? Yes. Her answer had nothing but assurance, and I wanted to melt. I knew Joe was that important, but me? That still seemed far-fetched. Very well. He shifted his attention to me, and I wanted to squirm. You won't like what I have to say, but for now... Like any other recruit in the military, you're going to have to suck it up and deal. You don't have the skill sets right now to keep yourself and those you care about safe. You might have the power, but that brings down a world of hurt. As you're quickly learning, you can handle a year and a half. Eighteen months is nothing. I kind of already figured that. Doesn't mean I'm happy about it. I didn't mutter. Not quite. But still... Who liked to be told they didn't really have a choice in the matter? Welcome to the wonderful world of Dalton. It's never as great as you thought it would be. As to the next part? He paused, looking at his daughter, who gave him a teeny nod. Since Sable's been gushing about Joe's cooking and the fact that while the mage draft covers your tuition, you, unlike most students, don't have a family or another support system to help cover you. I'm sending an extra 300 a month for your little household. I started to protest, but he stopped me with a single finger. Marisol had nothing on him for commanding an audience. Keep my baby girl safe and shove your degree down those bastards' throats. 
and I'll consider it well worth it. You don't need the extra stress of trying to pay for food on top of everything else. Keep what you got saved and use it as needed. You're a smart girl. The money will get you through this. I didn't want to accept the money. I really, really didn't. But he was right. Trying to not get killed, studying, taking care of Carolyn, worrying about Joe and Sable and the Gusmans was pushing me to my limit already. Thank you, I said slowly, each word being pulled from me. Don't. I've had people try to kill me. Often the only thing that got me through was knowing my friends had my back. My daughter and Joe have firmly placed themselves at your back. Don't squander that. It's more priceless than anything you can imagine. The next 15 minutes were Sable and her dad talking, as I cleaned up and got everything ready for the next morning. Old habits died hard, and I still didn't trust that things wouldn't go sideways and make me late. I had enough teachers miffed with me for the classes I had missed. John left about the time I headed to bed, and I paused to glance at Sable. I like your dad. He's pretty great. Having me leave was hard on him. It's been the two of us since I was a baby. But that right there is why I left. He means well, but he's trained to solve problems by any means necessary. Makes him a great commander. (laughs) She snickered. And a frustrating father. I need to do college by myself. She cast a glance at the closed bedroom door where I could just hear Joe snoring. I just never expected to find someone like her or you. Sable looked at me and smiled. I get that the two of you are a matched pair, and the more I'm around you, the more right it feels. Don't worry, I'm not going anywhere, and Joe wouldn't leave you on the threat of death. And that's what worries me. No one should get killed because of me. I couldn't look at her. It still ate at me that Joe almost died because of me. No one should be killed because some dead guy left them something in his will. I felt her hand under my chin, and she lifted it to look me in the eye. Corey, you've never been allowed to have anything that is yours, and under your power most of your life. I understand why you want this so badly, and it's okay. We're a team. We got your back. She pulled me into an unexpected hug, and I almost started crying. Sable held me for the longest minute, her black ringlets a curtain around me. I finally managed to pull back and smile at her. Deal, but all of us are going to get through this. No one else gets hurt. Then we all better study and learn. I know I'm a junior, but we need to learn everything we can to make sure these jerks can't hurt you. The lump in my throat grew larger, but I forced a smile. Study machine, I will be. Sable laughed at me. (laughs) Go. Morning comes early, and when you're vibrating with coffee, you don't process as well. I snickered and headed towards my own bed. A few minutes later, Carolyn sprang onto the bed and took his usual place, a pillow near my head. He tried my feet at first, but after getting kicked a few times in the middle of the night, Up near my head on the corner of the bed with his own pillow worked much better. Queens will be trained. Magic is power, and my queens will learn how to use that power as magic should be wielded. If only, I whispered softly, petting him. Magic is a tool like anything else, and they are determined to get us to use it the way they want. Being a pawn sucks. But maybe someday after the draft and everything, if I can get that house. The words trailed off in a whisper of hope, too risky to even say aloud. Chapter 27 Everyone knows that the realms are not survivable by humans. There have been people that walked into them the few times rips have been found low enough to be accessible. No one has ever returned. All machines sent into them have quit transmitting as soon as they cross the border. But even still, rumors and legends of people visiting over there abound, proving a deadly siren call to the foolish. History of Magic 
My dreams were filled with visions of me chained to various monoliths and being chased by men in black at every step. I woke exhausted, cranky, and needing massive amounts of caffeine. By the time I stumbled out the door, having showered, checked on Joe, said morning to Sable, and made Stinky's Mexican coffee, I had almost achieved human. Almost. Having Alexant standing there waiting for me with an annoyed expression didn't help with my mood. Carolian, who hadn't said a thing to me all morning, though I had gotten a leg twine, brushed by and headed out, disappearing almost instantly. I swear, some days I think he uses magic to be invisible. Alexant pushed himself off the wall as I walked by with a grunt. Even on supposed guard duty, he still looked like an agent. Suit, tie, fancy shoes, in other words, completely out of place. Are you trying to scream government agent? I didn't look at him, just kept moving, sipping the coffee as if it was a lifeline. Yes. I shot a look at him and he shrugged. We want the people trying to kill you to know the government is involved. And I'm going to be very obvious. But first things first. Ready for your shield? We hadn't left the shelter of the apartment hallways, and he slowed, his gaze an anchoring weight. I guess? While I didn't care about the shield so much, I was interested in knowing how it was created. Warn Kalian. Until we get inside and I drop it, he won't be able to get near you. You just did. He can hear you, remember? I turned and gave Alexan an unamused look. He shrugged. Familiars are strange. Okay. He frowned and I felt something brush against me. Then it was gone. I reached out my hand but felt nothing. Okay. I don't feel a difference. Why is most of this magic people assure me happens all but invisible? I knew I sounded like a raging bitch. But outside of Indira being so absolutely incredible and me ripping open holes in the earth... I was tempted to believe it was all a big con. Alexant just smirked at me, and I narrowed my eyes at him. He reached down and picked up a small pine cone and threw it at me. I lifted my hand to block it, but when it got about three inches from me, it veered off and slammed into the ground hard. I pulled back in surprise, then looked up at Alexant. It takes a bit to learn to cast, so the object being deflected goes straight down and not to the side or up, and putting it on someone else took more offering than I thought. At this rate, my hair might be short again if we can't get this resolved before too long. Guilt hit me, and it blew away most of my resentment. He had a tussle with a fire mage before I met him, and he, Niall, and Chris all had their hair burned almost to crew cuts before they were assigned to Atlanta. Even now, and I suspected he took as many prenatal vitamins as I did, his hair just reached to the top of his shoulders. How much? I asked, my voice meek. Depriving another mage of their offerings was both a valid strategy and rude as all get out. He smirked. About half an inch off eight strands? I rolled my eyes and turned away, my guilt evaporating. Hey, I'm a Merlin, maybe not with a familiar but I can do impressive magic too. It will add up after a while. Wait until you get to the cosmetic offering classes. They treat it as an elective, but trust me, you want to take that one. Yeah, Joe mentioned it for the next semester, and Sable says she took it last semester. Taught her a lot. We emerged onto the path to the buildings I needed, and I felt eyes on me. I turned but couldn't see anyone. I couldn't see where Carolyn might be. Something up? He asked, watching me as if I might attack him. Just feels like someone is watching me. Hmm. He murmured and came to a sudden halt, frowning. But then he relaxed. I can't sense anyone, but the few people we see in some animals. Though I can't sense Carolyn either. Okay. So far, I'm not worried about animals. You do remember what killed the guy that took shots at you at school, right? Where Indira showed up? He was giving me a funny look, and I just blinked at him. Um, no. I mean, I think Indira said he was dead, 
That was all kind of fuzzy in my brain. I know they found the weapon. I thought she killed him. I had blocked that out of my thoughts, and now I cascaded myself over it. How could I be so stupid? I know people were trying to kill me. Why wasn't I asking about what interfered? I am such a moron. We don't know. They have it categorized as magic, probably. But it was big, efficient, and got in and out without Indira being able to catch it. Though, from your calls in the timeline, there was almost ten minutes where it could have happened with no one the wiser. Oh. I took that in and frowned as we walked. So, what now? Alexant lifted his hand in a dismissive manner. Now? I'd teach you more about shields and convince you that if you use magic in a way that you weren't trained for, or isn't in that book I gave you, you never tell anyone. Blame luck or an existing magic. I'd rather you claim you used a branch you were Nolan and just cite being a double Merlin and having a familiar and always, I can't stress this enough, always inflate the cost. Make the cost be significant, even if you have to lie. Or better yet, learn to lie without lying. What does learn to lie without lying mean? And why do I need to learn that? I demanded. Lies never worked out for me, and I usually just avoided answering. Made life much simpler. Remember Francine? She can hear lies when you say them, so don't lie. Example, when I asked you what you did to the guy that tried to kill you a few days ago... Rather than replying with what you did, don't tell anyone what you did. He ground out again. I rolled my eyes at him. Yes, I got that. He gave me a sidelong look but continued. You would just say you used your magic to find him and stop him. No details, but no lie. Lying is dangerous, but in your case, the truth might get you executed. Alexin glanced at me. Note the difference in the words. Murder is what those guys are trying to do. Execute is what I would do. Hot coffee couldn't disperse the cold that shot through my body, but that didn't stop me from taking a large gulp. It didn't help. And the difference? He didn't respond, just kept walking. I knew the difference. They were trying to kill me for money or a reward. He'd be ordered to put down a dangerous mage. A ronin. We didn't talk the rest of the walk to class, though he was on high alert and Carolyn kept pinging me with purrs to let me know he lurked nearby, but I didn't see him until we walked up the stairs to my first class, when he whipped through the doors into my side, but a good foot away. Carolyn glared at Alexant. The man sighed and something fell away from me, though I couldn't have said what. She's safe now, Cat, which is what we're trying to keep her. Alexant groused at Carolyn. Carolyn ignored him and twined around my legs. Thanks. I'm going to get to class. I'll see you after? No. Indira will pick you up and show you time shields that you should be able to replicate. They are actually a side effect, not what you tried to do. He gave me a smile. Really, Cory, we just want you to live long enough to... He broke off and shrugged. I don't know. Be something amazing. I'll see you after classes. I nodded, expecting him to walk away, but he just looked at the door and nodded at me. I rolled my eyes and headed into class. History was my first class that morning, and the teacher assigned the midterm paper I'd expected. Nothing too worrisome. Ten pages on the origin of the draft in another country. Given my current issues... I selected Japan, thinking any insight into all the mess could only be a good thing. All through class, I waited, expecting something. I'd never been attacked in class, and today didn't change that. Outside, a few odd looks, and no one sitting by me. Nothing happened. I waited until most of the class had left before heading to the door. Indira stood there, and I had the awful feeling of being a kid escorted from class to class because they couldn't be trusted. Morning, Corey. Biology lab next? I nodded. There wasn't a huge amount of time between classes, and getting to lab early gave you time to get equipment and set up. Carolyn, are you going to go to class with her or wait in the park? 
Indira asked, looking at Kerlian as he wound around my legs like a desperate eel. He froze. I watched his tail flick, then slump, and he turned and headed out the door, disappearing before I could say anything. I guess that answers the question. You ready? This will feel a bit funny, and you'll have to move in tandem with me. It's harder than it looks. I felt a little panicked as I looked at her. No? Indira just smiled, making her a stunning beauty for a minute. Then the world stopped, or it slowed so much it looked like it stopped. Step with me in unison, she said, her voice coaxing. Maybe I looked as freaked out as I felt, but I watched her feet and moved. Left, right, left with her. She wasn't that much shorter than me, so by the time we got out of the hall and down the steps, we had hit a pattern. How does this work? I asked when I thought I could keep the steps constant without watching her feet. Time magic can go one of two ways, speed up or slow down. Technically, it can go in reverse, but you rarely want to do that with humans in the bubble. Things go wrong. She shuddered a bit at that. Time isn't linear, regardless of what history wants us to think. But this? Indira waved around us as we walked. This is me moving us a few seconds forward in time. Anyone trying to attack or hit you will hit where you were a few seconds ago, not where you are now. If they did a gas attack or a wide-scale attack like a missile, then it might get you. But I can also jump us forward further with a thought. Watch. Around us, the world stuttered, stepped, and then seemed to resume its even slower motion. Isn't this expensive? I asked, eyeing her long hair and nails, wondering what sort of debt I was incurring. Yes and no. The spell itself barely costs a thousand molecules, but we both pay the price. She admitted. What price? I wanted to stop and stare at her, but the idea of falling out of the time bubble terrified me. You'll see. It isn't that big of a cost, but it is part of dealing with time. Besides, we're almost there. She pointed at the lab building we were rapidly approaching. We will stop right inside the doors. It should be relatively safe. I bit my tongue and waited. We stepped inside and Indira smiled. Take a breath and let it out. I did, and something rippled through me, making my breath ripple and shudder, and I felt odd, like my lungs had stuttered. Then everything, the world, the people, even the surrounding sounds were back to normal. Labs. What was that? I demanded, feeling even more freaked out. When she had walked back to me looking like an avenging goddess when the guys was shooting at me, the cost for being that imposing hadn't been on my mind. There's always a cost for time. In this case, you age the 15 seconds I had us out of sync with reality. Time can't be cheated, and you will always pay the amount of time you step out of time. It is unavoidable. She didn't seem worried, just stating a fact and I accepted the information, but didn't process it. This would take some thought to process. Could you step so far out of sync that the coming back would age you to death? Thanks. You're picking me up after class? Pretty much daily until we can get this taken care of. I couldn't hear resentment in her tone, but I assumed it was there anyhow. I'd be resentful if I had to ferry a student around from place to place. Thanks. I said with reluctance, and then headed into biology. Whatever time we saved moving in the bubble outside of time had been lost by standing there talking. I needed to get ready for my lab. The rest of the day went like that, and by the time I got home, I didn't know if I'd make it through tomorrow. Not to mention the next 18 months. I'd kill someone, or they'd kill me. As far as I could figure... I needed to get so I could protect myself and Kerlian. Maybe I should move out and get my own place to protect Joe and Sable. I shook my head as Alexant stayed until I shut the door behind me. Joe and Sable were already home. I smiled at them but didn't talk. Just headed to my room, Kerlian on my heels. 
Flopping on the bed and staring at the ceiling provided no answers. Groaning, I sat back up. I had a paper to write, chapters to read, and a chem test tomorrow to study for. Self-pity did me no good. Changing clothes, I grabbed my phone to check for missed messages before I headed back out. I'd been leaving it on silent, except for my favorites, which were Joe and the Guzmans. I should probably add Sable to that. A message waited for me. I hit play with a touch of apprehension, as there wasn't a name associated with the number. Corey Monroe, this is Joanna Snowden. Indira told me you wanted to join Emrys. If it's convenient tonight, I would meet you and let you sign the membership forms and take the oath. Let me know. I'm available until nine. Do be aware I leave to head back to Savannah next week. Thanks. Her number showed up on the screen. I wandered out into the kitchen, dragging my books and holding my phone. Joe had a simple stew simmering for dinner. Something she created in the morning and none of us needed to touch while the crock pot did its magic. Either of you care if the Emrys rep comes by and gets me signed up? Sable set a bowl of stew in front of me. Not as long as you eat. You look exhausted. I'll get Caroline's dinner out. Most of the time, I ate in front of the computer. But today, that sounded like too much effort, so I sat at the table while Caroline sprang into the chair next to me, looking at the table with interest. Okay, I said, and took a mouthful of food. It helped. I tried to remember if I'd eaten. Just a protein bar at lunch. Thursdays were busy. All of my days except Wednesdays were busy. I dialed the number. Joanna Snowden? Joanna, this is Corey. Yeah, if you can come over, that would be great. Need my address? Yep. Indira doesn't share anything. I gave it to her. Wonderful. This isn't too far from my hotel. Give me 30 minutes. She hung up, and I stared at the phone. Would you two think I was insane if I said I thought this might be a trap, and wonder if we should be ready for attack? Joe turned and looked at me. Then she looked at Sable. No, I don't think you're insane. We should get ready. And I'm worried that I'm starting to see enemies everywhere. Chapter 28 To have a familiar is every child's dream, and it is a standard trope in fantasy novels for the mage to emerge and have a wondrous familiar there to help them with their quest or defeat the monsters. The truth is, only a small percentage of mages ever get familiars, and of those that do, the majority are merlins. But since there are three known hedge mages with familiars, Nothing is impossible. Magic explained. Twenty minutes later, when there was a knock at the door, we all looked at each other. Joe had spent the time trying frantically to duplicate Alexan's air shield. We thought we had a poor version figured out. It would stop soft or slower things, but not a bullet. That was why Sable was ready with her fire and water. She'd had another two years of study, and had proven to us she could create a shield of ice around someone, holding them immobile for a minute or two. It was why we'd boiled a bunch of water to get more moisture in the air. Even with as humid as Georgia Spring was, more water in this case was better. Carolian hadn't said much, but he crouched under the chairs around the table, something he wouldn't be able to do easily if he got much bigger, lying in wait. At least he hadn't told us we were idiots for thinking this, I just felt like everyone had a reason to attack me. It made no sense to set myself up for a straightforward attack. I checked with Joe and Sable, each on opposite sides of the room, then headed to answer the door. After checking the peephole and seeing it was Joanna, I pulled it open. Hey, come on in. Joanna smiled at me, her long hair in a neat French braid that hit the middle of her back, dressed in a casual dress suit. She looked professional. Evening, Corey. I'm honored you decided to join the house. Her voice was friendly as we headed to the table. Joe and Sable remained in different parts of the room, acting as if they were doing something else. 
anything else than waiting to attack or defend. We weren't certain which it would be. So, here is the paperwork, the commitment to pay the fees during your draft and after, and here are your probationary benefits. Here is the paper copy of the oath and a copy of the rules of the House of Emerus. She talked as she pulled pieces of paper out of her bag. You won't get your card until about a week from now, and I need to take your pick to get it made. Her entire attitude was matter of fact, and I pushed the benefits and the rules to one side, focusing on the oath and the commitment. The commitment was exactly what she had explained before, with the promise to pay the membership dues either monthly or yearly, and the clause that they wouldn't come due until I started my draft. There wasn't anything there I hadn't expected. I glanced at her, but she just sat there friendly and waiting. Do you have questions? Not yet. I mean, I see nothing in the contract that you didn't explain. Give me a minute to look at the oath. Sure, it isn't super specific. I know some other houses have a lot more buried in them, but we try to keep it simple at Emrys. Making it complicated usually backfires. Badly. Her tone had a wryness to it that spoke of experience, and I wanted to ask what prompted that. But since I still didn't think I could trust her, I didn't. Stupid adulting. How sad is it that having my own place with parents that ignored my existence is looking idyllic? I focused on the oath, but still watched her out of the corner of my eye. The split attention was rapidly giving me a headache. I, state name here, agree to not take action against the House of Emrys or other members without presenting my case to the council. I agree to publicly uphold the rules and regulations of the OMO. I swear that I will take no action to harm another member of the House without sanction. I agree to abide by the decisions of the ruling council regarding any public actions. I agree to follow the directions of any House manager while staying at any Emrys House or I will leave. Above all, I swear to not disclose in a public venue any discussions brought before the council. I, state name here, swear to uphold all these to the best of my ability on state date here. So help me magic. The words both made sense and didn't. I read it three times with intent before I looked her in the eyes. I don't understand why the stress on public actions, and what is this about the council and sanctions? Joanna quirked a side of her mouth but remained relaxed. Was that a good sign or a bad? I so wasn't cut out for this cloak and dagger stuff. We are well aware that there are other ways to use magic outside the official spells. We require our members to not be public about them. It scares people, and then government has a tendency to step in and eliminate everything that might fuel the return of anything similar to the Salem witch trials. That surprised me. While magic hadn't existed back then, or at least not at the widespread level it was in the mid-1800s, history suspected at least one or two of the witches were actual mages. The trials and riots and general hysteria had resulted in the deaths of over 300 people as the fear spread through the colonies. How many had been mages, and how many had been average people swept up in it, was anyone's guess. Basically, don't go public with anything not on the official list. Or make damn sure you can explain it away as a Merlin-level use of the official spells. As to the council, people are people. And when Merlins get nasty, the level of devastation can be extreme. We provide a non-biased council to provide feedback and settle disputes. We also discuss new magic that is discovered, and when it might be appropriate to disclose it to the OMO and the public. As to the house manager, that means don't be an ass. Some people think they can trash the place because they are Merlins. Most of the house managers are as well. So either do what they say or leave. That one just helps keep some of the younger Merlins from being assholes. Her blunt tone made me snicker, and I read it again. After everything Alexan said, block it going public made sense, but I thought only a few people knew about the stuff that wasn't on the list. What is this sanction thing? And action against another member? 
sometimes there isn't anything that can be settled. As an example, one Merlin rapes another. There isn't anything to settle there, and it isn't like going to the police will stop it from happening again. We ask the Merlin that was wrong to present evidence to the council, and the accused can if they wish. If they agree it is rape, the wronged mage has the right to take ultimate justice. Just not publicly. In other words, if we agree you were raped, you have the right to kill your rapist as long as it isn't in a splashy way. You condone murder? I blurted, staring at her, feeling like I'd fallen into a rabbit hole. Again, Condone? No. We just won't take any action against you if it is sanctioned by the council. Her calm tone didn't make me feel any better. And remember, according to the courts, the penalty for a magical rapist is death. How often does this happen? Not the rape, but people coming up and petitioning. And what in the world would I do if someone did that to me? Not as often anymore. The new Merlins regard it with the same level of horror you do, the older ones, well, either they've already removed all their obstacles or don't care anymore. But Merlins have bigger egos than most, and it is best to deal with it before an impartial panel than out in public. What happens if they do? I mean, this just says I agree not to. What if I killed someone with... I almost stumbled and said soul magic, but managed to change it. With time or psychic... She didn't respond, but reached over and pushed the rules towards me. I glanced at her and started to read. Most of this was what I expected, and boiled down to don't be a dick, don't break the law on our property, and pay on time. The last page is what she wanted me to see. The one I read four times, wanting to make sure I understood it completely. This says if I break the rules... The least punishment is I will be banned from the House of Emrys and ten years of dues will be withdrawn from my accounts. If I break the magic prohibitions and the government or OMO steps in, they will provide all information possible on me, declare me persona non grata, and order none within the house to give me assistance, or as they call it, succor. Yes. And you're okay with this? The words came out as a squeaked protest and I got up to get water, needing to move, to think. Corey, in the last two decades, this has happened three times. Once for a serial killer that no one knew existed until he killed the child of a Merlin, and twice more for people that committed major crimes in public. I believe you have heard of the Time Bomber? I had. He devised a way to create many bubbles of time and would walk in and randomly launch them, then speed time up. People would have their hand with or before them, aged to over a hundred in a few seconds. He would cause issues with hospitals by doing it on their equipment. He was taken down and... what? I frowned, trying to remember. I know they caught him, but I don't remember what happened. I don't recall a trial. There wasn't one. The current head of Emrys executed him. He'd broken the oath and the Olmo declared him Ronin. I swallowed, taken aback by word usage again. Executed. It sounded so finite and simple. Everything was smoothed over. She sighed and leaned forward. (sighs) Corey, unless you are planning on taking up a life of crime, killing children, or becoming a terrorist, this is not anything you need to worry about. The possible risks are outweighed by the benefits— legal, financial, and job assistance. No one that is a member of the House of Nyx can accept a contract to kill or hurt you without breaking the oath. There will be people to talk to who get what it's like to be powerful. Hey, I don't think I'm special because I'm, well, whatever I am. I protested, looking guilty at Joe. She rolled her eyes at me and winked. And what do you mean, and Nyx? You are special. And Indira knows it. Having good friends is something priceless. And I hope by all the planes it never changes. But many people can't handle the power differences, and it eats at them. While I don't know if you've even had a match in power, you'll find people to talk about the challenges. More Merlins than mages have familiars, and talking about them can help too. My queens, all mine. 
The plural and the possessive growl made me want to stick my head under the table and look at him. I managed not to. As to Nix, we have a reciprocation agreement. We will not attack any of theirs, and they will not attack any of ours. It helped calm some issues a decade or so ago. Okay. I stared at the paper. Doubt, fear, worry, and a strong desire to just go pull all the covers over my head waged a war in me. But I needed the support, and removing any members of these societies from trying to kill me would also help. How did I end up here? Why? There weren't any answers. Can I leave? I mean, if I decided to leave the society. I blurted out the words. Joanna nodded. Yes, there are penalties if you leave before your decade is up, as you committed to that. But if you want to walk away, it is however many years you have left of dues plus two years. At that point, everything is dissolved along with any responsibilities you have to us. The amount of money that represented made me sick. You're sure I'll get a job that will let me pay that sort of money? This time, she laughed, looking at me. (laughs) Corey, with your magic levels along with the R&D places that will be begging you to work for them, you'll make that much money in a month. If you change your mind before you start your draft, there are no fines. We understand that college is a time of change and experimentation, and we want to make sure that the people in Emrys want to be in Emrys. I read everything again, waiting for her to attack or something. Even Joe and Sable had sat down and were trying to keep busy. Okay, I'll sign. Great, I hope you enjoyed as much as I have over the years. I signed where she pointed and then stood and said the oath. At the last, I felt a flush of heat wash over me, then gone. It's done. All the contract information is in there, as well as the chat groups and website information. You'll be prompted to create a login. Give me at least 48 hours to get all your information into the system. She said as she snapped a pic of me for my ID and recorded my OMO number. Call me if you have any questions, and good luck. I'll get the news of your joining spread as far as I can. It might help to get people to step back. Thanks, I said, and rose with her, tensing ready for the attack. Night, ladies. She gave all of us a grin and left, the soft click of her shoes the last sound I heard as I closed the door. Well, that was anticlimactic, Sable said. We all looked at each other and collapsed in exhausted laughter. If an assassin didn't kill me, the jumping at shadows just might. Chapter 29 Magic Explained has a new ongoing blog series. All information presented on this blog has been thoroughly researched and vetted by OMO officials. Check in weekly to see how magic affects the world and how it works. The newest section will deal with air magic and using it in various industries. Magic Explained Online The next few weeks seemed the same, endless torture. I went to class every day with Alexan acting like a silent shadow. Half the time he barely grunted at me, but would yell if I lagged or walked too fast. He surrounded me with wind, and more than once a student stumbled into me, only to get shoved violently to the ground, much to their surprise. Indira at least could keep me out of sync, but even she was getting shorter and shorter with me and the feeling of being watched every time I was outside was about to drive me crazy. If I looked, there was always people watching me, though usually with curiosity or suspicion, and Carolyn would just respond he didn't see any person paying special attention to me. In most of my classes, the only thing resembling a friend was Charles. While I sat with Joe in Magic 101 Lab, I began to sit with Charles in History on Tuesdays and Thursdays, He didn't say much, but he'd smile. Arachina would chitter, and Carolyn would do something. Commune, talk, stare. I couldn't figure it out. But occasionally, she'd jump off Charles' shoulder and walk up and down on Carolyn's back, her legs pumping up and down, while Carolyn purred so loud, students would glare at us. I just smiled back at them, 
and hated that I took pleasure in their flinching back. Neither Alexant nor Indira would tell me anything about what was going on, and I just wanted to be left alone. Even in the apartment at night, I felt under scrutiny, and it was driving me crazy. All I did was study. I even had to let Sable and Joe take Carolyn out to play because I couldn't be seen in such an open area and stationary for so long. No one, including Carolyn, seemed worried about him being taken or hurt, which left me sitting in my apartment when I wasn't in class. On the upside, my grades were looking good, but my mood was foul. Bad enough that I knew I had to change something before my roommates killed me. Spring break is next week. Why don't you two go up and see your parents for a few days? Then go up to Chattanooga and explore. Go downtown and enjoy some you time. I said the Monday before spring break. GA Madge Tech's breaks made little sense to me. This year, it was the first week in April, and the semester ended the last week of May. But Joe's grades were up, so I knew she could get out and go have fun, not be part of my prison camp. Mommy will ask where you are, Joe protested, but I knew she liked the idea. Loving me was one thing. Not getting any alone time with her lover was something else. Sable had gone out with her dad for the evening. I liked him, but I understood why he was so worried about his daughter being around me. I would be. Tell her the truth. I'm basically under house arrest until this thing with Japan settles down. I'm still hoping that joining Emrys will help, but it gives me some time to veg out and you two can get away. I kept my voice upbeat. The last thing I could do would be reveal how much I wanted to go get a hug from Marisol and have her tell me it would all be okay. Joe still looked at me doubtfully. I know you were originally planning on working this week. Yeah, well, that isn't happening. It's fine. I still have enough to do to keep busy, and a night or two of pizza and watching movies sounds kind of nice. It didn't. Not really. Going out and having pizza and going to the movie sounded awesome. Staying home? Not so much. You sure? Yes. Get. Get through this week and take off Friday. I waved my hand, grinning at her. If I wasn't careful, people trying to kill me would chase her away, or kill her instead. And I'd burn down the world before I let her get hurt again. Only the anger in her voice when I offered to walk away kept me here. But she couldn't get hurt again. Just couldn't. The smile that lit up her face told me everything I wanted to know. They left by three on Friday. I got a text message as they pulled out. With a sigh, I texted that I wished them well and headed to my last class. Law. It was never boring. Odd and scary sometimes, but never boring. When the class ended, I grabbed my stuff, Carolyn trailing behind me, and went down to meet Alexan, bracing myself for a fight. I need to go to the library, I said, looking at him. I felt exhausted and I knew he'd make it something I had to argue for, which just set my teeth on edge another few degrees. No, I've got other stuff to do tonight. Look, just because you have a date with Indira... The flush on his face told me I hit a tender spot, and my eyes narrowed, now even more annoyed. I still need to get some materials to finish papers and lay out my magical experiments for my other class. Unless, of course, she'll just give me an A without needing to do the work. I didn't think she'd do that, and I knew I'd never accept it. But the taunt made him stiffen. In and out. You get what you need, then back to your secure apartment. I never asked what he'd done to secure my apartment. The extent they would tell us is we needed to invite the person in. Otherwise, they couldn't get in. That was all I wanted to know at this point. I'll take the time I need. I have to find the material, then get it, then make sure I don't need to go back this weekend. I'm having pizza and watching movies. I won't leave this weekend, and I'll ask Indira to take me on a shopping trip next week. Fine. He growled out, and we headed to the library. Well, he stalked behind me, the windshield keeping me oddly surrounded by silence. He dropped the shield when we reached the library, but he followed me up and down every aisle until I had the four books I needed. While the internet was great to find out the basis of the stories and experiments I needed, it wasn't enough to write papers or figure out expected results from. 
On the way back, not glancing my way at all, he spoke. I know this has to be rough. I swear people are trying to get this squashed, but as far as we can tell, there are still hits out on you. Give us more time. We entered the park as he spoke. On the Friday of spring break, the area felt like a ghost town, and just as empty. Maybe if he had been conciliatory or even apologetic, I might have let it slide, but I missed having a life. I hated this and hated that the people I spent the most time with were the ones I barely liked. Rough? I have strangers in every aspect of my life. I can't go see the people I love like family. Hell, I can't even take my familiar to the park. I've tried very hard not to be rude or difficult, but if this continues, I'll tell everyone to go take a flying leap and I'll quit. Not like I'm not used to not having anything or being hated. I spat the words and he stiffened, whirling on me. Now look here. I get this wasn't your idea. My idea? It was bad enough you got me tested when I had no idea I was a mage. And frankly, if I had never found out, I would have never used it anyhow. I felt a bit of guilt about that statement. I mean, I had been planning on getting tested. And then the second damn test? Making me the freak that everyone stares at? Yes, you've made my life so pleasant. Maybe that wasn't 100% accurate, but I just wanted him to go away. He tried to protest again. Maybe something softened in his face. I didn't care. Let's not even mention the cop Jonas checking in on me every few days and cautioning me not to leave the area without letting them know. He stiffened at that and stared at me. She's what? You heard me. I'm basically being told I can't go anywhere because they don't want to risk people getting hurt. Please tell me exactly how this is anything I asked for. I wanted something else to throw in his face, but as fast as the anger came, it was fading. I just wanted to go home. Corey, you're being... He broke off and took towards the trees at the same time something hit the shield and slammed into the ground at my feet, distracting me. I stared at the throwing star laying there. Throwing stars? Really? My life is not a movie. Bullets, I expected. It was America, after all. But who in the world used throwing stars? Corey, down! Alexant gestured, and my feet were swept out from underneath me. I landed hard. The books in my backpack left indents on my back, and I could feel bruises forming. Don't move. I wasn't moving. I was standing there. I couldn't get up. I couldn't do anything but watch. And I watched Stephen Alexant perform magic. Outside of Indira and the maniac Paul Goines, I'd never really seen magic. Not big movie magic. The little stuff? Sure. But something to make me stare? No. I knew Alexant was a pattern Merlin, with pale earth and air, and strong in water. But outside of Chris's little example back when we were still trying to find Goins, I'd never seen pattern used as a skill. Just about every mage stayed under the radar and never did anything flashy. Today, I saw what I'd only seen in movies. The ground shook as Alexant turned and wind whipped around him like a hurricane, but it was directed out towards the trees. A man, yelling and trying to turn to face Alexant, rose high in the air. Another man stepped out from behind a tree and sprinted towards Alexant's back. Alexant, look out! I yelled, but my words were whipped away before the sound cleared my bubble of air. A torrent of fire came from the man, headed right towards Alexant but it hit wind and spun down. Alexant turned and looked at the man, who snarled, the fire dying even as the ground at Alexant's feet began to smoke. Alexant glanced down and sneered. Really? You're what, a magician? Not even a wizard. You think that trick will stop me? Water pooled at Alexant's feet, creating steam as he walked forward. The man's clothes began to unravel, and he snarled and spun, fire streaking towards a bright red furry figure motionless under a bench. Carolyn, run! I screamed the word so hard my throat hurt. The red figure moved, streaking towards me. The guy attacking us turned to follow his path as fireballs shot forward. 
I shredded the shield around me with magic as I reached for Kerlian. I grabbed the earth in the lawn, creating a barrier and blocking the fire streaking towards my familiar. The man turned to look at me and snarled, two more fireballs coming towards me. I panicked and pulled on time. A bubble formed around me and I stood and ran, moving towards Kerlian, who had stopped. Fur puffed out and eyes wild in the shelter of an earthen wall I'd ripped from the ground. With an effort, though it felt like dropping Murphy's curse or Alexan's shield around me, I dismissed time. I felt the few seconds hit me, even as the fireballs impacted where I'd been. I scooped up Carolyn in my arms as the man Alexan had thrown into the air stepped forward and grinned. He was closer than I expected, and I could see his tattoo, Spirit Mage. His smile had nothing but cruelty in it as he smiled at me, then Alexant. Oh, fuck me, I heard Alexant say behind me. The enemy mage threw his head back and lashed forward. I felt pain splinter my mind and Kirlian cry out in my head. I heard a screech, long, deep, and more terrifying than anything else I'd ever heard. The last sound that followed me into darkness was sound of screaming. Chapter 30 Spirit Merlins are more mysterious than most. At the time of this writing, there are only 2,000 Spirit Merlins alive and registered with the OMO. This is out of the 34,000 active Merlins. No one knows why the numbers are so low for this category, and most countries hoard them, refusing to let them assist other countries. Oddly, Australia has the most at 250, and of those 90 are Aborigines. The OMO has made no comment about the disparity. Magic explained. The pounding in my head pulled me to consciousness. I lay there, eyes closed as I tried to breathe through the pain. The familiar rumble curled up at my side, allowed some fear and stress to fade though it did nothing for the headache. I apologize for the headache. It is a side effect of the twisted way your opponent used his magic. A strange voice said in my head. I jerked upright, intending to look around to see who had spoken, but the splitting headache forced a cry from between my lips, and I curled over my knees, sobbing in pain. Here, water will help. Something bumped against my hand at the words. I cracked open my eyes, even the dim light sending daggers into my skull. A bottle of water, condensation gathering on the outside, floated in front of me. At this point, poisoning me would be overkill. I could barely process thoughts. Why bother to kill me? Moving slowly, even thinking hurt, I took the water, cracked it open, and drained it. The icy liquid coating my throat did help. The sensations were psychosomatic, but still I could feel the blinding pain fade as I drank. My eyes closed to protect what brain cells I had left. Maybe that KO spell siphons water from your brain or something. An idle thought, but I poked at it as I let the water work into me. Magic hurt more than I had expected it to. As I sat there, Carolyn rumbling by my side, I reached out to pet him. My queen will. Getting better, I rasped. The air smelled clean, fresh, as if we were in the mountains far away from the city, and I felt my heart squeeze tight. I managed to open my eyes and take in my surroundings. The bed I sat on was made of blankets and feathers, wonderfully soft, and nothing I'd ever seen. Simple walls of wood and a roof that looked like it was made of palm fronds or some other grassy leaf rose above me. The only sounds were of leaves, Carolian, and the song of birds in the distance. Oh shit, shit, shit! I swallowed hard as I heard a sound I couldn't place. It sounded like scale and feathers and a rumble that wasn't a purr or a laugh, but I had the image of a chuffing tiger in my head. I turned to look where the sound had come from and froze. Seeing the unicorn, the thing from chaos, and even the gorgon tersane 
had created a level of shock and awe, but I'd seen them from a distance first, had time to accept their existence before I saw them up close. It also helped immensely that they had not paid attention to me until the end, and by that time, I'd gotten myself under control. This time, the creature sitting not ten feet away from me paid no attention to anyone or anything else. Great yellow-green eyes locked on mine. Griffin! That word spiraled in my head in various levels of intensity, and the griffin winced. The clear light displayed everything the typical description of one always had. White feathered head with a raptor's yellow beak, a lion's tawny body with wings at the shoulders, front lying claws, and a tail with a tuft of feathers. But all the descriptions didn't begin to touch on what he actually looked like. The tawny fur shimmered in the light like liquid gold. The feathers started at dark purple at his shoulders and lightened to the palest lavender at the ends. His eyes glowed with power, and I wanted to cringe away from his gaze. Then there was his paws. They were bigger than my head, and I could only imagine how long and deadly the claws would be. Water splashed on my hand, and I looked down to realize I was shaking so hard the condensation on the bottle was scattering on me like rain. Girl, what are you so afraid of? The voice, now that I could concentrate on it, had not the splitting pain in my head. The voice called to mind wind and leaves and the purr of a lion, and was wholly masculine. That, that... I stuttered and licked suddenly dry lips. I forced myself to breathe in and continue. That you're going to kill me and eat me? I said, my voice still squeaking. The griffon, or was it griffin? Looked at me and then down at Carolyn, who still leaned against me purring. Then it started to shake, a weird snorting noise coming out of its beak. Um, Corey... Carolyn said, laughter coating his words. If Banyal planned on eating you, why would he bring you here and serve you water? Why would I be here and not trying to kill anyone that dared to touch my queen? It was the most I'd ever heard Carolyn say at once. Meanwhile, the magnificent animal kept snickering, and I felt my face flush. When he put it that way, my question seemed really stupid. I looked around more closely. The place reminded me of a treehouse, with a large porch on one side and more rooms down a hallway out of my sight. So you aren't planning on killing me? Why am I here? Where is here? And... I trailed off, looking around, dread supplanting the fear. Where is Alexant? The laughter died a bit at a time, though I suspected Carolyn still laughed at me. The griffin shook itself, and I had to resist the urge to reach out and pet him, even if I thought he might eat me. Instead, I sank my hands into Carolyn's fur. It seemed a much safer option. The one that fought for you? I nodded at the question, still watching, half expecting him to pounce. Ah, he is alive, though I will keep him slumbering until we leave. You are in my home, in what you term the spirit plane, though that is not at all accurate. A note of disapproval at the inaccurate term infused his words, and just hearing that so clearly made it truly register this was all via telepathy or something like it. Not that I'm complaining, but why am I here? Why do you care? I knew I should probably go check on Alexant, but even if he was dead, what was I going to do about it? Besides, familiars were supposed to be trustworthy, and Carolyn didn't seem upset. I believe your companion is better suited to answer that question. My companion? I turned to look at Carolyn, who found his tale of very great interest. Carolyn? He didn't look at me, just flicked his ears backwards. Carolyn? This was your request. You are responsible for telling her. The rumble of Banyar's voice in my head caused goosebumps to rise up and down my spine. 
but I didn't look away from the cat who was trying very hard to ignore both of us. Kerillion tail lash exonsi. Tell her. The snap of command made me flinch, and Kerillion lifted his head to hiss, but then rose and stretched, walking. I noticed, away from me. You are my powerful queen. Very powerful. You needed training. Your humans and their twisted understanding cannot provide. I asked for a teacher. Bane Jarl said yes. He paused to sharpen his claws on the post of the room. A teacher? I don't understand. You are queen. You need to understand magic. The rigid rules they put around it are right but wrong. Magic not so structured. He hissed in my mind and I shivered. It felt funny. You explain. This is not my area. While I heard the words, I knew they weren't directed at me, and I shifted my attention to the griffin. Your focus is much given to avoidance and obfuscation, but it is not his area of expertise. This is true. But first... He rose to his full height, and a wave of atavistic fear lashed at me again, His head almost brushed the top of the room we were in. He easily had to be the size of a Clydesdale, and probably weighed about the same. I wanted to scoot back, away from his predator state, but I stayed frozen, watching. With his wings half-mantled, he dipped his head. I am Banyal Ni Kerso. Kerlian asked me to teach you if I found you suitable. I have watched you for many cycles of the sun, and I believe you will do well with the information I have to impart. It has been many seasons since I last had an apprentice. He turned and picked up a book, and as he did so, I realized his paws weren't paws like a normal cat, but more like Carolians, with long fingers and an imposable thumb that retracted into a fist-like shape to walk on. The closest I could think of was how apes walked with their hands and fists, but this seemed more flexible and less bony. I'd have to investigate Carolyn's paws again. You are skilled in spirit, but also blessed with access to other realms of magic. I would teach you what my teachers passed down to me and how to use the magic of spirit, of all magics, instead of just the forms. I knew he meant spirit as he talked, but he used another word that sounded different, but meant what I thought of as spirit, yet wasn't. You want to teach me? As an apprentice? The word worried me a lot. It seemed like more owing. What would be involved in that? I still have to go to school and learn. I can't just bail. Or if I could... Why the hell have I been bothering with all of this crap over the last few months? Griffin faces aren't really made for smiling, but I swear he grinned at me. Carolyn did say you were a wise and cautious mage. I am bored, and you may prove interesting. He seemed to shrug, but I caught something else in his tone that, while not a lie, wasn't all of it. An oath not to use what I teach you against me unless in defense of yourself. Basically, if I decide to lose what capability for reason I possess and attack you, feel free to defend your life and honor. Otherwise, you will not attack me with your magic. I frowned, things popping off in my brain. That doesn't really say much. I mean, I could still kill you with a gun or use magic around you without using it on you. So why bother? Either I wouldn't betray you or I would. The oath won't prevent that. His head tilted, a very bird-like move, then pivoted to look to where Carolyn was prowling on his rafters. I really wanted more time to look and explore this place, but now wasn't the time. You are correct. She is smart. My powerful queen, Carolyn murmured, pride in his voice. I rolled my eyes. Don't act so smug. Not like you had anything to do with me being smart. The griffin moved, or his wings did, 
and something about it made me think of a shrugging gesture. Did he? She is powerful and curious. She seeks and probes. She will be a difficult student, a challenging one. I chose Queen well. I have three. They are all powerful. She would be an asset to your reputation. Carolyn hadn't come back over to us, and I glared at both of them. This was starting to feel like a conversation with Endira and Alexant. True, but much trouble. Very well. I will educate her in the truth of magic. But you know they will notice. Banyarl had settled back down, preening his feathers. One advantage to telepathy... You could do things with your mouth at the same time as you talked, but the idea of using my mouth to groom myself made me wrinkle my nose. They should notice she is powerful, a true queen. There was something about how Carolyn said it that time, as opposed to the other times. I could hear the capitals in the words. My frayed nerves shredded. What are you two talking about? What is a queen? And who is they? Banyarl looked up and threw me. For a minute, I thought he was peering into my soul. Maybe into my future. Do you want me to train you? I will teach you the truth of magic. That it is a living thing you have connected with. That all things cost, but a focus lowers the cost. A triad lowers it more. You can do brilliant things. Why? Why do you want to do this? Why me? I wanted to cry or scream. All I had wanted was a good job and my own place. To do the small things without counting pennies. And here I sat, a griffin, offering me something I knew most mages would sell their limbs for. Reasons. Do you want to learn? You would be able to protect yourself and no longer need others to be your shield. That idea sounded so good, but still, I hesitated. Everyone wanted me lately, and I didn't understand why. I hated not understanding motivations. And the cost? Banyarl tilted his head one way, then the other. Three things, I think. One is your promise not to attack me with any means. Again, that feeling he was smiling at me. Unless I attack you first. Second, you will not tell other mages that you are learning from me. They will not take it well, I believe. Third, at some point in your life, you will make a decision that much will ride on. I ask you to hear me out if I come to discuss your decision. Note that I am not requesting you agree with me. I am requesting that you listen to my arguments about that decision. Decision? What decision? I don't know. It may be the name of your first child. It may be you deciding whether to kill someone or yourself. I ask that you listen to me and let me try to sway you with my argument. I leaned back, licking my lips as I thought. Could I get another bottle of water? One floated out of the room beyond and into my hands, icy cold again. Portable light containers are of great utility. Too bad there is no clean way to return them to their original elements. What do you mean? I asked, mainly because I wanted time to think and to figure out any pitfalls. What harm could there be in listening to one side of an argument? Fire melts it into a lump. It ignores water. It does not feed insects or plants. All you can do is break it back down into its original elements and then dispose of those properly. Oh, yeah. Plastic. The bane of recycling everywhere. Wait, break it down? Ideas slammed into me, and I wanted to groan. Then I snickered. That would give me information for some classes Sable said were coming up. Sounded like a great research paper if I could get the costs down to something that would be feasible for the mages and a solution to a great many energy problems. I closed my eyes to process all of this. Why isn't this already being done? Worry and suspicion about all of the things in the background made me sigh. I couldn't solve all the problems in the world. All I could do was deal with what I could and try to be a person I could live with. 
Refocusing on the world around me, I caught sight of Banyarl and Kirlian seemed to be having a discussion that I couldn't hear. I watched them as I tried to think through the echoes of the headache. I have a few conditions, I said into the soft noise of birds and leaves. Both Kirlian and Banyarl turned to look at me. Chapter 31 While the OMO is global and has a much more far-reaching effect than even the UN, there are still some nations that refuse to participate. They are few in number, as the OMO is the only agency that can consistently test for magic and maintains a global database on mages. If your country does not participate, you miss out on both the benefits and protections inherent in the OMO. History of Magic And what would those conditions be? Banyarl asked. I had half expected amusement, dragon to the silly girl. Instead, there was a wariness and a hint of worry. First, that your argument not delay or waste my time listening to you if there is a time limit. That or you say what you feel must be said without causing me to be too late to decide. Magic Law had been discussing some filibustering cases, so the idea of Banyarl talking to me for days made me wary. Very well. I agree. He didn't sound excited about that, but also didn't sound upset. So, win there. Second, I get to tell Joe and Sable about you, and you agree to train them also. This time the pause was longer, and his predatory head, which looked like he could eat Carolian with two snaps, turned to look at the cat. The other two queens, powerful, smart, damaged. Banyarl stared at him for a long time, eyes narrowed, as did I. What do you mean damaged? They aren't damaged. Joe isn't damaged, I protested, stung on her, on their behalf. Carolian didn't answer, but stalked a floating object that looked like a cross between a butterfly and a dandelion spore. Very well. I will train the three of you, but they must agree to the same terms as you did. Are there any other conditions? I almost sagged in relief at that. I might have been able to keep a secret from Sable, but Joe, She'd have figured it out. You tell me the actual reason you're agreeing to do this. I had to know. This made no sense. I had no idea how magical he was, but the odds were he had more magic than Joe, Sable, and me put together. Ha! <laughs> you will be an excellent student. I will tell you, but not now. When? I needed these answers, damn it. What he said might make it easier for me to trust him. When you understand enough magic to understand why, I see that you need something concrete. Very well. Prior to your education from your school with what you call a bachelor's, I will answer your question. How did you know that? I blurted out. Why in the world would a magical creature from another realm know anything about human degrees? I have been watching you for a while, ever since Carolyn asked for this favor. A favor I will collect on. He flicked a wing tip at Carolyn, who didn't even move, just let the wing ruffle his fur as he sat like an Egyptian statue on the other side of the room. Wait, you've been watching me? I turned to Carolyn. You said... No, you said no human was watching me. You knew! Not a threat. Bane teaches better when curious. You made him curious. I said you learn and be great. You will. Not even his whiskers moved as he sat watching both of us, with his emerald green eyes shining out of his ruby red fur. The desire to strangle him wrestled with the need to hug him, He'd found someone to teach me and keep me safe. And about freaked me out with the feeling someone was watching. Nothing else, I swear. At this point, I didn't have anything to lose. Then we should go. It is not wise to keep the human male unconscious much longer. Besides, 
people will notice the time bubble soon enough. He rose and shook himself, and I fought the desire to cringe. My lizard brain that normally hid and made stupid suggestions was shrieking with the need to hide and cower. My snark took over and shoved the lizard back into his cave. That's it? No magic oath? Either you will abide by your word or you won't. Why use magic to judge character when actions will prove it easily enough? I laughed to myself and rose. I turned and my bag with my library books was behind me on a low shelf at the back of the bed, or nest. I grabbed them and stepped out of it. Lead the way. I figured quoting Shakespeare would be a waste of time. But for all I knew, they'd known him. I'd have to ask someday. Alexan's body floated into the room, hanging limp in the air, but he looked much the same as my last sight of him. Hair disarrayed and clothing must, but not bleeding, and he seemed to be breathing. Though he'd probably have a headache like mine. I need a story, one that would be the truth. Well, he wanted me to learn to lie by not lying. I guess this would be as good a time as any. Can I get a bottle of water? I asked as Bane Yarl started to open a portal to home. I could feel the familiar spike. He'll probably have a headache like mine. A bottle floated to me, and I held on to it. Bane Yarl pointed. There is where you were. Two hours have passed while I had you here. The time bubble keeping anyone from reaching in and touching you. When you step back in, it will snap, and you will catch up with normal time. I will see you on your Monday. Joe and Sable won't be there. It's a holiday week for us. I told him, and I wanted time to explain to them what in the heck was going on, not to mention time to figure out how to deal with what had just happened. As you request. I shall be at your domicile at your seventh hour in the evening on the Sunday following this coming one. This shall be an interesting adventure, Coruscant. Before I could ask anything else, the rip between worlds opened beneath me and I fell down to earth. It was only a few inches, but I hadn't expected it and stumbled. Carolyn leaped down with cat-like grace while Alexant floated to the ground. I shall look forward to our next meeting, Bane Yarl said, his voice in my head somewhere between ominous and amused. Then the rip sealed with him on the other side. A shudder washed through me as my body adjusted to the bubble of time, and it collapsed, leaving me standing there with an unconscious Alexant. The bodies of two attackers spread around us, cops, and an incandescently mad Indira striding towards us. Oh shit, maybe I should have just stayed in the other realm, I muttered. Where have you been? She didn't shout the words, but each of them slashed into me with the force of a dagger. Right then, facing the throwing stars from the other idiot sounded more preferable than dealing with Indira. Spirit realm, I think. Remember, obfuscate, misdirect, don't tell her. You promised. This was going to be a trial by fire, one I wasn't looking forward to. What happened? She asked, waving a cop over as she knelt by Alexan's head. What's wrong with him? One of the attackers threw a KO spell at us, knocked us out. He hasn't come to yet. I woke with a killer headache, so he probably will too. KOs usually do that. Who killed the attackers? Alexan? I paused. I didn't know. I assume so. He was fighting when I was hit, I think. I don't know for sure if the same KO spell took him out or not. I blacked out before I saw. One was a fire mage, the other a spirit mage. A groan prevented me from saying any more, and I stepped back, though I remained well aware of all the cops watching me with wary eyes, and Detective Olivia Jonas headed my way. Exhaustion swamped me, and I sank to the grass away from any of the torn-up soil or the milling cops. If people wanted to talk to me, they could do it here. I'd been nice and left the bottle of water with Alexant, and regretted it now. 
Thirst, hunger, and exhaustion all hit me, a mixture of my body having lived twice the amount of time as everyone else and the adrenaline crash. I had a reason to be starving. As I sat cross-legged on the grass, my bag acting as an uncomfortable backrest, Carolyn curled up in the space my legs left, purring. You are smart. He is worth the subterfuge. I gave him a side-eyed glare, but said nothing. Too many people would have asked questions. Alexant was sitting up, holding his head, while Indira and Olivia talked to him. I just waited and tried to figure out how to not lie. It didn't take long before the three of them headed over to me. Alexant glared at me as he approached, Indira matching him. What happened? He growled out, and my temper spiked. I was so tired of being yelled at. Screw it. I knew how to create the time bubble shield. I could create a dirt shield, and I could damn well figure out how to scan for people lurking around me. Hell, the first thing I might ask for training in was invisibility, if it was something I could learn to do. Am I under arrest? I challenged Olivia Jonas, who had taken a step back from the two furious mages. Not at this time. I have questions, but as far as I can tell, you didn't do much of the attacking. We have a pattern mage on the way to reveal the evidence. I can do that, snarled Alexant. And why the hell are you asking if you're under arrest? You're going to tell us everything that happened. Where we were, who cast the time bubble, everything. Anger and annoyance rippled through me. Why had I even bothered to care about him? I didn't have the patience or energy to deal with any more tonight. And I and a certain four-legged creature needed to have a long discussion. As if he could hear my thoughts... Carolyn's purr stopped and he stiffened. I gave him a sharp look and he huffed out a sigh and groomed his paw, ignoring all of us. Detective Jonas, am I under arrest? I repeated. No, she admitted slowly as she took a cautious step back. Are there any legal reasons either of these two have the right to order me about? Not that I know of. Though she didn't sound sure and I swear she pulled up a shield. Excellent. Then I am leaving. I tried to sound chipper and happy, but it came out as an annoyed snarl. I stood up, pulled on my backpack, and picked Carolyn up. Wisely, he didn't struggle or complain. Corey, sit your ass down and answer my questions. Alexant growled out the words, moving closer, looming over me. I looked up at him and smiled. All teeth, no humor. No, I'm not under arrest, and since I'm not, I'm going home. Before he could say anything else, I snapped a time bubble around me and headed a quick walk to my house. At the rate I was spending time, I'd be older than I wanted, but right now, I was going home, and they could all hang. Moving out of time, or in time depending on how you looked at it, got me home without issue, as no one could technically be in the same time as me, though that sounded wrong, but right now I didn't care. It kept me safe, and I dropped it right outside my door, after checking carefully that there was no one waiting for me. I shivered as time caught up with me. I hadn't been that out of sync with it. Only about a minute. I got inside and shut the door. I still couldn't figure out what they had done to safeguard my apartment, but since I hadn't been killed here, I would treat it as a safe space. Carolyn squirmed and I let him down. He headed straight for water. Hungry, he murmured in my head. Yeah, me too. Give me a minute, but don't think you're getting out of that conversation, I said as I headed to the kitchen. First, I filled an enormous glass with icy water and drained half of it, finally feeling almost human. I opened up a can of salmon for him and put it on a plate. As he tore into that, I pulled out pre-made burritos from the freezer. Damn, I love that woman. I whispered as I put the burritos Joe, and probably Sable, had made for me in the microwave. There was enough in the freezer to cover the entire week. If I knew Joe, they probably varied between ingredients. She knew her mom would load them up for their few days in the mountains. I took the reheated burrito and the refilled water and sat down on the couch, Carolyn had finished eating and was grooming his face. 
We need to talk. Chapter 32 Familiars have a mind of their own, and have even acted against the wishes of their chosen mage. And yes, they can kill. The most famous incident known is what caused the fire in San Francisco in the early 1900s. A mage was assaulted who had a familiar that looked like a large red dog. She was caught coming from a reputable female bathhouse and was knocked out from behind. Her familiar found her as she came back to consciousness in the local med ward. It left with her pleading for it not to leave. Her attackers were later killed in a fire that then swept through 30% of the city. The female mage was never found for questioning. History of Magic He didn't look up at me, but his ears laid back and he licked his paw, washing his face over and over again. Yeah, not buying it. You don't need your mouth to talk. So, spill. What is going on? How do you know all of this? Are you a mage too? That question had been haunting the back of my mind. Carolyn stopped washing his face and jumped up on one of the kitchen chairs that faced me. He curled up in a typical cat loaf pose, his twitching red tail the only thing that gave away any emotions. Life in realms doesn't work like life does here. Here is odd and strange and overly logical as magic is small and weak. Small and weak? The idea of what some people could do, even if beings from other realms regarded our magic as weak, made me shiver, and I rubbed my arms. Tea may have been a better choice than icy water. Okay, but what does that have to do with Banyarl and me? Why is it so important to teach me? You are queen. So are others. But you are first human in many lives to be a true queen. To use all of magic, not the broken shallow versions that exist here. Your world would never survive full magic. But you need to. I swear to Merlin, if you tell me there is a prophecy about me, I will quit right now and go find a desert island to live on. I'm no hero. I said the words with an unfeigned fervor. I had no desire to be the hero of any story. I just wanted to help people figure out what happened to Stevie, and have a life, my life, as weird as it might be. Amusement rolled through my mind as his ears flicked. No, there is no such thing as a prophecy. Even foresight is rarely accurate. Magic and free will not easily predicted. You're too powerful not to be trained. There is fear that if you not fully understand your capabilities, you might irreparably damage realms. That didn't sound good. Maybe a hero might be better, because it sounded like I was the villain in this scenario. How do you know all of this? I thought you came here as a kitten, and wait, people are talking about me? The idea that I was a subject of conversations among creatures elsewhere made me nauseous. Kit are true, but still have family, friends of family, and friends I make like Arachina. We talk about our humans. He buried his face in his paws for a minute. I often go home to see family and parents, to hear news and take lessons. I felt slapped. You go back? Home? When you sleep. I talk to parents and litter mates when needed. Other families need to be within sight to talk to. But blood family is like... Well, you're in your phone. Across realms? I squeaked out the words. I knew with absolute certainty I could not tell anyone this. The OMO and the government would have a field day with this information, and they would round up familiars. No government was good about ignoring possible exploitations for profit. Would you be willing to leave your home and never able to speak to Joe again? His voice was acerbic, and I flushed. Point. But that means you can open planar rips? The image of Elzeba, a flying serpent that was the familiar of a mage I'd met in my hometown of Rockway, flying in the air, 
and that rip jumped into my mind. Wait, all familiars can? To their home realms? Yes. My magic is still young. It will be decades until reach my full power. But I make tiny rips that I slip through, small enough that you don't notice. I just sat there, shell-shocked. I need to learn to shield. My mind, I mean, if anyone learned this. A few know, but you correct. This is not good to share. Leaning back against the chair, I thought. The quiet of the night seemed ominous, and I needed more food. I kept expecting there to be pounding on the door from Alexant or Indira, but it didn't happen. I got up and headed towards the kitchen. There had to be something with sugar somewhere. So what? You go home and go to school? I'd come back with some ice cream, needing the sugar rush. Not exactly. We are not human. We learn differently. He just curled up tighter, and I got the feeling this wasn't a subject to push him on. Why bane your all? Carolyn sighed in my mind. Ugh. Reasons. He slipped out when you were at a place of games. Found this world interesting. And since he got here, he could go back and forth. Wait, what? The constant unexpected information was about to drive me crazy. Corey, you can't know everything at once. There are lifetimes of information you need learn. For now, if we come through a rip to your reality, we can then move between this realm and our realm. But if we never get there, we are blocked. Remembering the monsters that I'd seen lurking in chaos and the teeth on Salastra, that made me feel marginally better. Tersing can come and go as she wishes. Carolyn laughed, his whiskers twitching at me. <laughs> She is what your mythology calls a god. She always able to go anywhere she wishes. I'm not supposed to understand what drives or controls her. That doesn't really make me feel much better. He didn't respond, and I ate more sea salt caramel ice cream. Can I trust him, Banyarl? He has no reason to hurt you, and many reasons to see you succeed. But... All beings have their price, even Joe. That hurt in a way I couldn't explain, and I shied away from it. True. I played with the ice cream container, thinking, Look, I don't control you. I know this. But can you tell me next time if someone is watching me? Or warn me? Thinking you are hiding things from me makes it hard to trust you. Carolyn shifted focusing on a spot on his tail with great intensity. That was unkind of me. I not want to tell you because you act different or worse, attack. He needed to see real you to be interested. But swear I not lie. But Imkath, Corey, misdirect, yes. Put you in danger, no. There was a strange sigh, and he straightened and came over, curling up next to me half-draped over my lap. He would soon be too big for even that. You need to know what we are. I not know any living mage that understands complexities of this relationship. Unless Joe or Sable gain a familiar, you never tell them. You must agree to this. Not tell Joe? Sable, I could understand but the never-telling Joe? I want to know. I mean, who wouldn't? But why do I need to know and they don't? Does this have to do with why Banyarl called you a focus? Yes. He sounded reluctant, and I suspected that Banyarl had let something slip. Humans know familiars make lower offerings needed for magic, but they not know why, or at least no one I know has come back and said their human realized. We, familiars, act as direct connections to magic, rather than forcing your body to connect and appease the cost. We already connect, and magic like us. It comes easy and fast. From science classes, we are both magnifiers and connections into magic. 
different familiars have different strengths. I am more chaotic in my nature. Most felines are. So anything from chaos will cost you almost nothing. Well, for spirit and order, I can help, but not to the scale you would see with chaos. I never heard so much from him, and I could hear it chafed him to release so much information. So your Wi-Fi was so easy. That made me sit up straighter, and he grumbled as he rearranged himself. Mm, part of it. Part is your experts don't know as much as they think. If you have one branch, as you call it, you have them all. And you are very strong. A queen. His eyes were closed, and he rumbled gently on my lap. I let myself stroke his red fur and thought. If I learned everything he talked about, took classes from Banyarl, it would make me a much bigger target, but one that would be well-armed and in ways they would not expect. What did you mean Joe and Sable are broken? I asked. He stayed silent so long that I almost shook him to wake him up. They should be not as powerful as you, but more than they are. They should be Merlins in their elements. Joe... Her brain is broken. You know this. I not know the wrongness she has, but maybe Banyarl can help. Sable, something wrong with her blood. It is too sweet. It smells wrong. Merlin's in their own elements? Sweet blood? What is he talking about? My thoughts stuttered to a stop. Are you saying Sable is diabetic? Maybe. I do not know what that means for what I smell. She is not off balance yet, but it's getting there. He huffed and rolled over so I could pet the other side. They should be queens, and they are not. It hurts for what they should have been. I'd have to tell Sable to get checked immediately. African Americans were at risk for diabetes, but she was young and in shape, so it didn't make sense. But maybe it meant something else. Either way, telling her immediately was important. The ever-elusive queen word. I didn't know what it meant, and even if I asked, he'd just reply with queen. It reminded me of trying to explain colors to a blind person. If they'd never seen pink, trying to describe it without using any other color was almost impossible. Maybe for him, queen was like that. Why me? He flicked ears at me, but didn't respond. I mean, why did you choose me? Why do I get familiars and so many mages don't? Will Joe and Sable? Is complicated. He sighed in my mind. Maybe if there is something young and curious and they are looking for adventure. But I don't know. It is a random, complex thing. We don't really understand it ourselves. Maybe it is magic creating the link and setting us together. That doesn't explain why I'm a double Merlin, or why everything is collapsing down on me. He didn't respond, but then what could he say? At the end of the day, as smart as he was, I didn't think he knew much more than I did. We'd just have to learn together. I sighed and picked him up. (sighs) Let's go to bed. I'm exhausted. And it'll be a long week without those two around. Chapter 33 Familiars die or can be killed. The mage doesn't always survive. But there have been three recorded instances of familiars sacrificing themselves to take out others. All three were during World War II and are part of the reason mages with familiars are respected so highly. What was witnessed could not have been accomplished by any mage outside a total sacrifice. History of Magic Much to my surprise, the first I heard from Alexant or Indira was Sunday afternoon, and where I'd been expecting the wrath of Alexant, there was a soft rap at the door. Peering out, I saw them standing there. Bowing to the inevitable, I opened and let them in, None of us said anything, though I didn't protest when she put down a bag on the table 
and started to pull out salad and steaks from a local restaurant. Alexin stood up straighter and looked at me as Indira finished. I just stepped back and looked at both of them, the standoff obvious. Not that I would refuse the food. Carolian had already jumped up on his normal chair and watched her with predatory eyes. A huff of impatience pulled my attention back to Alexin, who looked like he was reporting for an unpleasant duty or something. Corey, we always seem to get off on the worst possible foot. My attitude the other day was counterproductive. I need to remember you aren't my employee, and I don't have the right to order you around. I really need to know what happened and figure out what we need to do. He never said sorry, but it was probably as close as he'd get. That didn't mean I'd forgiven or forgotten his attitude. If you treat your employees like that, you're lucky you have any. And frankly, if you treated me like that and I did work for you, I'd have you up on charges or I'd be at HR complaining of hostile work environment with a bully. He flinched a little. True, I need to quit treating you like a disobedient child. You think? I'm not yours, and frankly, I've been on my own for a long time. You want me to work with you? Fine. But I'm tired of having this conversation. Either treat me as an equal or get out. I kept my voice hard, and I held his eyes with mine. I didn't want to do this again. I understood I needed to share information. Heck, I had vested interests in sharing it. Staying alive was very important to me. He cleared his throat, but didn't look away. <clears throat> Understood, Miss Monroe. I turned and looked at Indira. That goes for you, too. I'm not a mark or a pawn or a tool for anyone, and if they don't figure it out, they will lose any chance they have to work with me. I don't know who you report to, but make it crystal clear to them that if they try to manipulate me, I'll salt the earth before I work with them. Honesty is always the best policy with me. She dipped her head. I will pass that along. A note of respect in her voice. That I could live with. Now, yay food! I helped myself and gave Carolyn his due before sitting at the table and looking at them. I didn't know if they had discussed this beforehand, or in the time I was getting myself food, they had done their look at each other and have a conversation thing. But either way, they smiled and started in though not until they had served themselves. I remember the man attacking us, then you yelling about Carolyn, and then what happened? I don't know what was you versus them. He stayed conversational and not confrontational, which was a pleasant change. I pulled up Earth to block them until Carolyn got to me, and since I'd figured out how to do a time bubble shield, I grabbed him and threw one up. Then... I swallowed, a flash of remembered fear as I saw the attacking mage get ready to cast. I think they hit us with a KO. Alexit nodded. I thought so, but wasn't sure. Was relatively surprised we woke up alive. So, you were weakened when you reappeared in the time bubble. What happened? I chewed slowly before I answered. Yes. It took us to another place. In another realm, I think. You didn't regain consciousness until after we got back. Got back? You mean someone took us? And here is where I lied without lying. I knew he had the ability to tell the truth if he focused. Not like Francine, who did it without thought. But he could make offerings to tell if I was being truthful. And I knew he would right now. I could do this. A creature, actually. I'm not sure why it cared. It said it had dealt with people attacking me and brought us back. Alexant leaned back and stared at me. How long were you there? I shrugged. I don't know. I don't think we talked that long. Maybe five to ten minutes? I didn't even think to look at my phone. What was it? Indira asked. A spirit realm creature, I think. It implied that. But I can't swear that was true. Heck, I'm not positive if it really was in another realm or maybe something else. Else? What else could it be? Alexin asked, leaning forward. How in the heck should I know? 
I don't know everything out there. What else? He snapped. I gave him a warning look, and he subsided. Was there anything else? Like what? He sighed and leaned back. What did you talk about? What do you think? Where am I? Where were you? Questions like that. Did you get a name? I panicked for a minute, but then I realized I could easily answer that all the way. I didn't remember the full name he'd given me. Kinda? I mean, I was told it, but I really don't remember what it was. That headache was enough to make me ask to die. Oh, I'll agree with that. That was a killer headache. The death wounds on the men attacking us are similar to the ones found on the sniper earlier. Did that being that talked to you match? How would I know? I didn't see any of the wounds. And besides, I have no clue what that being could do if it wanted. I mean, Carolyn can have three-inch claws appear if he wants. I was exaggerating a little. At most, they were only two inches long, but they were still sharp as blades. You're telling me a creature, for reasons we don't know, and in a manner we don't know, rescued us? What? We're at the mercy of the other realms? I shrugged. I was told I was amusing and that I'd been watched for a while, and it was mentioned that access to our realm was gained when the rips were opened during the sec game. Alexant groaned. Ugh, that damn Goins. He's dead or worse, and his actions are still creating drama. That unicorn wounded three men until someone found a virgin to come talk it down. You can't lay that at my feet, I protested. I'm not, just... He rubbed his temples. I swear, I think the Murphy's curse and Lady Luck soaked into the cells of your body. No one else can attract this much drama just by existing. Something about his words warned me, though I couldn't say why. Indira and I spent about three hours in the capital yesterday in a teleconference with the ambassador for Japan, the head of the OMO, and a civil deputy in charge of the U.S. mage draft. The food no longer tasted good, and I pushed it away. Needing to clear my throat, I got up and pulled out a Coke. Maybe the sugar and carbonation would help buffer what he was about to say. At least it gave me something to do with my hands. Tensions are high. Japan is demanding that the estate is theirs, because no one emerges at that age, so you can't meet the requirements of the will. But the estate manager insists that you didn't meet all the criteria. So, right now everyone is up in arms, but the government desperately doesn't want his estate to fall into Japanese hands. Tensions are still high, but no one wants to create an international incident. But killing one student doesn't qualify? I asked, not snarky, more just frustrated. After all of this, I'd earned that damn house. Not if we can't tie the attempts back to them. And right now, no one can prove Japan is behind the attacks. It is all suspicion. Alexan sighed. I liked him better when he was exhausted and not being all demandy. Made working with him easier. If there was proof, would it make it so they would step back? And what research could he have that the government wants so bad? Given what Carolyn told me, there was a lot of research that, if he had, I might not turn over. It was too risky. There were days where being able to talk to Carolyn without sound would have been nice. This was one of them. I don't know. Something about planes and what lives on the other side and travel to them. Alexant shrugged. Did James Wells have a familiar? I asked, wondering because that could be risky. I was rapidly starting to think mages that got familiars were those that automatically didn't trust authority. I don't know. He was awfully private. Didn't leave his house often. As to them backing off, if there is proof, probably. Indira said, picking at her salad. Believe it or not, the fact that you joined Emrys has raised the pressure for people to leave you alone. It also has the effect of spreading knowledge of your existence around. Have you created your logins yet? I looked at the pile of mail on the table. I piled everything I hadn't had energy or time to deal with there. No, it's on the to-do list. 
Well, it will get you into private social media groups, and they can help make it harder to sweep anything that happens to you under the table. But there is one more change. She seemed to sigh and brace herself, which made me tense up. These guys made my life more difficult half the time. Japan wants to meet you, to conduct their own tests to see if you are really the heir. No, next. My voice was flat. I didn't owe them anything. Alexant nodded. I told them that would probably be your answer. They are also asking to increase the people guarding you. He would have talked more, but I interrupted. Why? I can use the time bubble as a shield. Carolian and I'll work on scanning more, and I can create an earthen shield. I didn't admit that would be the first things I'd get Banyarl to teach me. I needed to be safe. They won't be happy, Alexant pointed out. And am I required to keep them, whoever they are, happy? I don't care about Japan. It isn't my problem. They can petition the OMO if they want to see my test scores. Are there long-term consequences if I don't give in to their demands? This is what worried me. Besides the risk to Joe and Sable, yet another reason I needed them to learn to protect themselves. This time they did look at each other, but they didn't seem to come to any decision. I just waited. I didn't know anymore what to do. If I had to guess, I think they wanted what was best for me. But they were being shoehorned into this, and they didn't know any more than I did. Which meant this was my choice and my life. I'd figure it out and ask questions as I could. I don't know, Alexan admitted. You've got people amused at how determined you are to be independent, and just as many annoyed as all get out you don't need them to rush in and save the day. So, you're both winning admirers and creating people predisposed to dislike you. Indira nodded, but didn't add anything to his comment. So I should continue to be me and ignore everyone else? I asked, and Indira snorted softly. (laughs) I'm not sure you could do anything else. You might be the most intractable young person I've ever met, but in this situation, it will serve you well. She pushed the remains of her food away. Just remember we are here to help. You might as well get something out of it. Right now, just try to find out why or who is pushing for me to get killed. That would be an enormous help. All I have for the rest of this semester is school and a few basic papers that I plan on getting done this week. And I'll be careful, I said, forestalling any protestations or comments from either of them. Alexant gave me a long, hard look, then nodded. Yes, I suppose you will. If you need something, just let us know. Really. With that, they left, and I had the apartment to myself for the next week. Chapter 34 Have you met a ronin? If you see someone doing high-level magic without tattoos, or have knowledge of someone who deserted from their draft assignment, report them. The reward for citizens reporting verified ronin is $10,000. The penalties for sworn officials not reporting them is prison. OMO PSA I spent the week just like I said I would. I wrote papers, studied for tests, ate almost everything Joe had left for me, and ate way too much pizza. My bank account cringed a bit at the pizza bill, but I pushed it away. I'd gotten a lot done that week, but either way, I was excited and ready for Joe and Sable to come back. The place was way too quiet without them. Sunday afternoon, the door opened and they flew in, smiling with tanned and wind-burned faces if I wasn't mistaken. Corey, you missed it! We had so much fun. We rented sailboats and spent most of the week on Lake Lanier. It was wonderful. Joe gushed as they piled stuff into the apartment. I settled back and let them babble. It felt good, and I was very glad they had a marvelous time. My twinge of envy didn't last long. Letting them talk about everything they did made me see how much they had needed this time together. They almost glowed with happiness. 
When they had unpacked and we warmed up leftover pizza, they shifted their attention to me. So? Quite weak? Joe asked as she grabbed a slice. Even two-day-old Fellini's was good pizza. Not so much. So, what would you two think about having specialized training that you can't tell anyone about? Not your parents. No one. Um, Corey, what are you talking about? Joe had paused with the piece of pizza halfway to her mouth. While I'd practiced my evasions for Alexan, I hadn't really for Joe and Sable, and I didn't want to. Remember me complaining that it felt like someone was watching me all the time? They both nodded and started eating again, but they watched me carefully. It turns out I wasn't imagining it. Someone named Bane Neural had been watching me, and he knows Carolyn. He agreed to teach me, well, us, and teach us how they use magic in the plains, not how humans use magic. They had both paused mid-bite to look at me. Joe choked down the bite and dropped her slice on the plate. Koi, what exactly is a bane yarl? I shrugged. I think he's a griffin? Maybe a hippogriff. I'm not up on my mythical animals. At this point, both of them stared at me as if I had lost my mind. Maybe I had. Are you interested? I asked, a bit desperately. The offer is there, but you must swear to never tell anyone. I said I wouldn't agree if you two weren't training with me, so... I knew I was babbling, and I sounded like a lunatic. Um... Sable trailed off and shrugged, an odd look on her face. I'm having a hard time believing this, but I'd learn magic from anyone, especially given what we found out. It seems knowing this might be better than not. Joe just grinned at me. I'm in. Show me the griffin. Anything that helps me learn this shit is good. I wonder if we can put this on our resumes. Her wink let me know she was teasing, and I stuck my tongue out in response. He is griffin of high steps, and is an honor that he assists. He is highly regarded, and his magic has been refined over centuries. Caroline remarked in our heads, making both Joe and Sable start. And what does that mean exactly? Joe asked as she picked her piece of pizza back up, though she was watching Caroline and me more than paying attention to her food. Centuries? I squeaked. I didn't know why that bothered or surprised me so much. Why should they have the same lifespan we did? That he is not lesser creature. That he left his realm and came here means he was looking for... Carolyn paused and I looked at him. He stared at the wall fixedly, and I wondered if this was what it looked like when he talked to family on the other side. Suddenly, all the staring off into space behaviors changed their importance. Call it looking for adventure, and training three queens is high honor. Why else I choose you? Am I some weak creature to not want the most powerful? His tone had an odd mix of arrogance and pride that I wasn't sure what to make of. Questions tumbled over in my mind, but I took the one that bubbled to the front first. Wait, you chose all of us? He flicked an ear at me, either an amusement or annoyance. Are you and Joe ever to be separated? No, we both said together. Then we both laughed self-consciously. Then I would have needed to take both. No? I wanted to respond, but I just looked at Joe and shrugged helplessly, and she grinned. Hey, he knew we were a package deal. But Sable, where does she fit in? As she spoke, her hand drifted out to touch Sable, who grabbed it back. Will they make it? Are we meant to be together always? Do I want to share Joe? The mental questions surprised me, and I frowned. I wanted her to be happy, didn't I? Carolyn's comment pulled me out before I could go down that path too far, but it still lodged in the back of my mind, wiggling. If you make it formal, then I get three. Not a bad deal for a guitar. His smug tone caused the two of them to giggle, and I smiled a bit, still trying to ignore the thoughts in the back of my mind. Okay, fine. I'm down with bean talk. But where? 
You're followed about every minute of the day, and I can't really see a griffin being able to fit in here. Much less do it without anyone seeing. I mean, I'm down, but really, how is that going to work? Joe asked the question as she looked around the apartment, but she didn't let go of Sable's hand, their skin evocative of mocha and caramel. Corey, I asked him show how this works. Since I didn't see Sable or Joe react, I got the feeling this was private. I just nodded, still not positive how much of my mind he could read or not. He twitched an ear in my direction and jumped off the back of the futon where he'd been perching. He walked over to the wall, facing out at the courtyard. With his tail twitching, he sat and stared, and my nerves jangled. The desire to change my mind and just hide hit me. I took three deep breaths, and on the third, the familiar flash spike of pain slammed into my head, then disappeared before I had time to wince. A ripple opened in the air, vertical, unlike all the others I'd seen. They'd always been horizontal slashes across reality. Here, it unfurled like a zipper, neat and clean. It opened back like how a dress would fall away when unzipped, but rather than chaos or colors or things that sucked you in, it revealed a clearing with, of all things, a table and tea set. He is waiting. We all turned to stare at the cat, then back at the opening. He's inviting us over for tea? Sable whispered, her voice an odd hushed tone. Carolyn flicked both ears towards us, then stood. Essentially. With that, he walked through the rip. I didn't quite panic, though my heart spasmed as he stepped through, but I could see him on the other side, his red tail waving, and pink butthole glaring at us, making it clear he was laughing at our cowardice. He's laughing at us, isn't he? Joe said, looking in on the scene before us. Yes, I replied and stood. Fine, let's go see if we die in horrible ways. My father will kill all of us if we do, Sable warned, but she rose and headed towards the terror in reality. Ah, but we will already be dead, so we'll be safe. I grinned at her as she snickered. (laughs) That might be true. We probably should never mention this to anyone. Just like the training. I'm pretty sure all of the responsible adults in our lives would have a collective heart attack. Sable grinned a wide, wild grin. You're a risk taker. I blurted, looking at her and smiling. Caught me. I've been being good because I didn't want to scare her away. But this looks fun. She tilted her head towards Joe, who had come up behind her, and rested her chin on Sable's shoulder. Uh, Joe, have you been driving safe with her? Joe flushed and didn't meet my eyes. Maybe? You two are made for each other, I said, and forced down the twinge of pain that went with the statement. Let's go to another realm. We all grinned and headed to the rip. With a deep breath, I stepped through the rip and into the other realm. From being there previously, I wasn't shocked. But when I had stepped back to our realm, it had been more like walking into a smoke-tainted room. After being in the crisp outdoors, this time it was more jarring. The sounds changed. The scent went from a musty smell I hadn't noticed, not to mention the pizza, to crisp and clean with a hint of jasmine. The rustle of the leaves created a music I just wanted to close my eyes and lean into. Maybe get a bit of peace. I sighed, knowing we didn't have time for that. With regret, I moved forward to the table and the tea. It was low to the ground, in a style I associated with Asia. I turned in a slow circle, looking at the picture-perfect clearing with tall, willowy trees all around us. I wanted to say they were elms, but the odds were they didn't exist on Earth. Movement caught my eye, and I froze as Banyarl walked out of the trees through a gap that should have let nothing his size come through. Behind me, I heard Sable gasp and Joe mutter, Holy shit, she wasn't kidding. I turned and gave her a dour look, and she shrugged, mouthing the word sorry at me, though I really didn't blame her. If she had come to me talking about griffins and whatnot, 
I probably would have asked her what she'd stolen from her brother, Stinky, this time. Last time, it had been pot. From a distance, his coat gleamed like liquid gold, and the wings were spread wide as if landing or getting ready to take off. The purple shimmered and shifted shades as he laid them down against his body. The beak looked brighter and sharper in this clear sunlight. That grabbed my attention. Above us was a sun, but it was a different color than ours. How, I couldn't say, but I knew that the sun I saw through the light pink clouds was not ours. Welcome, queens. May I know your names? His voice, powerful and deep, rumbled through our minds, and it occurred to me he'd been whispering last time. The level of compassion surprised me, and it made me feel much, much better about this entire situation. I took a deep breath and did my social duties. Bane, Jarl. I stumbled. I really didn't remember his full name. Nee Kierso. Carolyn prompted me. I shot him a smile as I continued. May I introduce Josepha Guzman, known as Joe, and Sable Lancet. As I said their names, they bowed, an oddly formal gesture. It is an honor to meet you. I am Banyal Nikiyoso. Please come join me. He gestured to the table, then walked over and settled down next to the table, looking for all the world like a huge cat bird, which I guess he was, settling in for an extensive snooze. I headed over and sank down next to the table and directly across from Banyarl. Carolyn curled up next to him, literally sticking his nose under his paws. I guess that's his way of saying he's not worried. Whether it helped or not, I didn't know. But the tea lifted into the air and poured into our cups. The scent of jasmine and honeysuckle filled the air, making me smile a bit. I am sure you have many questions, and I feel Corey was not in a good place to be able to think things all the way through when she was here earlier. This is what I offer, though you will be under the same restrictions as she if you choose to learn from me. Sable and Joe both nodded, eyes wide as they stared at the griffin. I will teach you how magic works and how to impose your will on it. However, you may not tell anyone about my teaching of you without my prior permission. You will promise to not attack me with any means, magical or mundane. And finally, at some point there will be a decision you must make. You must hear me out if I come to discuss that decision with you. I have already agreed that if there is a time component, my discussion will not prevent you from making that decision, as per Corey's request. He fell silent, looking at my two roommates, then in turn looked at me. I shrugged. I agreed. It seemed a small enough price. I'm in. Joe said, her eyes alight with excitement. Me too, Sable chimed in, her eyes wide and taking in everything. I just leaned back and wondered where the hidden price to all of this was. Corey, you worry too much. You are mine. I will protect you always. Carolyn rumbled in my ear. I glanced over to where he was. He lay next to the griffin, looking for all the world like he was sound asleep. I hope so. Chapter 35 American Native Indian tribes have an interesting relationship with the OMO. They are the only group of people technically outside OMO authority and do not subject themselves to the governing body. Technically, as they have treaties that proclaim themselves as sovereign nations outside of the U.S. control, there is no leverage to bring them under the OMO governance. Since the borders of the five reservations in America are all strictly patrolled, and they allow no one in or out without clearance from both sides, their level of magic users remains opaque. Magic Explained 
It took two hours before we got everything figured out. We would come to this glen every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 6 to 8. Banyarl promised to open a door for us to his home, we'd learn, and then go home to eat. He did promise while there would be some homework, it would only be similar to what Indira assigned us, more playing with our magic than anything else. It took 20 minutes for Joe and Sable to come down off their high at meeting a griffin and be ready to discuss anything. But it was late and we all had school on Monday. And they had a ton of laundry to do. Me? I just needed to think. Carolyn was sitting on my bed, looking at me when my alarm went off Monday morning. I blinked sleep-blurred eyes at him. Yes? You should shield yourself well. I will stay invisible, though I may show up to speak with Erichina. I snorted as he verified he could be invisible if he wanted. Will Banyarl be watching me? No. Carolyn's voice had a sour note to it. He believes you know enough to protect yourself. He regards it as excellent test of your resourcefulness. I really wish people didn't think so highly of me. Help staying alive would be appreciated. I sighed and got ready for my day. Whining wouldn't change anything. I walked into Sable making coffee and pouring sugar in, and that jogged my memory. Sable! She jumped and looked at me wide-eyed. Even at 7.30 in the morning, looking prettier than me on my best day. What? Is there a history of diabetes in your family? I blurted out the question as she looked at me confused and still not quite awake. History? Well, um... She paused and closed her eyes, thinking, I think my grandma has it and her sister had it, but dad doesn't. Why? Her eyes reopened as she looked at me, still frowning. Carolyn said your blood smells sweet, a wrong sweet. The only thing that occurs to me when he says that is diabetes. She looked at me for a long moment, and I had no clue what thoughts were going through her head. After what seemed like an eternity, she nodded once, sharply. I'll stop by the urgent care and ask them to take my blood sugar. I'm young and don't have any of the contributing factors, but I'll check. I heaved a sigh, feeling both better and silly. I grabbed coffee and a bagel and stepped out, Carolyn slipping out next to me. To my vague surprise, Alexan wasn't there. I'd kind of expected him to be waiting for me, but he wasn't. The feeling of having a target on my back intensified, and I slapped up the time bubble, setting it a full minute out of sync with everything, and started walking. I glanced around trying to see where Carolyn was, or at least where he had been, or was it would be? Either way, I didn't see a thing, and that didn't help my nerves at all. Hefting my bag on my back, I headed to class, the bubble tight around me. I weaved around people, all of them moving slowly compared to my out-of-time bubble. It both delighted me and gave me the willies. Just the knowledge of what you could do with this if you tried made me nauseous. I got into the building. Opening doors was always problematic but it was easier if I waited for someone to push it open and then slip in. Once in, I stepped into a corner and dropped the bubble. I waited for the shudder of time catching up with me. I needed to get better at this. Carolyn appeared at my side and brushed against my legs. I looked down at him and realized he was still getting bigger. In the last month, he'd gained another few pounds and now pushed 20 or more, but he had no fat and was all muscle. Hey, See anything interesting? I bent over and petted him as I spoke. No, no one watching you. Just boring birds. Too easy to catch. I snickered and headed into my Monday morning class, Magic 101. The class had lots of interesting things, talking about the various spells. Bernard focused on entropy today, but again always high level about how it worked and the specific ways it created effects. The more I listened, the more I realized that we were being actively brainwashed into thinking this was all you could do. I kept that idea in my head for when I saw Banyarl. I wanted to see what he'd have to say instead. Charles waved at me, as did Erichina. 
though I think she was waving at Kirlian. When I stepped out of class, I froze. Olivia Jonas pushed herself up from where she'd been leaning against the wall, checking her phone. Her mage tattoos seemed subdued today, which made no sense. I watched her warily, and she smiled, though I didn't think it was completely unforced. Morning, Corey. Was wondering if I could walk you to your next class? I bit my lip. While Indira could wrap two of us walking in a bubble, I didn't trust myself enough. Carrying Carolian was different. He was touching me. I had only practiced casting it around me, not anyone else. It is safe enough. I am actively watching. That comment made me want to ask him questions, but for now, I just nodded at her. Sure, something up? She shrugged as she turned to walk with me. I scanned the area as I pushed open the door and saw Carolian dart out before he disappeared into the brush or went invisible. I guess they were the same thing. No, mostly following up on the attack last week. Oh, yeah, I'd forgotten. Amazing how a griffin can completely distract you, even from why you met a griffin. I steeled myself to practice my not lying, even while I scanned the area. It was amazing what constant attempts to kill you did for your situational awareness. Do you have any idea what killed the man attacking you and Agent Alexand? She asked, her voice oh too casual. I stumbled and looked at her. I thought Alexand killed them. I thought back. They had asked me who killed the attackers, and I told them I had assumed Alexand. But then on Sunday, Indira had asked me if the creature could have caused the wounds on the dead mages, not the cops. I'd gotten pissed and left. I figured Alexant had answered all the questions after I blacked out, but then I realized he'd been there too when Banyarl woke me up. I'd been so mad I hadn't thought about it. If the KO got both of us, he couldn't have killed the mages trying to kill me. Olivia shook her head, and I ripped my mind away from my spiraling thoughts to pay attention to what she was saying. No, he said when he went down, both were still alive. But before you reappeared in the time bubble, we found both attackers dead. Do you know how or what killed them? I shook my head. I was unconscious. I didn't see anything. I swallowed. Not queasy exactly. I mean, how many dead bodies had I seen at this point? But more, how had they been killed? How were they killed? Olivia frowned at me, but she answered, one had his neck snapped by what looked like a solid blow to the back of his head. The other had his bioelectrics fried, similar to a KO. But this was on a level we hadn't seen before, at least not officially. Oh, I said, my voice low as I walked towards the next building. No, I didn't see any of that. So, you don't know who killed the two attackers? Alexant said the KO knocked him out before he could attack. How would I know? I was already unconscious and didn't see anything. Who called it in? They'd have a better idea. A student called it in. Said he just saw the bodies, not how they got there. With a bubble in the middle that was, he thought, a time bubble. Her voice was level. In fact, she sounded just like one of the detectives on Law and Order Magical Case Unit. That made me snicker, at least internally. That was more than I knew. Sorry. Figured I'd ask. She seemed disappointed in my answers, but I didn't look to check her temple again. I needed to get in the habit of remembering magic with faces and names, but right now, all I could remember was Entropy Mage, which didn't tell me enough about her skills. But it meant she didn't have truth sensing. Anything else? I asked as we climbed the steps to my building, my eyes still scanning the area, though I still didn't know what I was looking for. It was unlikely a person in yellow spandex would jump out, point at me, and yell, I am here to kill you. No, just figured I'd check in on you and see how you were doing. Make sure you didn't have any issues. Besides people trying to kill me? Or trying to make sure I'm not talking about what I did? Does it matter? She didn't look at me, instead did the same looking around I was doing. 
Just means I know whose side you're on. Have a good day, detective. I said and moved through the doors towards my next class. Caroline on my heels as I left her behind me. I got through the doors and left her on the other side of them. I headed in to find Indira lurking at the door, rather than being in her classroom. I fought back a sigh and looked at her. Checking to make sure I showed up? She shrugged. Is there anything wrong if I did? Makes me wonder if you think I'll get killed that easily or you know something I don't. I looked at her, both annoyed and warmed by her waiting for me. Just making sure you're okay. Mentor, remember? I have a duty towards you. Her voice was slightly chiding, and I nodded. True, but I've got a time bubble for me down. The rest, I don't know. But maybe three of them dying will make them think twice. I said as I walked towards the classroom. Maybe. I know Joanna has spread out the news about you being an Emrys, so that should help also. But it won't be overnight. Obviously. I muttered as I climbed the stairs up to my normal seat. Carolyn stopping to sniff noses or legs with Erichina. He bounded up the stairs and settled next to me. She say hello? Passed on news about the realms. Nothing interesting at the moment. He focused on his paws instead of looking at me. Typical cat. I focused on class, trying to think about what she showed us and what I would ask Bane Jarl. Today was about the rarer strengths, non-organic. Most people with this as a strength end up in the physical sciences. Even via the draft, you'll find yourself pointed to R&D, space research, military weapons, or possibly the USGS. This is one of those areas where the more you know, the better you are at what you can do, which is why specialization is so important. She walked back and forth as she spoke. My degree is in quantum physics as I'm strong in entropy and time, while my specialization is in planar rips. I'm sure this will or won't surprise you, but the OMO regards the Area 51 planar rips as theirs alone and doesn't normally allow those who work for the government access. What this means is I know the structure of atoms, quarks, particles, and other things very well. It also means that if you asked me the chemical makeup of caffeine or salicylic acid, I'd have to go look it up. She reached in the box at her feet and pulled out two objects and placed them on the table. The class giggled as one of them was a giant piece of chalk, like what a kid might use to draw on the sidewalk. The other was a chunk of geode, cut open to reveal the crystals inside. Remember, one of my strengths is non-organic, which means I can use the following spells. Forge, purify, magnetism, ID element, call element, move electron slash subatomic observation, and electricity. Now, I'm sure, as you can guess, magnetism, forge, and electricity won't do as much good with these two items. And to be frank, forge requires a crucible and heat, and we aren't about to do that in a classroom though you will get to play with it in your labs as you go through your classes. But what I can do is show you how you can use this with only a small offering, because I know exactly what I'm looking for. She lifted the geode up and put it on an old-fashioned projector machine. It showed the beauty of the rock on the screen behind her. There are little strands of pyrite going through the quartz in here. If you can't see it now... You'll be able to come down after class and inspect it. Indira set it back down and took a seat next to the table, putting herself at chest level to the geode. Call element is of great use to mining companies, the USGS, and for those of any artistic bent to create beautiful jewelry. She paused to smile at all of us. Remember that. Just because you are a mage doesn't mean you can't follow art. You just need to think about it more. That made me pull up my phone and do a quick search for mage artists. The search results exploded with links and some of what I saw were stunning pieces of art and drawings. I filed that away. I had no artistic bent, but it made me feel a bit better that maybe the draft wasn't a slave system like I'd feared. I had to look up the structure of pyrite 
because it isn't something I was all that familiar with, but if you get into professions that require it, you'll learn multiple molecular strands and chains that will become as easy to recall as your family address. She pointed at one of the larger crystals at the top of the geode. Now, this is not as glamorous as they make it sound in the movies, and I'm also not willing to go bald to impress you. There was a round of laughter at that, and she flashed a smile, sultry and familiar. Watch the line of gold. She glanced at it and held a small dish of white ceramic under it. The gold-colored substance seemed to ooze out of the crystal and drip down into the dish until the crystal was clear, except for a small, visible flaw. Who can tell me the problem about how I did this? A few hands shot up. Mine wasn't one of them, because I was still trying to wrap my mind around what she had done. You had to melt it and move it to get it out. Someone answered. I blinked back into the conversation as I tried to understand what she had done. Exactly. That requires more energy. But in most cases, that is the only way to make this work. Note that you also have to have an opening for it to come through. Otherwise, you'll need to make one. Something usually easier to do with a hammer than your magic. Again, laughter rolled through the classroom, and she kept talking. I settled in and thought about it, mostly how to use that idea to protect those I love. Chapter 36 The feared rogue hunters used by the U.S. government to find mages who have avoided the draft are nothing but hired killers. Why are you forced into hiding if you don't want to get addicted to the power of magic? Your strength marks you as a threat. Fight against the chains of the OMO. Freedom from Magic The rest of the day went the same way. I saw Indira twice and Alexin three times. They didn't approach me. I just saw them as I went from one class to another. I still didn't know where I fell on the annoyance level, amused or irritated. The smell of chorizo and salsa hit me as I walked into the apartment, and I looked at Joe, surprised. I thought we were going to eat after. Even as I said that, I moved closer to the stove. Rice, peppers, chorizo? My mouth totally disagreed with what my brain was saying. I know, but I was starving and couldn't settle down to study, so food. This way we don't go on an empty stomach. Not going to argue. I glanced at my phone. We have about 20, so give me. Joe laughed at me as she dished some into a bowl. Where's Sable? She said she'd be home in a few. Joe shrugged. The conversation from that morning went through my mind, and I hoped Caroline had been wrong. Food was more important than anything else, and I couldn't resist taking a bite. Want some? Caroline protested. I gave him a look, but shrugged. The cat knew what he could or couldn't eat better than me. I dished some up into a small dish and set it at his place on the table. He sampled it, ears twitching as he thought. Then he inhaled it to my amusement. I looked up to see Joe laughing too. That was what Sable walked into, us giggling at my familiar eating Joe's Spanish rice. Hey, gorgeous. How was your day? Joe asked as she moved to set a bowl at Sable's place. Sable smiled but I thought it seemed a bit forced. Long, but let's talk about it after Banyarl. I've been thinking about it all day. A strange sensation, not a buzz or a purr, just an underlying vibration to her words. I'd been playing with my psychic skills, as those were the rarest, but one set of homework said you could train yourself to use them more easily than some of the others, since so much of it was passive, with almost no offerings required. Truth was one of those. Strong psychic mages could force you to tell the truth, and some Merlins could rip it out of your mind. Both sounded horrid to me, but knowing when people lied might be useful. So does that mean she's lying? I wasn't going to pry. Not yet. Besides, I was interested to see what Banyarl said. We all finished eating, with Carolyn licking his bowl clean. We got ready and stood in the living room feeling a bit stupid. Now what? 
Joe asked, looking around. I let him know. The doors should be open shortly, Carolyn said, working on making sure the fur on his tail was perfect. You can talk to him from here? Sable asked. She'd smoothed out. That was the best way to describe it. But Joe kept glancing at her, so I knew she'd picked up on something, too. Carolyn's air flicked back and forward, but he didn't answer. Instead, sat up into the Egyptian cat pose and stared at the wall. A flash of pain in my mind as it rippled and grew to about six feet, then widened until it was about three feet across. He rose and strode through as easily as walking out the door. Fighting not to be giddy, I followed him. I stepped into the clearing. It looked the same, but this time, instead of a table and tea, there were three pillows and a bunch of rocks on one end, with Banyarl sprawled in the middle. Queens, welcome. Are you ready to start? Banyarl asked as he looked at us, his purple wings sleek against his back. Absolutely, Sable said, taking the lead. I was still looking around, curious about the changes, but I followed her. Excellent. Take a seat. We will start with elements as all of you have at least one. His hawk-like gaze focused on Joe first. You are air, while Sable is fire and water. Cory has earth. I have water as well as air, so this will work out well. Having the full quartet provides opportunities that others envy. Between the three of you, you have all the elements. It makes you a very powerful coven. Wait, coven? I said. Carolyn had mentioned something like that. Banyarl shot me a look I interpreted as amusement. Is that not what you humans call a group of witches? I started to protest, but couldn't, and shrugged. Point. Sable, you have fire. Tell me how you'd burn this feather. One of his feathers floated to where we were sitting, hanging in the air. Sable nodded and talked about what Indira had told us about molecules and moving them faster until they ignited and reducing the amount of offering that was required. Banyarl looked at us. While I didn't know how to read an eagle's face, I was sure his look was somewhere around are you kidding and WTF, but that was just a guess. After a long, very long moment of silence, he finally spoke again. Well, I must admire your creativity at how you manipulate the world around you. It removes the wonder of magic more than a little. Most magic is powered by different forces in the universe. Though I am now wondering if I need to go back to your realm and practice more magic. He shook his head as if shaking away an idea. But be that as it may... The elements are in almost all things. All life, all stone, all beings hold some or all of the elements inside them. While each element is pure within itself, they work together in wondrous ways. Earth is the slowest to respond compared to the other elements, but it is still the foundation for us all. I watched and listened carefully because something about this sounded not wrong, but incomplete. Within the feather are the elements from which it was created. Its cells still have the spark of fire, of water, of air and earth in them. They were made from them. All you have to do is call forth the element you wish. Fire is always easiest, as it consumes and feeds itself. Sable... As a mage with fire and water, you should be able to sense it. Reach into the feather and call it forward. The offering is not the price you pay for magic, but the offering to the element to feed it as it answers. Sable looked at Joe with a dubious look, but she just shrugged. We were here to learn. And if we believed a creature that was literally magic didn't know how to use it, then we were wasting everyone's time. Separating out a few strands of hair, 
she still needed to focus to make sure she offered what she wanted, and not some random strands. She'd mentioned the awareness of her body didn't come naturally to her. Joe and I were both far ahead of her when it came to choosing what to offer. Shaking out her shoulders, Sable stared at the feather. I couldn't sense anything, but that didn't matter. Other than planar rips, I never really sensed magic, but I watched her, eager and worried about my turn. Nothing's happening, Sable said, the frown creating creases between her eyebrows. Don't tell it to catch fire. Call the fire to you. It exists in that feather, and your cells are your offering. Think of it like bait trying to lure something to you. Sable shot him a look, then smiled. Oh, Tazen, that I'm very good at. Oh, yes, you are, Joe said, glancing at her sideways. Yes, fire is mischievous and fickle, but it is always hungry. Offer the tasty cells, and it will come to eat them. Then, as fire is wont to do, destroy what held it if only lightly. Sable winked at Joe, still holding her three strands, looking at the feather again. Hair, fire, fire. I have nice organic material for you. She murmured in a sing-song voice. One of the hairs she held curled in a wisp of smoke. Then it vaporized. A split second after that, the feather burst into hungry flames, brighter and more powerful than what I'd seen candles do. In a second, it had crumpled to ash. I was struggling to process what I'd seen, even as Sable leaned back, her eyes wide. Wow, that has never happened before. Well done, but there you can see the difference in the techniques. I suspect if you had lit the feather your way, it would have burned slowly and in the lower heat ranges. But when you call fire, it comes with all its potential and explodes onto the scene. That was extremely cool. Air and Earth are so brain. Joe pouted a bit. I couldn't argue with that, but that was why they often used fire to demonstrate magic, because it was showy and visible. Oh, I don't know about that. I believe you saw the power of air at the appearance of Tyrsene on your plane. Bane Jarl had both a chiding and an amused tone. In many ways, air is the easiest to call. Joe snapped her attention to him. Really? You are breathing, are you not? This time the amusement was obvious. Oh, point. She said the word slowly, as if that hadn't really occurred to her. So while air isn't in the objects, it is always around us. He paused and tilted his head. Unless you find yourself in space, then you will be at a significant disadvantage. Humor laced his tone, and Carolyn sniffed. But in amusement or disdain, I wasn't sure. Wait, I can almost process the elements being how you say, and having personalities for lack of a better word. But about the others, though, you have non-organic, pattern, and entropy. Those can't be beings or essences or whatever. I protested, now royally confused. No, but there is always intent. Master mages often use magic in a way that makes sense to them. For example, an avian mage I know thinks of everything like music, and that is how she performs her spells. They are all songs, constructed to do what she needs. Magic is an entity herself. I looked at him blankly. He ruffled his feathers. All I can do is ask that you try it my way. Oh, I plan to. It just doesn't make sense to me. I protested, feeling like I was being ungrateful. It is magic. Even your science only follows rules as you come to understand them. Do you not change them regularly? Yeah, kinda. But some things don't change. 
I wanted to argue, but I knew he was right. They used to think the earth was flat, that a god dragged the sun around the earth, and that diseases were caused by demons. True, but your explanation of how and why they work changes often. Now, Cory, see that rock over there? The one with the feather laying on top of it. He deftly changed the subject, and I frowned, but let him. I needed time to think about this. Adding it to my ponder over later list, I turned to look at the rocks. One of the smallest had a purple feather laying on the top of it. Yes. Earth is slow to respond, but it is always around us. Even the water of the oceans know it exists at Earth's whim. Reach into the rock and ask Earth to separate. I had to parse what he meant, but couldn't argue. If the Earth split open, revealing the molten rock that lay at the heart of our planet, the waters would vaporize. Though, I never thought of it like that. So, he wanted me to ask Earth to separate? I hadn't gotten to the specialty stuff. That all started next semester, and I'd been doubling up on my magic and science classes. So, other than the times I'd used Earth trying to protect myself, I had only played with it a little. If this was a class and Indira had asked me to do this, what would I do? Tell all the individual molecules to break their connections and turn to dust, I guess. I reached out with that idea, and the amount required made me flinch. I'd lose half my hair length. Not acceptable. I don't understand. If I try to break it down to individual molecules, the offering would be a lot. I actually knew down to the molecule, but a lot made more sense. Corey, you are overthinking this. Earth is slow. It needs to be sweet-talked. Offer it a reward for doing what you ask. If exasperation had a sound, it was the rattling sigh he made even as the words were in my mind. Fine, fine, I'll offer. I felt ridiculous, but I reached out, looking for Earth, or something that felt like Earth. Want some nice hair cells? If you just break into pieces, it's all yours. Something stirred in the rock, or maybe it was the rock. A questing brush, then acceptance, that familiar tug, but this time there was emotions attached. The hair I'd visualized crumpled into nothingness as the rock did the same. Merlin's balls! Chapter 37 The uptick in wizards and archmages in the United States Southeast is concerning. While normally 80% of those tested are mages, we have historically seen and continue to see in other regions a breakdown of 35% hedge, 20% magician, 25% wizard, 19% archmage, and 1% merlin. In the last month, only for the American Southeast, we are seeing 95% positive rates, with 10% hedge, 30% 30% Magician, 35% Wizard, 23% Archmage, and 2% Merlin. OMO Internal Report By the time we left Banyarl, we were exhausted, but also brimming with excitement. Part of me really wanted to get back to Earth, our Earth, and see if magic behaved the same way. We'd gone over all the elements, and they all could be bribed or courted depending on your point of view. He had promised to start teaching us shields Wednesday, which excited and worried me. I just wanted to crawl into my bed. I was past exhausted. We stumbled back into the living room, or at least I did. Apparently it helped to pick your feet up and step over the edge of planar rips. I shook my head, trying to clear the fuzziness, Very glad we'd eaten before we left. Otherwise, I'd be going to bed hungry. Even eating sounded like too much effort. I turned to tell them goodnight. Okay, Sable, what is going on? Why were you late and what has you upset? Did something happen? Joe looked at Sable with an expression I recognized. Worry, concern, and stubbornness. A pang shot through me and I pushed it away. Worry spiking right behind it. I'd forgotten. How could I have forgotten? I sank down on the couch, and Caroline sprang up next to me, but he didn't purr, just pressed against me. 
His ears flicked forward towards the two of them. I... Sable broke off and sighed. I really need a drink, but that isn't on the table. Let me get a glass of water and I'll explain. Promise. She turned and headed into the kitchen before Joe could respond. Biting her lip, Joe sank down into her chair, elbows braced on her knees, watching Sable take much longer than necessary to get water and come back. I petted Carolyn, trying not to think or guess. My guesses were always worse than reality, so I just wait. Even if I wanted to jump up and shake her until she told us. Sable came back and sank into her chair. We all had our own desk chairs, crowding the living room when you included the club chair and the futon couch. But we made it work, and having our own place to do homework helped us turn on and off homework mode. She took a sip of the water, then looked at Joe. So... Corey mentioned something to me this morning. What? Joe looked stricken and glanced at me, worry in her face. Joe, stop it. Nothing bad. Not like that. Sable interjected, and I could see Joe relaxed. That surprised me. She was worried about me not liking Sable? The thought had never occurred to me. I didn't know how I felt about that. Another thing to figure out. She told me Carolyn thought my blood smelled sweet. Smelled sweet? Joe parroted, looking at me, Carolyn, and then back at Sable. Joe, chill. Let me tell you. Sable smiled at this point, and I watched her relax. Sweet. So I said I'd stop by the clinic after class. It turns out it's a good thing I did. I have diabetes. Type 1. They said they've been seeing more people develop it in their 20s. It's called LADA, or Latent Autoimmune Diabetes, though that is just one name. Basically, I have juvenile diabetes, even though I didn't have it as a kid. I need to go in for a bunch more tests, but they say I'm just developing it, so I'm eligible for some new drug trials. Either way, it is manageable. I just need to get the test done and see what we can do. But that means monitoring my food and my blood sugar for the next few weeks. She shrugged, but even I could tell she wasn't happy. No big deal. I needed to lose weight anyhow. That lie screamed to me, but I didn't say anything. Joe stood, and I saw the indecision in her body. She wanted to hug Sable and scream at the same time. I took the choice out of her hand. With a grunt of effort, I needed to get back to the gym, I stood and went over and hugged Sable. I'm glad I told you. Maybe they can find a cure or something. This is a good thing, right? It is, actually. They almost never get anyone coming in this early. Usually they only come in when there are issues, and I'm coming in now. So, yeah, this is a good thing. Move, Corey. I want to hug my girlfriend. Joe said behind me, her voice tight with emotion. I released Sable, and she fell into Joe's arms. I took the time to clean up the kitchen. When Sable excused herself to use the bathroom, Joe stomped into the kitchen and slumped against the counter. This sucks. What good is magic? So I can blow a feather around or pull metal from the earth. It can't cure a disease or stop a heart attack. She ranted, though her arms were wrapped tightly around her. Jaw clenched. A mage saved Stinky's legs, I pointed out, and she sighed. I know, but he fixed something broken. How do you fix a broken pancreas or immune system? How do you make someone not be sick? I don't know, but isn't that why Banyarol is teaching us? So we can figure out these things. Maybe they can use magic to fix stuff. It would be nice. I want to know how to stop people from dying. My voice broke a bit. I so rarely talked about Stevie. I want to know why people die. How can I stop them from dying? No one should hold someone they love as they die. It's horrible. Oh, I don't know. I always thought if I had to die, that would be the way to go. Sable said, coming from the hall into the kitchen. I mean, it seems like that is the best way out of this life. In the arms of the person you love. I shrugged. Maybe. If you're old and gray, like 60, and have lived your life. 
then maybe. But young? No one should lose their child. No one should hold their brother as they die. I said this a bit too forcefully as I set a mug down and it shattered as it hit the bottom of the sink. You have Murphy up again, Joe said as she grabbed a paper towel to pick up the pieces. Dang it, maybe there's an easy way to repair. I know a pattern mage can rebuild it, but you'd still need hours and lots of glue. I looked mournfully at the blue-green bits of ceramic. I'd gotten that for winning the vocabulary B in eighth grade. That had been the prize. One more aspect of my past in pieces. Sorry, Koi, Joe said as she threw the towel with broken pieces away. I pulled down the Murphy surrounding me and forced a smile. I don't know about you two, but I'm wiped. I still have classes tomorrow and need to read up for a quiz. At least with most of my papers done, I didn't need to panic too much. I wanted to remind you what Alexant mentioned. We already know we can't tell anyone about this, but be careful that anything you do can be explained away as one of the set spells. I suspect we'll learn stuff that we won't be able to cover, but that means not doing it in public. We have to be very careful until we are well done with our draft. And you have your own private compound for us to retreat to? Joe teased me, but I saw the seriousness on her face. Pretty much... Starting to think that is why some Merlins have compounds. Not to hide, but to keep the government and the Omo out of their business. I sighed. (sighs) I want to learn this stuff, but I'd like us to not get killed because we aren't people they can control. Control seems extremely important to them. Yeah, even my dad is worried about that with you. You are a magnet, Corey. For good or bad, you seem to be in the center of things you can't control, Sable said, leaning against Joe a bit. She looked exhausted as I felt, her normal perky smile flat and worn. Tell me about it. It is ridiculous, but what can I do with my luck? I said, finishing cleaning up. We ready for bed? Oh, I forgot to tell you. Mommy called me today. She said she'd be down this weekend. I flinched as I knew she would want to go out and I couldn't risk her. I wasn't good enough to shield multiple people. Yet. Stop it, Corey! Joe chided, reaching out to slap my arm lightly. Mommy knows what's going on. While she's annoyed at everyone about this, she'll tell you what she's been doing. She would never risk your life or put our family in danger. I sighed and nodded my head, recognizing something I couldn't change. Good. She has her heart dead set on Saturday brunch with the three of us. So about ten, expect her loaded with everything you could ever want for brunch. I swear, she'll spend Friday night cooking. Oh, I said and felt a silly smile cross my face. I missed her, the entire Guzman family really, but Marisol specifically. She misses you and was very bummed you didn't come up with us, but she gets it. The rest I'll let her tell you. A huge yawn cracked her jaw as she finished. Yeah, that sounds good. I'll use the extra time tomorrow to catch up on my readings. A few minutes later, I was crawling into bed when Carolyn jumped up. Lately, he'd decided he preferred to be under my bed on a pillow he'd pilfered, claiming it was the most comfortable option in the house. I gave him a look that I figured he could see. He saw better than I could in the dim light. Do I want to know? You did acceptably today, Carolyn said, and I shifted as I felt him staring at me. Which means what? I asked, my arms crossed. That you will struggle more than I had hoped to balance out the magic and the science. It is magic, for all that your people want to wrap rules and conditions around it. It is still magic. Everything has rules, I protested, frustrated that a cat was being judgy. A magical cat, but still. Does it? Do emotions? Do thoughts? Do random synapses have an order in which they fire? Well, no, I muttered. A cat was making fun of me. Either I was really tired or I'd hit the peak of low in my life. 
Corey, I stiffened. He rarely used my name. You have things to unlearn, but Banyarl is not displeased. I just... He heaved a mental sigh in my brain. It tickled. I want my queens to be incredible, not normal. Oh, Carolyn. This time I sighed and pulled him to me, cuddling him like he was still a tiny kitten and not the growing behemoth he would be. You are incredible. Give us time. We might surprise you. You will never surprise me. I expect you to surprise everyone else. He cuddled into my arms, purring. I held him tight. But deep inside, I wondered what he suspected that I had no clue about. Chapter 38 While most branches have seven spells associated with them, Psychic has only four, and only two of them are actively taught. The other two, Telepathy and KO, are only taught during your draft service. There are some abilities that are regarded as so dangerous or laden with risk that only certain people are authorized to learn them. Magic explained. There were two more attempts on my life in the next week, and I quit being able to think it was just my luck. The first had been clumsy, and it had to be some idiot from a local gang, as he ran at me with a knife, yelling about die and I'll be rich. I took a page from the mage that had tried to kill me in the street and sank him up to his waist in the ground, and just walked away. Carolyn peed on him. The second, oddly enough, involved poison, that Carolyn stopped by sniffing my food I ordered at the food cart. I'd forgotten to grab a lunch. I used magic to pull out the elements and identified chemical structures, and sure enough, someone had tried to use cyanide on me. It would have worked except for his nose. Caroline got extra salmon that night. It made me jumpy, paranoid, and cranky. The only time I wasn't on edge was either in the apartment, and there I still worried someone might blow it up, or in Banyarl's realm, or space, or whatever his little bubble of existence was called. He made us think of magic differently, and while it frustrated me, I liked rules and predictable results. The possibilities were endless. Friday. Knowing the weekend was ahead and the odds were Alexant or Indira or someone else would be pushing for more information about the incident where Baneral had rescued me, we focused on mental and physical shields. No matter what you think, there is no difference between mental and physical defenses. They are the same thing controlling a branch of magic to protect you. What you must do is decide how to use your ability to protect yourself. Corey, I shall leave you for last, as you have a veritable plethora of strong branches to choose from, and start with Joe. Banyarl said, moving his giant head to peer at Joe. She squirmed a bit, but stood up and walked to the middle of the clearing. Transform is your strength. We will start with physical first. What surrounds you? We'd gotten better at his leading questions, but even so, she shrugged. Air, dust, pollen, my clothes. Accurate, but not quite enough. Even the air we breathe is filled with tiny organisms, bits of life. If you take those... You are strong enough to make them into a wall around you, though it is easier with air, which is why you will use air to augment your transform ability. He kept stumbling over the word transform, and I wondered what he knew it as. You can do that? Sable was leaning forward, very interested. The idea of using magic to augment other skills wasn't addressed much in any of the college classes. Of course. That is why Merlins are so feared. Not because of their power, but because they can combine it to do multiple things. Did you not know that? He sounded surprised. We all looked at each other and I shrugged. Maybe? I mean, I know the best volcanologists are Merlins with fire and earth but I figured that just let them do it better. 
I never really thought about combining it. Yeah, she's right, Sable said slowly. I knew of a Merlin with air and water, and the weather guys were offering him lots of money as he could sense the changes, but I didn't think about it. They harp that the sections are separate, and you use one or the other at any given time. I could almost hear our minds spinning. Humans always make things fit into boxes when they have no shape, Banyarl muttered. You will owe me, Kellyan. This is most frustrating. You are enjoying the challenge. Carolyn seemed unconcerned by Banyarl and didn't open his eyes from where he lay sprawled under the trees. Banyarl flipped his tail once in Carolyn's direction and looked at Joe. Take your transform and air and create a shield. Air doesn't have to be pliable. It has value of its own. It can even freeze. If I get it that cold, it would be so cold it would kill us all, Joe protested, crossing her arms and glaring. You are taking this much too literally. It is magic. Tell the air to hold in place, to be impenetrable, to take the dust and particles and make them rigid, strong enough to block. Remember, air is bribable. Bribe it. Ask it to stand still, to protect. Joe took a deep breath and stared. The hair at the end of her locks stirred and a tiny bit floated away. The area around her became oddly fuzzy, as if I needed to clean my glasses, except I wasn't wearing any. A stone flew towards her, hit with a muffled whack, and fell down. Holy shit! It worked! And it didn't collapse! She poked at it, a funny look on her face. Then she took a step to one side, and it flowed with her. A larger rock flew at her, and she flinched, but the odd denseness captured it, and it fell to the ground with a thwump, dust flying up from the impact. Well done, not elegant in execution, but with experience you will create it thinner and convince air to follow you. For the elements... It might be wise to offer them bribes occasionally just because. It makes them more interested in you, which is rarely bad, at least on your plane. He went through a similar thing with Sable, using water and fire. Hers looked more like steam, where the moisture caught it, and fire vaporized it. I don't understand. How can fire and water work together? Sable said as she ran her fingers through her odd wall. And why aren't I getting burned or trapped or something? It is magic. Do not think it knew what you wanted, which was a shield to bend and flex with you. And why would it harm that which created it? While fire can get hungry and burn both, it only happens when it is no longer controlled by you, but by its hunger. That kind of made sense in my head and explained why fire mages could throw fire and not get hurt, but couldn't put their hands in a flame. As to the elements working together, they are not enemies. I've found many of your cultures seem to think fire and water are enemies. They are powerful together and can change the other elements. Don't think they can be pitted against each other. You must respect their powers and allow them to work together. Watch. His voice dropped off in a way I had come to recognize he was concentrating on something. A small stream that I had not noticed before. How had I not noticed it? Bubbled. Then a spout rose in the air and began to twist and dance. Air lifted my hair, causing it to dance around me, even as the water took shapes and twisted around in a manner that seemed, for lack of a better word, magical. Wow, I've heard of some people that can do that, but I thought it was pure water skill, Sable said, her eyes narrowed. You can do it with all water, but it requires larger volumes to support the structure. With air, the requirements are altered. He looked at us. 
Now, Corey, yours is both the easiest and the hardest. Are you ready? Sure. I lied as I rose. What do I do? From the laughter in his tone, I thought he knew I was lying, but I'd still try. Ready or not. Your physical shield of Earth is the easiest, but I believe you already know how to do that. Demonstrate, please. Banyarl said, his wings half-mantled as if ready to leap into flight. That added to my stress. Did he think something would go wrong? I swallowed hard and nodded. The clearing provided much dust, but I decided I'd try the bribe method instead of what I was coming to realize was the brute force method we were taught on Earth. We just wrapped it up in science and made it seem logical, which made me feel better, but I was coming to realize logic had nothing to do with how magic really worked. Visualization was everything. Here, Earth, I have some blood for you. Want to make sure nothing can get to me? I said it softly, almost sing-song for some reason. Dust exploded around me as the drop of blood I provided, courtesy of a torn fingernail, vaporized. A rock came flying towards it, but instead of dropping to the ground like with Joe and Sable, it vanished into dust and became part of the shield surrounding me. Merlin's balls, Corey! That's incredible! Joe said. I turned to look at her, but it was like looking through a windshield on a car that had just gone off-roading. I could see her figure, but no details. Excellent. The Earth is active and grabbing any projectile to help protect you. I wonder... Something came flying at me, and the glint of metal had me ducking, but it hit and crumpled, joining the rest of the material. Very well done. That was a small lump of metal, and Earth pulled it in just like the rest. Offering blood was an excellent choice. While any offering of yourself is regarded as flattering, offering living blood is the most flattering and effective. Well, short of organs or other items. His voice trailed off, and I got the feeling he was listening to something. That is pretty cool, but not exactly subtle. Your time bubble is probably easier to deal with. Sable pointed out as I let the earth go, saying thank you. I felt silly, but it felt wrong to not say thank you. That is true, but sometimes being out of time is not the best option, said Banyarl. I must say that I am confused. Kaelian said you were broken, but you seem capable mages. What about you says that you are broken? His head tilted as he scanned us for defects, or something like that. I squirmed and saw Joe drawing on the ground with her toe. I don't know if I'm broken, but I apparently have a disease that will follow me the rest of my life. Sable shrugged. Rather than get into specifics, let's just say my body doesn't deal with food correctly, and that can kill me if I'm not careful. Watching a griffin frown was odd. The ridges of his face pulled down and his glare intensified. It made my skin crawl and I wanted to move away from his gaze. That makes no sense. Why is it not being repaired? Joe laughed. It was bitter and I flinched at the sound of it. (laughs) We can't fix stuff like that. I guess creatures here are lucky and they don't have issues like that. Me? Me? I have trouble with words and letters. I can read, but they move around and there isn't anything they can do to stop it. So, I'll graduate if I'm lucky, but it will be a B, not an A. No matter how hard I work, I can't get things to be perfect, and memorizing everything I hear gets exhausting. By the end, she just sounded tired and ready to go home. That makes no sense. This time his voice sounded thoughtful, and I saw his wing twitch. What of you, Corey? Are you also broken? Probably. My brother is dead, and I've got all this power. But you'll have to ask Carolyn if I am, because I don't know what his definition of broken is. He says we aren't as powerful as we should be, and Joe and Sable aren't broken, just themselves. 
I had to defend them. My best friend wasn't broken. And diabetes wasn't that big of a deal. Only annoying. I see. He gave us the strangest look, which, given he had a beak, was saying something. He shook his head, the feathers around his neck flaring up, then settled back down. Very well. Now for mental shields. Of this core, you will have the easiest time. Then Sable, Joe, I will need to work with, so be on your guard. The changes of subject caused me a bit of mental whiplash as I looked at him. Okay, what? You have access to the spirit magic. It calls to you. Those of us with magic in this realm can do things that most do not understand. Wait, you're a Merlin? I didn't know why that just dawned on me, but I looked at him surprised, and now looking for his mage tattoos, which he wouldn't have. His wings shifted a bit. It would depend on how that term was applied. Am I a mage that uses magic across the realms? Yes. My primary realm is what you call spirit, but I can use water and a few others as well. I shot him a sharp look. I recognized deflection, but I didn't say anything. We all had our secrets. Elements are easy to work with, but the spirit realm can be one of the most powerful. After all, your soul exists in your mind and it is easy to prevent others from touching it. Huh? What I had managed to read on spirit magic, and I had barely put a dent in the books Marisol had gifted me, was very explicit about the spells available in spirit and soul, and how they could be used. This threw me because other than the KO spell, most of them seemed kind of weak and boring, especially when compared to fire or time. In the psychic branch, it had only mentioned four. Telepathy, truth, KO, and memory. When I checked with the college curriculum, only telepathy and truth were taught. You cling so hard to your science, You keep forgetting this is magic. Here is what mind reading feels like. A whisper of pressure, a feeling of something foreign in my mind, and I flinched. See? If you are paying attention, it is obvious. Now, usually only surface thoughts can be read. In your mind, I saw an image of books and spells and what looked like a list of classes. Banyol made it sound like that happened all the time. I choked down vague nausea and I nodded. But isn't that telepathy? They lump it together. So can I talk to Carolyn without sound? It should have occurred to me sooner, but I didn't have classes in spirit spells until my last semester. You don't already? Banyol's feathers flared and he glanced at Carolyn. She needs to use her magic more before I can teach her. She is too jumbled and blasts everything. It sounded like a complaint, and I glared at Carolyn. Ah, true. They come into it so late, they do not speak this way as most of us do. But all your queens should learn, and soon. It is a great advantage among humans that depend on sound. How? Carolyn asked, as I thought the same thing. Joe and Sable both leaned forward, looking just as interested. Yes, I thought only spirit mages could learn telepathy, Sable said, frowning. No, all mages can speak mind to mind if they wish to learn. It is part of having connections to magic, and as you all have connections to Kaelian, it should be easy enough. You may need to learn to meditate and focus on clear thoughts, That should help. He shifted his gaze back to me. For now, if you feel that pressure, think of a wall of noise between you and the pressure. Try it. He spent the next 20 minutes helping me create what he called a rudimentary shield. That will do, but we must get you all trained. He heaved a sigh. Ugh, go. I will see you on Monday. I have much to consider. Chapter 39 
Some have argued that call lightning, an air spell, and electricity, a non-organic spell, show that there is crossover between the branches. There are a few that seem similar at first glance. Call element and call mineral, non-organic and earth respectively, have factors in common. But the way you find and create them is greatly different. All branches have their own aspects, and just because of surface similarities, you should not think they are the same. Magic Explained Saturday morning, we got up and cleaned the house like mad women. While it was cramped with the three of us, we made it work, but it meant we needed it clean by the time Marisol got there. Her look of disappointment hurt too much not to. The counters were ready for dishes, and we even got some flowers to put on the table in two hours. Carolyn wisely stayed out of our way until we heard the knock on the door. Joe pulled it open to reveal a smiling Marisol standing there. Josepha! Excellent. Here are the keys. Go get supplies. Marisol ordered her. See, Mommy? Joe hugged her tightly and headed out to where her mom had parked. Corey Sable, oh, it is so good to see you, she said, walking in and dropping her purse off to the side. Sable walked over and gave her a gentle hug. You just saw me a week ago. And that means I cannot miss you? Marisol turned to me and smiled. Well, come here, me, hija. You, I have missed. I went over gladly, and the hug Marisol gave me did wonders to ease some of the pangs in my soul. Oh, my child, the messes that keep falling on you. The stars must have blessed you with excitement when you were born. She murmured, pulling back and looking at me. Are you losing weight again? I flushed and went to help arrange the bags and bags Joe was bringing in. With everything going on, and the stress of attackers, and, well, everything, I'd been forgetting to eat lunch and breakfast. Another thing to remember to do. At least Joe made sure I usually ate dinner. I brought everything I could think of so we can have a wonderful brunch, and me hijas can tell me everything that is going on. Tell me about your classes, and I'll tell you what we've been doing about the Cory issue. Marisol stopped and looked at the bags with a huff of annoyance. Ah, silly woman, you forget to get the most important part. She went to her purse and handed her keys and credit card to Joe. I forgot champagne. I bought the orange juice and forgot the stuff to make the mimosas. Please. Joe laughed and started to wave it off, but Sable lit up. Oh, please. I love mimosas, and it's been a while. It'd be nice to have something fun before next week. The look she gave Joe made any attempt at puppy dog eyes I'd ever tried look like amateur week. Joe crumpled in an instant. Okay, to the store it is. Need anything else, Mommy? No, at least not that I can see. Go, we will be fine. I'll have Corey help me set everything up. Joe looked at me. Pull on Lady Luck. You'll need it. With a grin and a wink, she and Sable headed out the door. That isn't such a bad idea. I pulled it on with a whisper of thought. Those two spells cost me almost nothing, and I didn't have to concentrate. They were just there. Intent of magic indeed. Marisol put me to work, combining, plating, and being useful. Carolyn watched us from the club chair, content as he knew she'd brought stuff specifically for him, The brunch was for all of us, after all. The thoughts that had been bugging me, though I'd been scared to put them into words, burst out of my mouth. Am I going to lose Joe to Sable? What happens to Joe if they kill me? What am I going to do? I owe them a decade of service even if I don't get my doctorate. To my horror, I started crying and couldn't stop. I couldn't remember the last time I cried. And now the tears wouldn't stop as everything in me broke. Marisol's arms wrapped around me, holding me so tight that I sagged in her arms. Come here, me, Iha. Sit. She led me over to the couch and sank down with me as I fought to get the tears under control. Caroline appeared at my side, tail lashing. Koi, 
What is wrong? Why are you crying? He sounded confused and upset, and I tried even harder to get myself under control. Stop it, stop it. Crying is stupid. My mental castigation got through, and I swallowed the gooey lump in my throat and reached for the tissues at the end of the futon. Georgia allergies required them. I sniffled and blew my nose. Marisol only let me go long enough to do that. Then she pulled me back into her arms. Feel bitter? No. My eyes are swollen. I don't know why I started crying. Just saying the words made me want to start crying again, but I forced it down. There was a low, sad chuckle from Marisol. I didn't think I'd ever heard that sound from her. Oh, Corey, I'm surprised you hadn't broken down already and honored that you trusted me enough to break down now. I looked at her, confused and not sure what she meant. Marisol patted my hair, a long stroking motion, similar to what I was doing to Carolyn, who curled up next to me, alternating between purring and growling. Give me a minute, mi hija. Marisol pulled her phone out of her pocket, texted for a minute, and then set it down. There. Corey, take a breath. I did as she told me, held it, and released slowly. Again. One more time, and I could feel myself calming down. She smiled and squeezed, but then pushed me back a bit so she could look at me. Corey, you have people trying to kill you. You emerged and immediately went into a life and death situation. You work all the time. The government is taking way too much interest in your life. They're taking an insane course load to meet terms set before you even knew you were a mage. Your best friend is head over heels in love. And you have no person in your life. Child, I'm amazed you haven't cracked before this. I stared at her blankly. New person? She nodded at Kirlian, running a finger over his forehead. Don't tell me he isn't every bit as important to you as any partner would be, and probably more intimately involved in your life. Oh. I sniffed hard and swallowed again, forcing that mucus down. So, what part of all of this and the many other things like teachers, students, and general life that I don't know about is really bugging you? As stupid as it sounds, people trying to kill me pisses me off and scares me, but... My voice trailed off and Marisol squeezed my hand. It's okay, you can tell me. Her voice stayed soft and soothing, and I sighed. I don't want to lose Joe. I mean, I like Sable, I do, but I'm putting both of them at risk. She only has a four- or five-year draft. I have ten. Sable is a junior. She'll be out and done before any of us. I'm going to lose Joe as she'll follow Sable. Then where will I be? Tears started leaking down my face again, and I wiped them away with brisk movements, frustrated at my inability to control my own emotions. Marisol hugged me close and kissed the top of my head. Kuri... Of all the things you have to worry about. And yes, people trying to kill you should be very high on that list. Losing Joe is not one of them. I craned my head back to look at her. How can you be so sure? A decade is a long time. They'll move us around and we can't control anything. Marisol's lips twitched. When was the last time you tried to convince Josepha... Not to do something she had decided to do. I frowned, trying to think. Probably that escape room over Thanksgiving. Did it work? No. She's like a bulldog with a bone when she decides on something. I admitted. Corey, my daughter decided you were hers the day after your first play date. I believe you two went roller skating, then spent money at the arcade. I nodded. I remembered that. I had to beg my mom to take me, and she finally dropped me off, but told me to walk home after giving me $20. That was about six months after Stevie died, still in their numb phase. I hadn't minded. 
Walking three miles wasn't that big of a deal when I got to spend a day without memories surrounding me. Stevie and I had never gone to this place, so it was new. At that time, any place without memories was a good place. Henry picked her up that day, and I remember he said she was oddly quiet all the way home, but she dragged him into the house where I was. I believe I was folding laundry. She made him sit and... Remember, she was 12, Marisol said with a laugh. She looked at both of us and said, I have found my sister. She's mine and I'm keeping her. Then headed upstairs to her room. Back then, I rolled my eyes and just figured BFFs for a while. When she realized she preferred girls, I thought for sure you two would become a couple. But again, she told me, Corey's my sister, not my date. Marisol looked at me. Do you really think anyone, even Sable, is going to change her mind now? I sniffed and swallowed again. Listening to Marisol talk made me feel both silly and relieved. No, probably not. She is stubborn sometimes. Sometimes? Corey, I love my daughter with all my heart, but she can outstubborn an elephant on anything that matters to her. What else is bothering you? Just hearing her absolute faith soothed me. We talked about classes and all the law enforcement people constantly checking up on me. I feel like a kid that the adults have said can walk to school by herself, but every 10 minutes one of them is driving by, just in case. I grabbed a tissue and blew my nose. I don't want to die, but at this point either I avoid the people trying to kill me or I die. I can't see that law enforcement can protect me any better than I can myself. I'm just exhausted and frustrated because I don't understand. Hmm. Well, I might be able to help with that, but Joe and Sebel should be here for this part. You feel better? I nodded, rubbing my face. And Corey? I think Sable is the one. She and Joe click, but Joe will never be whole without you in her life. So work on finding how you and Sable click. Together, the three of you could be incredibly strong. Marisol kissed the top of my head again. With those words of wisdom, Marisol texted Joe and Sable it was safe to come back, while I washed my face. Carolyn followed me into the bathroom. She is correct. Triad would be helpful. Carolyn's voice in my mind didn't surprise me, nor did his words. I'm not in love with either of them, I pointed out, frustrated, and I have no desire to be intimate with either of them. Even as I said it, I double-checked my own feelings. But there wasn't anything there. No desire for anything outside of hugs and friendship. Just love, but not in love. At least for Joe. Sable I liked, but didn't desire. At least I didn't think so. Humans... Family and love does not always include sex. Packs don't have sex with all the members. You find packs that work. You would be a good triad. Men distract. Carolyn laughed softly. <laughs> At least so my Malkin would say. The unfamiliar word caught my attention. Malkin? Similar to your mother's. She bore me, raised me, and let me go to you. He jumped down and headed for the door. They are almost back. There is food waiting. Hurry. With a flick of his tail, he headed out of the bathroom, and I heard the click of the front door. I sighed and dried my face off, still feeling raw and not 100% sure why it all bubbled up. Well, besides the obvious. You know you're stuck with me, right? I jerked my eyes open to see Joe leaning against the door jamb, watching me in the mirror. I am, huh? Yep. You're mine. I love you, Corson Monroe. Always have, always will. Don't know why, don't care. But I promise you, we'll grow old together. With luck, Sable will be there, and maybe she'll have kids for us to spoil. But either way, I'll be here. I found tears rising again, and I forced them down. I'd done enough crying for this year. Works for me. Now, someone mentioned mimosas. Mmm, yes, 
And mommy said there was something she and Henry had been doing about your minor assassin problem. I laughed and followed her out of the bathroom. Sable was sitting at the table, a champagne glass filled with pale orange liquid in her hands. She looked at me, brows furrowed slightly. You okay? Yeah, just a minor meltdown. All good. Well, finally. I looked at her surprised and Sable quirked up one side of her mouth. You needed it. We've been worried about you. You're not superhuman. That made me feel better, and I laughed. (laughs) No, just a double Merlin. Doesn't that count? Nope, still human. Sorry, Sable said with a grin as she passed me a flute full of mimosa. Marisol and Joe sat down with their own. A toast, Marisol said, smiling at all of us. To three powerful and intelligent women who will change the world. We clinked glasses, and I heard in my head Carolyn murmur, My queens. He was drinking bubbly water. He said he liked the tickle, but alcohol tasted bad to him. Okay, mommy, we're all here. Tell us what you've been doing about Koi. Joe prompted, leaning towards her mother. Yeah, I mean, I don't want you to risking yourselves for me. I said, now worried. I hadn't processed that she and Henry were doing things to help me. What do you mean? I don't want you two to risk anything for me. Nothing that drastic. We both are long-standing members of our societies, and we let it be known that you were the daughter of our heart. We sent a few emails to the head of our chapters, pointing out that enough mages die, Why are any of the societies sanctioning the killing of one who is just now starting her education? I don't know if it will help, but it can't hurt. Having a few of the more powerful mages getting annoyed about this would help. Now, come on, we have food to eat. I swallowed my fears and concentrated on enjoying the day. In the back of my mind, worry festered that this was opening them up to danger, but I couldn't put a finger on why. Interrelations between world governments are affected in subtle ways by magic. While the United States has deemed no mage may hold office, the United Kingdom mandates the ruler be an archmage or higher. China's ruler is always a Merlin, and Japan's royal family has no magic users at all, but a horde of mages in their service. The majority of ambassadors are mages, as even a hedge mage with spirit can be a boon in negotiations. History of Magic The weekend left all of us extra peppy, and even the habit of throwing on a bubble as I went between classes seemed less of a grind. Monday, I only ran into Indira, but she just watched, her eyes distant, and I didn't feel like pushing it too much. Classes with her were rapidly getting boring as working with Bainural in the brief time we had expanded my knowledge tenfold. Tonight, he would get all of us to nail down our mental shields. Dinner was leftovers from the brunch, which meant lots to eat. I threw some tamales in and gave Carolyn the chicken steak mixture Marisol had developed for him. We were attacking the food when Joe and Sable got back. Good news! I qualify for the new drug. They think it may help stabilize my body, so I won't need insulin for up to a decade. Sable's grin was contagious. Excellent! I rose, looking at them. What do you want me to prepare? We need to get over there in a few minutes. Just anything fast. I'm starving. Joe tossed her comment back as she set up her book on her computer. With us losing three evenings a week with Bainural, We were doubling down between classes to get the reading and research done, but it was worth it. I made them quick bowls of meat, rice, and beans and threw them into the microwave. I grabbed myself a Coke, draining it while they ate. The caffeine and sugar would help me stay energetic, and maybe I wouldn't crash when we got back, though I didn't bet on it. The rip and reality opened on time, and I stepped into the clearing and froze, Joe and Sable collided with me, sending me stumbling forward a few feet. Corey, what the- Joe froze, and I knew she'd seen the same thing I had. A huge cat, the size of a St. Bernard, 
with emerald green fur that matched Carolyn's eyes, lounged on the boulders, while Bainyarl sat in the typical Egyptian cat pose next to it. Malkin! Carolyn's shout made me wince as he bounded past us and onto the rocks where the cat lay. His nuzzles and purrs, clearly audible in the quiet glade, reassured me. But I still couldn't take my eyes off the magnificent cat. The fur was a rich green that seemed longer than Carolyn's, and the tail lay draped like a whip across the rocks. The large head with ears that had longer tufts on them raised from greeting Carolyn, and she looked at me. The sharp, bright blue eyes seemed to pierce through my soul, locking me in place. I sensed Joe and Sable moving around me, but I couldn't take my eyes away from that gaze. So, you are the one my son left me for, purred a cool, arch voice in my head. Yes? The word came out a bit squeaky, and I had much more sympathy for Joe meeting Sable's dad. Malkin, be nice. Chloe, this is my mother, or mommy, Esmir. Malkin, this is Koi, my queen. Carolyn's chiding but amused voice came as a relief, and I found I could move. And my other queens, Joel and Sable. Oddly, I could feel him mentally touch each of them as he said their names. With shaky legs, I made it over to the pillows and sank down, but still couldn't take my eyes off the huge cat. She had the regalness of every cat I'd ever seen, but her coat and eyes just ramped it up. I almost felt like I could kneel before her and offer her treats. Mmm, now that is an idea I like. What treats would you offer? She purred in my head and I shivered. That answered if she could read my mind. Malkin, stop it. She is a powerful queen, and I gained two others. Look at my pride. Carolyn's voice broke the spell, and I sank back, feeling like I'd been released from an overly firm hug. That is yet another form of psychic ability. While Carolyn is from the Chaos Realm, Esmir is a Merlin equivalent in Chaos and Spirit, and is powerful in psychic. Banyarl informed us, and I could see the tail lash of annoyance from Esmir. She'd been enjoying toying with me. The cat-like behavior relaxed me. Cats, I could handle, even if they were powerful and scary big. Carolyn rubbed his face one more time across hers, then leapt off the boulders to come flop in front of me, close enough that I had no excuse not to pet him. So, why is my milk in here? Not that I minded an excuse to see her. Carolyn asked as he leaned into my strokes. Concerns about your broken queens and the fact that Georgas hasn't found her yet. I stiffened. I saw Joe and Sable, who'd been watching all of this intently, flinch back. Wait, why does that name sound familiar? I searched my memory, and it sounded like I should know it. It isn't time. Back to the concerns, asked Carolyn, seeming not at all upset. Wait, why is your mom here to look at us? And who is Georgas? Joe said. I think she meant it to come out as strong and stubborn, but Esmir didn't look like she put up with protests. He is something we shall not deal with now. While I am what your society would consider a healer, though I have never worked on humans. She rose slowly, and my impressions were solidified. A large St. Bernard. Then she leaped into the air, and my heart stopped at the sight of an apex predator coming at me. She landed with a soft thump, not a foot away from Joe, who gasped a bit. Esmir's paws could kill with one swipe. Peace, young queens. May I look inside your mind? Banyarl indicated you have issues with words and letters moving, which creates difficulties in your world. I watched Joe lean back and square her shoulders. Sure, I'm all for anything that makes this go away. I wanted to hug her as I watched the daredevil side take over. It usually came out when she was terrified, a persona she pulled on when faced with anything that scared her. Then she moved and acted as if it didn't. 
Esmir's whiskers twitched as her tail curled and uncurled. Faith, young queen, this will not hurt. The clearing fell quiet. Even the leaves seemed to fall still, and we waited. I held my breath, scared I might distract her. Just when I had to breathe or pass out, she spoke. You, Sable, you do not have this issue with words and letters. Her voice imperious. No, I don't have any issues like that. Sable glanced at me as if for reassurance, and I shrugged. I had no idea about any of this. May I examine you as a comparison? Um, sure. She had to scoot closer, but I squeezed her hand, smiling at her, trying to pretend like I knew it would be okay. It had to be okay. I mean, worst case, nothing changed, right? Interesting. While I can see definite differences in the brain activity levels, I don't know which area relates to those issues. Most beings here don't rely on reading to learn. There are some like Banyarl that do read. But most of us learn through doing or stories. Your magic is so structured, you've taken the art out of it. But this... She sighed, and the sound in my mind brought tears to my eyes. Ah, I fear that even with me practicing my art to the highest degree, the cost might be worse than the disease. I cannot help you, young queen. Joe forced a smile, but I could see the corner of her mouth trembling as she did. No worries. Isn't like I can't read. I'm getting by, and I'll get better. I believe you will. At some point, ask Carolyn to call me, and I will teach you the stories of our people. I believe they will be at home in you. A smile brightened Joe. I like that. I don't read stories often, but I love movies. I thought so. Now for the sick queen. Her gaze locked onto Sable, whose hand squeezed mine tighter as she met Esmir's gaze. You are a bit more straightforward. Your body is not producing the right chemicals to create a healthy balance for a human. I have been reviewing human biology since Banyar contacted me. While I think I understand how that organ works, it is slightly different from how it works in my body versus yours. However, she paused, staring at Sable. I believe I understand what cells in your pancreas are damaged. So far, it is a small amount. I believe that together, we can offer up those cells even as we convince the healthy ones to grow. Sable blinked. They said they thought that was why I was just now developing it. Was that my pancreas was failing, but they didn't know why. They didn't see a tumor or cancer. Machines? Can't your healer smell and sense the wrongness in your body? Her outrage came through like shards of glass. No, we only have machines that can see if there is something foreign in the body, I said, Sable's nails digging into my hand. Humans, no wonder so many of you end up here when you seek too much power. Give me a month to prepare, then come to me and I am sure we can heal your ailing organ. Sable swallowed and stiffened her back a bit. How about after my school's done? I'll have a full week after finals before I go home for the summer. I watched Joe pale at that and realized they hadn't thought that part through. For me, I'd just be staying in the apartment, but I think Joe was planning on spending the summer working in the garage and getting her hands dirty. They would work it out, I hoped. Esmir inclined her head. That will be optimal. You may need to stay here a day or so, but this I have little doubt of. She looked around at all of us. You chose well, Carolyn. I shall see you later. There was a bit of command in that, but Carolyn only twitched his tail as I petted him. Bane Jarl? Esmir said with an odd bow. Then a ripple appeared in the air about three feet off the ground. She leapt up and sailed into it. A moment later, it sealed behind her. We sat there silent for a moment. Your mom's kind of scary, 
Sable said, her voice a bit shaky. Yes, she is. The pride in his voice made me giggle, and Joe and Sable joined me. If we are done, I believe we have more work to do. Your ability to protect your minds is still woefully inadequate. Bane Jarl's voice cut in as our giggles were dying. We moved back to the art of magic, leaving the science of it behind. I promised myself to figure out why Georgas sounded like a name I should know. Chapter 41 Major agricultural companies routinely hire transform mages to work on modifying plants. Magically modified organisms yield more protein, complex nutrients, or bug-resistant, and grow faster with poorer soil. Regardless of what various groups say, MMO foods are usually healthier for you than traditional. It is suspected that farmers with mage abilities have been doing this for years without anyone knowing. At this point, the odds are all foods are MMO, even if they are not labeled as such. Magic Explained Online That evening, we all learned to shield our minds and our bodies. I felt much better as Jo learned to keep a subtle shield of air around her, while Sable turned her perspiration, easy with the spring humidity, into a barrier. That shield also had the added effect of keeping bugs off, a win-win in all our books. Alexin and Indira were keeping their distance. I didn't know how I felt about that. Mentors were supposed to be there for me, but it felt like they were there for others. I just pushed it away and tried to focus on classes. I'd convinced two teachers to let me just take the finals for their classes, as they directly related to what I'd passed with the EMT certification tests. If I passed, I'd get credit for the classes, and that would make it much easier for me to get the degree I needed. Which meant, when I wasn't in class, either here or in the spirit realm, I was studying. Wednesday, Jo was up to something. Her grins and attitude let me know something was up. But I let her keep the secret for now. She'd break eventually. Shoving the last bites of food into my mouth, I stepped through the portal to gray cloudiness. I halted a few steps in. Bane, y'all? I called out, looking around. The muffled sound behind me told me that Joe and Sable had come in, and the strange feeling was the portal closing. Happy birthday! Sable and Joe called out behind me, the fog disappearing to reveal a clearing full of flowers with Banyarl and a Gorgon. My eyes locked on Tearsane. I knew it was her and not some other Gorgon, and my entire body locked up. Okay, wasn't expecting her. I nodded my head in a rapid bobble movement. Then the rest of it clicked. Wait, my birthday? Joe laughed and pulled me into a rough hug. <laughs> You didn't even realize, did you? I shook my head and thought back. It was tax day. With everything going on, I'd lost track of the calendar. As of today, I was 22. Well, we remembered and asked Bainyarl if he would give you a surprise birthday party. She dropped her voice lower. Though I wasn't expecting that much of a surprise. The bite on my wrist throbbed as if sensing its maker nearby. Happy birthday, Corsand, Banyarl said in an oddly formal voice. We are glad you have shared your life with us. The phrasing had the tone of a saying, and it made me smile. It was an odd way to say it, but it felt good. Nice to know people, or beings, were glad I was in their lives. Thank you for this. Able to pull my gaze away from Tersane, I realized there was a low table with beverages and a cake on it. I took that in, but then looked back at the Gorgon. She's like very intimidating up close, Joe murmured in my ear. You've seen her before? Sable's voice was a harsh whisper of incredulity. Stadium, Joe said back. Tear saying you are scaring the poor queens. Esmir's voice brought our whispers to a halt. 
and she strolled out of the trees, a bag held in her mouth. Say hello and quit acting the imperious deity. I clamped both hands over my mouth to stop myself from falling into hysterical giggles. The old saying about cats having no respect for kings, or apparently gods, sprang into my mind. Very well, Esmir. It was getting tiring posing. Do you think they would mind if I became less me and more them? Tirsane's voice sent musical healing across my brain, and I sighed in pleasure. I don't know about them, but I would prefer you being less you. It gets my fur on end. Esmir said back as she set the bag down on the table near the cake. As always, you are less than respectable, Tirsane said, but she didn't sound upset, simply amused. With that, she changed. Whereas before, I had the impression of her being a full head taller than Banyarl, and so radiating power, you almost couldn't look at her. Now, with a shimmy of her shoulders, she became normal. Well, as normal a woman whose lower body was a snake and wore nothing covering her torso could be. But now the snake seemed like fancy hair, and her breasts were so impressive they seemed more an ornament than actual body parts. I heard Caroline groan behind me, and just like that, the tension snapped. Instead of a deity, a mythical creature, and a cat that could stare down most bears, I saw three beings, all different and just as flawed as I was. Sable and Joe heaved sighs of relief. Mommy sent the cake, and we got you something. Joe chimed behind me, nudging me forward with a bump of her hip. Indeed, young mageling, I felt your presence in my realm, and I thought I would come when I heard there would be a party. Your focus was kind enough to invite me. Tersane flowed forward to the table. And I've never had birthday cake. The word was pronounced slowly, as if it wasn't a word she had used before. I shot a look at Carolian, my eyes wide. He flicked his tail and went over to his mother, brushing against her as he stuck his nose in a saucer of red-tinted liquid. My son has no shame, as is only right. A cat has neither shame nor regret. We are Kath, after all. Her voice purred with approval, and I shrugged. Thank you for this, all of you. And Tersane. I stumbled a bit, feeling rude for saying her name, but I didn't know what else to call her. I am honored by your presence. No one invites me to parties anymore. This should be fun, and I am interested in seeing someday what you have learned and how it compares to your way of doing magic. First cake and presents, Carolyn demanded. I'm with him. You know mommy's cakes are awesome. Stinky drove down this morning and delivered it. I'll serve. Joe said that as she walked over to the cake and picked up the plates waiting there. She knew I hated the happy birthday song and candles. But cakes were never to be turned down. Especially Marisol's. As soon as Joe cut into it, I knew I was right. Cinnamon Mexican chocolate. Something Marisol had created just for me. Rich chocolate batter with cinnamon and raspberry liqueur to give it a kick, and frosting with white chocolate and the fresh raspberries. Everyone waited quietly as Joe handed out the plates. Part of me wondered at all of them having opposable thumbs, but it was interesting watching them eat. Carolyn and Esmir tore apart delicately into pieces, popping them into their mouths. Banyarl ate in a similar manner, tasting each bite thoughtfully but he put the plate down after a few bites. It has an interesting, even attractive flavor, but the lack of protein makes it something to savor in very small amounts. Banyarl didn't apologize, but his regret was clear. You know, I bet he'd love the Chinese five spice mix. It has the cinnamon and on meat. It's pretty good, Sable said, giving him a long look. 
I get the feeling spices aren't something they play with much here. Many of us do not cook often, so I am not sure how that would work. Bainerl said, watching us. I'll think of something. Mommy would hate to think you didn't know about spices. Your chorizo is excellent. We should bring some of that next time. Carolyn interjected. He'd finished his piece of cake and was busy cleaning his face. I admit this differs from anything I have eaten prior. Tirsane looked at the three of us with a considering look. Of the many things I had thought about for trade with Earth, food had not been one of them. But this is a treat. She licked the last bit of frosting off the fork and lay her dish down on the table. Thank you for the invite. She turned her slitted eyes towards me and the cake stuck in my throat. I believe it is customary to give a gift on the day of your birth. I choked down the piece of cake and licked my lips. Yes, but only from close friends and family. You're not obligated to give me anything. I babbled out the words, panicking. Ah, either way, I find this amusing. I shall give you a gift. Oh, crapola. I couldn't even say anything as I stared at her, caught in the horror that was my life. She reached down and pulled at a scale on her hip. It snapped off with a slick sound that reminded me of a joint popping out of place. With a smile that showed off her fangs, she slithered forward and handed it to me. Not elegant or prettily wrapped, as the others, but useful, I think. I took it from her. The scale was iridescent close up, changing colors in the light from green to purple to pink. Thanks. I croaked while my mind raced trying to figure out what to do with it. Her laugh was like bells in my head, and I flinched at the sharp pureness of each tone. Do not look so dubious, young mageling. It is a token. If you ever need me, break it. I will know. Use it wisely. She turned and bowed to Bainural. I thank you for your hospitality. I would like to come view your lessons sometime. I would be honored, Tursain, Banyarl said with a slight bow. Excellent. Until we meet again. With that, she was gone. I didn't know if she could move through rips that seamlessly, or if she turned invisible, or what. My surprise must have shown on my face. Have you never seen someone sidestep? I believe you call it teleporting? Esmir asked, sitting back from the table, legs tucked under her in loaf pose, but her tail drifting back and forth as she spoke. I shook my head, looking at where Tursane had been. No, I mean, I know it is a spell, but only a few archmages and merlins can do it. It's advised not to as people disappear. Almost in unison, Esmir and Banyarl snorted. You don't disappear. You might get lost. However, that is only a permanent effect if you choose it to be. Esmir's tone dripped contempt. I had the sudden urge to introduce her to Indira and Alexant. I have no idea what you're talking about, said Sable. But Cory still has two other presents to open. She nudged Joe with the elbow. Go. My attention snapped to Joe as she stepped forward and pulled a small box out of her pants pocket. Her cargo pants were her favorite during the school year, so the box had not been noticeable as it was not that large. Here, for your birthday, she said, handing it to me. I opened it and felt my heart swell a bit. Joe's birthday was the 1st of October, after all the mess in the stadium. I'd spent some of the money the FBI had paid me and gotten her very high-end headphones to help with all the audio she needed to listen to. Practical and appreciated, but not personal. This? This was incredible. With hands that shook no matter how hard I tried to make them be steady, I pulled out the necklace. The spirit symbol shone in gold, 
with inlaid blood red in the relativity section, a luminous blue in the psychic, and glowing opalescent in the soul area. Joe, it's gorgeous, I managed to say, choking up. I'd been so emotional lately, but things kept happening and I couldn't stop it. Her smile was blinding. We had created it for you. Mommy and Poppy contributed. The red is garnet, the blue sapphire, and the white is opal. We wanted you to have something special. You deserve it. Joe stepped forward and put it around my neck. It hit about two inches above my cleavage. It felt right hanging there. I pulled her into a fierce hug, holding it until I needed to release her to hug Sable. Thank you, I whispered in her ear. Your family. I get that. I'm honored to be a part of your family. She whispered back. Tears stung my eyes as we pulled apart. This custom I find ridiculous, yet entertaining. I begin to understand why Kirlian demanded I assist him with this. Esmir's comment contained amusement and acerbic dryness, it tasting like sweet vinegar in my mind. We all snickered and turned to see her tail pointedly tapping the bag she carried in. I moved over to the table. This is from you, Carolyn? I asked, glancing at him. I mentioned to Malkin. She agreed it would be a good gift for you. I trust you will find it useful. His voice had an odd tone, and it occurred to me he might be nervous. I knelt and ran a hand down his back, smoothing the fur. Thank you. Humans, open the present. This is wasting time. I couldn't help but laugh at Esmir's tart remark, matched with her rapidly tapping tail. I reached for the bag, a simple brown one with basic raffia handles. I put my hand in and pulled out a smooth, oddly shaped object. I held it up, inspecting it. A sea-green, translucent, lumpy shape roughly the size of a deck of cards. Oddly pretty, with an almost glowing faint light coming from it. But I had no idea what it was. It's pretty. What is it? I asked, looking at the two Cath. The way we Cath view what you call soul magic is different. For us, it is a way to pass memories and knowledge. So this is a learning stone where our elders explain how they use magic and show you by immersing you in the memory, in the actions. It should work for you, though it may be a bit disconcerting as we think differently from you. Carolyn can show you how to use it, and over time, you will unlock more lessons as you master the first. Esmir looked at me with inscrutable blue eyes. Please understand, there are lifetimes of lessons there, not just a session or two. You will find this something to learn from your entire life. I stared at the object in stunned surprise. Thank you so much, both of you. This is an unbelievable gift. Thank you. Petting Esmir and thanks didn't seem smart, so I bowed. I did pet Carolyn, scratching behind his ears as a thank you. Now, if the celebrations are over, I believe we have lessons to do? Bainural asked, looking at all of us. With laughter, we cleaned up, and Esmir left after talking to Sable in the corner of the clearing for a few minutes. We dove back into lessons, and before we left, we could all create mental shields that would protect casual mind reading. An archmage or merlin could force their way past our shields, but we would get better with practice. High with the presence, we stepped back in, tired but smiling more than I had in a while. I hadn't realized how much I enjoyed the time when no one was trying to kill me. Even though it was considered off-limits to attack someone when at home, I still stayed hyper-aware and nervous. Joe's phone went off with a rapid beeping as we stepped into the living room. She pulled it out and looked at it. Huh. Mommy sent me a bunch of text messages. Her fingers flipped open the messages, and I watched her pale. Joe? 
What's wrong? Sable asked as I felt like someone was clenching my heart in my chest. My parents, they're being sued for millions, and the person suing them is some company they never heard of. She lifted her head and looked at me. They'll lose everything. Chapter 42 All magic is science, and science is technology. The more you learn, the better you can use this skill set. Don't squander your abilities due to lack of knowledge. OMO Encouragement for More Education It took us until Friday to get all the details. The Guzmans were being sued about a car that had broken down after they worked on it three years ago. They'd even helped with the paperwork to prove the car had been a lemon, but now they were being taken to court for pain and suffering. The law firm was one of the best in the state, and they had lots of mages as clients. I shot all the information over to Alexin and asked, nicely, if he could see what he could find out. Otherwise, I doubled down and tried to learn everything. I kept the gift from Carolyn by my nightstand. I understood that now wasn't the time to use it. I needed to get my degree first. Then I could look and see what the other realms could teach me. But for now, I did everything I could to get my degree. Banyarl told us that Monday only I needed to come, as neither Sable nor Joe could learn what he felt it was time to teach me which meant I felt rushed as I hurried back from law Monday evening. The lesson that afternoon had shed a bit of light onto why our apartment was safe. There were crazy restrictions and consequences for anyone who hurt family members in an assassination, and about what disputes the government ignored between mages, though I couldn't figure out why hitting Joe at the market didn't count. Joe and Sable were there, The lines of worry on Joe's face didn't help my stress. Anything? I asked. No. Did Alexin get back to you? Joe stared at me, tugging on a braid. I shook my head, and she sighed. Finals are in two weeks. Then I can go see what I can do. The one thing I don't understand is how fast this is moving. From everyone I've talked to, civil lawsuits can take years. They want to go to court next week. I couldn't stop the bitterness that coated my words. Because they're using your parents to get to me. If they cause enough disruption, I'll fail a class or miss a final, and that is enough to ensure I won't graduate in time to meet the terms of the will. Ah. Joe sat silent for a long time, then looked up at me. Corey, I see with love. She stopped and cleared her throat, and I felt my heart stutter stop as I waited. If she wanted me to walk away, avoid the draft, to give it up, I would graduate and kick their fucking asses. Hoo-yah, Sable said quietly as she looked at me. The mix of emotions that went through me left me standing straighter and feeling even more weight resting on my shoulders. You got it. Joe gave one sharp nod and jerked herself up from the chair. I made you a burrito. Eat and go. Banyarl was insistent you learn this, and that means it must be important. I just took the food she handed me and wolfed it down, while Carolyn did the same with the meat she had set down for him. Five minutes later, with a bottle of water in my hand, I stepped through the door to his realm. It didn't even bug me anymore. Just felt normal to cross from my realm into his. Huh. Is this his realm? I never thought about it. I assumed I was in the spirit realm. Am I? That thought reminded me I really needed to learn telepathy also. So many things I needed to catch up on. Banyarl had promised to keep teaching me over the summer, so as soon as I had a few spare moments, I'd make a list of all the things I wanted to learn. Good eve, Corey. Are you ready? This is one of the more difficult things I need you to learn, but it will help protect you. I was more than willing to learn anything that would keep me safe, but keeping the other safe was even more important. Then why shouldn't Joe and Sable learn it? I need to keep them safe too. Unfortunately, this ability can only be learned by those with strong relativity skills. While I believe they are strong enough, 
They do not have access to this affinity. He'd used that word before, where we called them classes and branches. For him, they were affinities and spells. I still hadn't decided which one I liked better. Okay, so what are we doing? Carolian headed over to his favorite spot to watch us. You saw Tursain use this ability at your birthday party. We call it sidestepping, but Carolian tells me you refer to it as teleporting. I blinked at him, surprised. Teleporting was something you saw in the movies occasionally. The hero would use it, always a Merlin, to get to some place just as the bomb was counting down, but the price was always so high that he had almost nothing left to fight the bad guy or save the victim, depending on the story. So this is like for last ditch, I'll die otherwise sort of thing? Banyarl tilted his head at me. No, it is an easy mode of transportation. And in your situation, will prevent you from being exposed to those wishing to harm you. Easy mode? That didn't mesh with what I knew, but then movies were pretty much the only thing that mentioned teleportation. Even the spirit book hadn't said much more than the ability to move between places at great cost, but also almost instantaneous speed. Yes, most use it to travel between households, markets, or other known places. Traveling to your plane requires us to open a portal. Movement within the same realm never requires that if you have the strength. Granted, ripping the realm walls is more direct, but in the long scope of life, much more risky. That went against everything I knew, but that happened regularly with Banyarl. Sounds good to me. I managed, and it did, if not scary as all get out. It is easier to go to a place you've been before, but there are other options. For now, let's try going from one side of the clearing to the other. I rolled my eyes. How? Since I have never done this, and other than Tursane, I've never seen it done. She did it so fast, I didn't even register what she did. Banyarl clicked his beak together in what I could only regard as a thoughtful manner. Close your eyes and picture the other side of the clearing in your mind. That was so much easier said than done. It was all trees. But after opening and closing my eyes multiple times, I had an image in my head of a bark pattern that reminded me of the statue of Abraham Lincoln in the Capitol. He'd been responsible for ensuring mages in the United States couldn't be made slaves. It had been part of the Emancipation Proclamation. A few people had realized a mage as a slave would kill anyone to get free, and magic didn't seem to care about the color of your skin at all. Racism died quickly as you never knew who was a mage or who wasn't until the OMO took over in the 1900s. I have it. Excellent, he said though I tasted a bit of impatience in his tone. Now, tell your magic you want to be over there and step to it. I opened my eyes to glare at him. Just tell it I want to be over there? How else would it know where you wanted to be? His voice, oh so reasonable, to my annoyance. I hate fuzzy wuzzy stuff. Only the fact that he'd been right every time we'd listened kept me from sighing audibly, still didn't mean I had the slightest idea of what I needed to do. The image of the tree on the other side of the clearing, the bark pattern of Lincoln, with his hands on the arms of his chair hung in my mind. I closed my eyes to keep the image clear, and I asked, I'd like to be there. My thought was clear and direct, and I stepped to the side. I thought for a second that I felt something, a wisp, an agreement, but it was so fast I couldn't specify what was asked or what was agreed to. A memory, about when the cost is so small you don't notice the asking came to mind as I opened my eyes. On the other side of the clearing. Huh? I looked around. 
the idea that it would work had never really crossed my mind. No, Buck! I looked at him, still trying to get my brain wrapped around what had just happened. I stepped and then was across the clearing. The offering. What offering had I made? I thought furiously to recall that tiny ask of an offering and my instant acceptance. I did that on less than a thousand molecules? Why didn't it wait for me to agree? Banyarol arched a brow at me. You did, by the very asking. Magic usually only asks if you are very new or the cost is very great. This was so little, the request was assumed to be the agreement. Now step again, he ordered, his tone unforgiving. I wanted to stand there and think for at least an hour, but I looked at the other side of the clearing, the patch of grass that still had my footprints on it, and I asked and stepped. This time with my eyes open, I saw reality swirl around me, but it was so fast that by the time I recognized colors, it had stopped and trees hung in front of me. No way. It can't be that easy. It just can't. It takes Merlin's huge offerings to move from place to place. Why is that so easy? Is it like that for everyone or am I just special? My hands on my hips. I glared at him, confusion and hope rifling through my brain. As I have never witnessed one of your mages teleport, I cannot provide insight, but I can make a supposition. I gave him a look, and I swear Carolyn laughed at me, but I ignored him. Banyarol ruffled his feathers, and I swear he was laughing too. Why did everyone seem to find me so hilarious? I suspect they tried to make a tunnel between two points. Rather than stepping through magic to reach it, they force a hole in magic, in reality itself. That price is much higher than asking magic to help. Now, I will say magic has been known to say no, but in my experience, there is always a reason, and it is better to accept than to force. Huh, I said, processing. What about going somewhere I haven't seen? I mean, if I can only go to places I've been, it is pretty limited. Yes and no. You have the ability to mind read, though you haven't learned to utilize it yet. Otherwise, you would rarely speak out loud to me. I ignored that. There was only so many hours in the day, and as it was, I felt like I was falling further and further behind with what I needed to know. I'd figured out why they wanted you for four years. It gave you time to learn all the magic at a pace that didn't threaten to burn you out. I'll learn it for Carolyn if nothing else, but so far everything else has been far more important. And since Joe and Sable can't talk back to me, it isn't as much use right now. Agreed, but when you learn it, you can reach in and take images out of people's minds. Places. It needs to either be someplace very familiar, like home or work, or a place that made a great impact on them. That impact depends on the person. For now, I will send you an image. My mind filled with the sight of a small pool in the middle of a glade, the crystal blue of the water like a photoshopped picture of the Caribbean. A waterfall splashed into the pool, creating rainbows, while green trees surrounded it. It all but gleamed with life and peace. You want me to go there? You have the image. Kellyan will be waiting for you. I turned to glance at the cat. No, Kath. But he wasn't there. Can he sidestep too? For some reason, I felt outraged at that idea, though I'm not sure why. No. But all Kath can open doors between realms and places. It is not as elegant as sidestepping and much more noticeable. Though Kath managed to do it almost unnoticed, it is their nature. I thought about it, 
There had been a slight twinge as the image filled my mind, but I'd spent so much of my life ignoring them that those small, sharp spikes of pain were barely noticeable, and I had seen bigger rips, like the doorway we walked through to this clearing, were sharper than the little ones that Indira made, so Carolyn making them small enough and fast enough that I didn't notice came as no surprise. I took a deep breath. The image again, please. It filled my head and I locked on it, trying to make it as real as I could. I whispered my ask, take me there, please. And I sidestepped. The sound of water splashing, the calls of birds, the rustle of leaves hit me before I even opened my eyes. The wet smell and the taste of what I could only describe as jungle air swamped my senses. I took in the area. It was even more vibrant than in the memory, the colors different, but it still ranked as one of the most beautiful places I'd ever been. I did it. My voice hushed in the beauty of this place. Of course you did. My queen would not be anything less than spectacular. I turned to see Carolyn batting at something in the water. What are you doing? Fishing. It has been a while since I had the chance to try and catch my own. That sent a wave of guilt through me, but before I could dwell on it too much, I felt a strange implosion of air next to me and turned to see Banyarl walking towards me. Indeed, Kellyan does seem to choose his queens wisely. You will find as you travel to more places this will let you move with great freedom. Please... Test it carefully in your realm, though. He paused to look at me. I have never sidestepped on Earth, and the way magic works might be different. So be careful with your practice. Those comments dampened my joy, and I sighed. With my luck, something would go very wrong, and I'd end up on top of a building or underwater or something. I shook my head as he had me practice getting an image from him and stepping there. While the excitement of sidestepping had faded, the information was important, and each time I reached into his mind or Carolyn provided an image, I learned. Magic always required a price, but when you spoke to it and asked, the price was never as high as when you demanded or forced. I think that was the biggest and most important lesson he was trying to teach me. Chapter 43 Contrary to popular opinion, chaos mages do not make up the majority of mages put to death for crimes. From statistics, the breakdown of mages convicted and executed for crimes matches a standard distribution of mages within the population, in other words, there is no evidence for Chaos Mages to be any more likely to commit crimes than any other mage group. OMO Website Finals were next week, and our stress levels were ramped. I had to get my paper done for a class I was challenging. The professor, tired of arguing with me, said if I did a 30-page research paper, he'd pass me with whatever grade I got as long as it was a C or higher. I had no issue doing a 30-page paper on evolutionary biology and why we have the functionality we do. Just watching Carolyn with his opposable thumbs gave me enough to start. I figured I'd also point out some of the negative aspects of evolution, such as narrow pelvic regions and constantly being fertile. I knew I could pass. We'd talked about this enough in my biology classes at the community college. Besides, I enjoyed researching. With the time bubble up, I was heading to the library when an explosion knocked me forward. I lay on the ground, stunned, but held the bubble. I usually only did my bubbles for about 30 seconds, but I hadn't been paying much attention this morning and took a minute bubble. That meant I was 60 seconds out of sync with reality, which was the only reason the explosion didn't kill me. I looked at the other students that were hurt and dropped the bubble, instead creating a layer of earth around me as I rushed to help. Carolyn, where is he? 
or they, I yelled out. I really needed to step up when I learned telepathy as I dove for the first student. Luckily, it looked like they had expected me to still be at 30 seconds, which chilled me to the bone. They had timed me, thinking I'd be at that spot 30 seconds from where they saw me, but I was past it when it blew. The kids behind me weren't. Teleported, but I have their scent. It is familiar. I didn't respond to that, but focused on the three students. No one died or was seriously hurt, but I growled with frustration at still not being able to seal wounds. By the time campus security showed up, so had administration, the police, and Indira. You okay, Corey? She knelt next to me as I looked at the kids being patched up, broken arm, cuts and bruises, and at least one possible concussion. And all of that was only because most people kept away from me. My reputation preceded me. No, this can't continue. Someone's going to get killed. I said, my voice bleak as I looked at the students hurt because of me. Guilt weighed down on me. Maybe I should just quit and walk away. Could I run to the spirit realm? That is your opinion. A voice I didn't know said from above me. I jerked my head up to look at the woman standing over me. Her arms were crossed as she glared at me. The fire mage tattoo all but sparked in this light, the gemstones in it creating their own glow. I was sure she'd burn a hole through me with her eyes if she could. The tattoo and her long, thin, white dreads against brown, tan skin told me this was Archmage Melinda Kilton, president of GA Match Tech. Melinda? Indira stood to look at her. We talked about this. You cannot hold her responsible for things she did not do. What? They'd been talking about me? Oh, this wasn't good. Making sure the thin earthen shield was diamond hard, literally, I rose and looked at the woman. Mrs. Kilton, you've been talking about me? She waved her hand dismissively as she looked at the damage. Your mentors have been holding up their side of the contract. Otherwise, I would have expelled you the day Josepha Guzman was shot. That surprised me, but maybe it shouldn't have. They did try to protect me. The issue was what they thought was a valid means of protection, and what I did deferred greatly. I see. I nodded at Indira. Thanks, but why didn't you tell me? She shrugged. If we could make the problem go away without any fanfare, everyone was happy. You, the government, others. I could read the unspoken words that their handlers were happier, too. It served as a reminder to try very hard not to serve multiple masters. I didn't need the stress. You do realize there is little I can do about this? I offered to the president of the college. Melinda Kilton wasn't known for being an easy woman or a pushover. I know there is little that has been done about this, but I am telling you now, one more incident, just one, and you're expelled. The government, the societies, and anyone else that has an issue with it can kiss my ass. Fix this. I don't care who does it, but if anything else happens, I'll go with the nuclear resort and get rid of all of you. Josepha Guzman, Sable Lancet, Indira Humbert, all of you will be gone from my campus. She scanned both of us with light gray eyes, and I had to fight not to shiver at the glacial anger there. With a sharp nod, she pivoted and headed towards the security personnel, who as a group paled and stood up straighter with her approach. Indira sighed, and I looked at her. She had circles under her eyes, and her clothes were wrinkled. I didn't think I'd ever seen her looking anything other than elegant. Japan is very adamant that you are not the inheritor of the estate, and it has become a point of honor for them. The government is just as firm saying you are, and that research will stay with the U.S. If something doesn't break soon, we may end up at a war. Whatever bravado I had felt vaporized at that. What? War? Between U.S. and Japan over me? Indira nodded, looking like she'd been fighting monsters. There's no give on either side. 
The fact that you've figured out how to protect yourself is making people on all sides both desperate and arrogant. I'm worried they might break the rules. What rules? My voice squeaked, and I could feel my body tightening up in anticipation of a blow. Emotional though it might be. The ones that preclude attacking dwellings. The consequences are death for you and your family if you destroy a building in an effort to get to a target. But there are more than enough people who have no living family, and the price is getting high enough that some might not care if their parents or siblings are killed. It's why you've been safe in classes and at home. But if Japan lifts that structure... She trailed off and shrugged again. There's nothing sensual in it. Just exhaustion. I just looked at her, shocked. No idea how to respond to this. It answered my one question, but the thought they might break this rule made my blood run cold, and I started flipping through options in my mind. I could live in the spirit realm, only come out for classes, but if they were willing to kill any classmates? My thoughts broke off. It didn't matter. I was done. There was no way I could let people die for me. I'll quit, I blurted, ready to just run. Even becoming a ronin didn't sound as bad anymore. Not yet. Give us over the summer. It should quiet down. If we can't get it done by the 4th of July holiday, Alexin and I will support whatever you want to do. Up to and including going ronin. The amount of defeat in her voice surprised me. Okay, I looked down at the devastation and fought the desire to run. I'm headed to the library. You have my number if you need me. She just nodded at me and walked towards the police. I wasn't really involved since there was no proof the bomb had been left for me, though I was curious about what it had been. Bomb was what I called it because it exploded, but I had no real idea how they tried to kill me. Feeling like the worst sort of selfish person, I dragged myself to the library, the time shield up for a full five minutes this time. Once there, I found a back table and dropped the shield. I needed to focus. The beep beep of my phone told me I had a text message. Worried, I pulled it up and saw a message from Alexant. Hope, sweet and deadly, rushed through me as I read the message. Have the information. Is through a dozen shell companies and is backed by Japan. They're trying to pressure you out via Joe's family, talking to government now. They will represent the Guzmans, but there isn't much else to be done now. We'll share if find out more. I sat there looking at my phone, fighting not to start bawling or just give it all up and run away. Caroline was on the table, butting my hand, but he didn't speak. What could he say? Corey, you okay? I sniffed, trying to keep back tears, and saw Charles standing there looking at me, a frown on his face. Erichina jumped off his shoulder and skittered over to Carolian. Then, in an oddly hesitant motion, one of her twelve legs patted the back of my hand. That teeny act of kindness, from a creature that most people would have run from screaming, broke my walls, and for the second time in a month, I started to cry. This time, it wasn't as much sorrow and fear, more frustration and rage, and the knowledge that there wasn't anything I could do about any of it. A handkerchief appeared in front of me. Here, use this. It's clean, I promise, Charles said. Gratefully, I took it and tried to mop up my tears and my nose. Handkerchief? I asked as I managed to get my rage under control. Granddad was a stickler about it, and have to admit, it's been nice during allergy season. Also, it can go through the wash and lick tissues. Getting pieces of white paper everywhere is a pain. That brought an unexpected laugh. <laughs> Thanks. What's wrong? You don't look like the type to be crying because someone is picking on you. He set his book down and looked at me. He seemed curious and more like trying to solve a puzzle than filled with empathy. Long story, I said, still mopping at my eyes and trying to control my shaking. 
I've got time. Might help to talk it out to someone not involved in your life. He settled into his chair while Erichina stroked my hand and Caroline's paw at the same time. He'd curled up on the table, his head resting on my arm, looking up at me. I took the hand he wasn't trapping and petted him. Your loss. I told him everything. The double Merlin, the inheritance, the various people trying to kill or control me. It just all came spilling out. The only thing I kept secret was Banyarl and Carolian's machinations. By the time I was done, I was panting with anger and frustration. Charles leaned back and looked at me. I realized he had light brown eyes, almost amber, and in the funky library light, they almost glowed. Basically, you're fucked or everyone you love is fucked. Nothing in between. I grimaced a bit but nodded. Pretty much sad when the idea of going Ronin is sounding attractive. He snorted out a laugh. (laughs) There's where we are different. I looked at him skeptically. Then what about Daniela? She's a bitch, and if she causes me too much trouble, I'll deal with her at that point. So far, she's a pain in my side. She isn't directly impacting me. He replied, his voice level, but I heard the unspoken yet there. Part of me wondered if that should be a warning to me, but given the trouble Daniela had given me, I figured she'd earned anything that happened. Charles smirked at me, and I gave him another long look. Pattern mage. Somehow, I knew he was a powerful archmage, close to a Merlin. So, where are we different? I asked, now curious. If nothing else, talking to him had distracted me enough to get the tears and frustration under control. I still simmered with anger. I plan on dealing with my issue. Bullies are all the same. Until you hit them very hard, where it hurts, they keep thinking they can intimidate you. Once you hit them hard enough and make it clear that if they do it again, you'll come back five times harder, they back off. Everything snapped into focus. You're giving Daniela enough rope to hang herself, but you plan on dealing with her one way or another. He didn't answer, just smirked. The real question is, how do you deal with the entities causing you grief? You sure it is, Japan? Everyone seems to think so. I don't have any actual proof. I stopped as Erichina triple-tapped my hand, and I looked at her. Yes? She chittered and looked at Carolian, and then Charles. Huh. She says the patterns align, and all the factors lead back to Japan. Why didn't she just tell me that? Those of order follow the proprieties very closely. I am Kath. I choose what is proper. Carolian licked the back of my hand and gave a superior gaze at Erichina. He just spoke to me. Charles muttered, staring at Carolian. He didn't seem surprised, more as if another bit of information had been added. Yeah, Apparently that note about familiars only talking to their mages had never met a calf. Charles flinched and closed his eyes. And Erichina is ripping him a new one. Okay, so she's almost never wrong. We match on pattern. It's my strength. It will make me an excellent programmer. With earth and air as minor, I'll stay with my computers. I like them better than most people. He shook his head. But what it means is, yes, Japan is the source of your issues. Probably they're my jutsushi. I sighed. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds like the guy who would get the stuff if I fail. There you have it. Now your choice is to continue work under the radar or shove it in their face and make them stop. How? I almost shouted the question, and a few people stared at me. I hunched my head between my shoulders. How by Merlin do I do that? Not a clue, but I've never found a bully that goes away by ignoring them. Sorry. I sighed, and we both fell to our homework and papers, but his words kept swirling in my head.
Chapter 44 Are you a non-organic mage looking for a career in industrial engineering? Apply now with your degree and gain access to one of the fastest grown careers in developing new transportation options. Your ability to work with elements will make you a star in many industries. Mage Hent Hunter Posting The weekend disappeared, and we'd let Bainural know we'd be busy with our finals all week, so we were taking this week off from lessons. Next week, Esmir would try to heal Sable's pancreas, and Joe planned on going back to work at the garage all summer, assuming it still existed. The lawsuit was still being pursued, and there wasn't anything we could do but worry. Our first final was bright and early Monday morning. I'd been practicing, so I included Joe in my time bubble. To my delight, it worked, though I couldn't get it less than five minutes out of time. The shutter zipped through me as we resynced. That felt super odd, Joe said as her body paid the price. Yeah, but it makes for safe travel. Easy price to pay. We watched others go into the classroom, including two people I didn't know, both older than any of the students, in their thirties at least. Huh, wonder who those two are, Joe said as we headed in. No clue, but I'm sure we'll find out. Come on, she said she's doing this in alphabetical order, which means you're closer to the beginning, and I'm smack in the middle. I grabbed my bag, and Carolyn streaked in to race up to our preferred seats. Indira said we could leave when we were done, but not being there when your name was called would drop you a full grade on your final. Besides, I wanted to see what other students' final projects were. Lots of companies would ask how comfortable you were using your pails as well as your strong, so for those who wanted to get into some competitive fields, this was great practice. Our final was to research a spell from a list of about 20 and figure out how to do it with the minimal amount of molecules, and then use science to explain how you did it and why. Personally, I was betting on many of them repeating the fire and water example, but I had hoped for more interesting examples. We settled down as Indira stepped forward and started to speak. Welcome to finals day. I hope you are prepared to wow and impress me, but you also better know your basic science you can't prove you have a good grasp of the scientific concepts behind your actions, it will hurt your grade. She huffed a sigh and glared at the two men next to her. The administration has insisted that I have two assistants to help me this year, as the last few years this process has taken the full day. They have assured me they are both highly qualified. She rolled her eyes, and the entire class snickered, and I admired the way she both made clear she wasn't impressed and lowered their standings at the same time. Everyone would want her as their tester now. I fought back a wave of paranoia as the two men stepped forward and bowed slightly, never taking their eyes off the students in the room. I could see they were mages, but from here I couldn't tell what class. I glanced at Indira, gagging, but she just seemed annoyed, not worried. Still, two strangers. I frowned a bit as Carolyn twitched. He usually slept during this class, finding Indira too pedantic for his tastes. Something wrong? I whispered. Cho glanced at me, her brows drawing together. No, maybe I'm twitchy, but there is no reason... He heaved a mental sigh and sank his head down, but his eyes didn't close, and his tail kept twitching. Then let's start. Amy Ebelson, Indira said, and they did, each of them taking one student and doing three at a time. I had my experiment ready. I wasn't about to show how easy fire was, even though I should have been null in that. I stuck with something a bit more explainable. Non-organic was my only pale in spirit, and it was also one of the few tangible branches which made any experiment easier. While I'd been tempted to do the extract mineral that Indira had done, that seemed too much like the easy way out for me, so I decided to work with electricity. It was fun, and I had almost gotten good enough to have electricity bounce back and forth between my hands. 
though if I didn't concentrate, I'd burn myself. It had the advantage of being very showy. In theory, I should be able to stun people or even make it look like I was calling lightning, though from terrestrial-based sources, not the sky. We were sitting there quietly watching everyone when Joe's name was called by one of the men. She left her stuff, except for the prop she needed. Air was one of her weaker areas, but we'd been working with Banyar all about that. In theory, anyone not strong couldn't be able to actually use fly. We'd thought about doing a lightning strike, but being indoors killed that idea. I leaned forward to watch her demonstration. She'd taken all her books down with her and set them on the floor between her and the examiner. I knew what she was doing was asking air to wiggle underneath the books and push them up, then drop them. Much easier than trying to hold them in the air, at least for this part. Air thought this was great fun. Joe and Sable had practice in a park one evening, and she said that Air acted like a kid playing with them. Only little offerings were required. Flying took more, but Air apparently thought having hair flying around was great. It made me wonder if Air would enjoy capes even more. What Joe was telling the examiners, however, was how she identified the oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon molecules under and to the side of the books, and pulled them under the books, then used the laws of attraction to pull more and more in until the books rose up. She phrased everything in such a way, including what she was offering, that it was the truth. Lying was too risky, as you never knew who was paying attention and might start asking questions. Amazing how, I thought if I, and theory is, could mislead almost anyone. The final did make you think of how things worked and how magic worked with them. And if you were creative, you could see many things you could do outside the prescribed spells. But I'd always seen more than a few students who'd gotten hurt because they were so specific in what they were trying to do, they did it wrong. Personally, I suspected half the reason for the class was for people to get hurt doing things and back off, to only do exactly what the texts and resource books listed. I grinned as she stopped speaking, took a deep breath, and floated up a few inches. Even knowing what she'd explained, I loved the look of surprise on the inspector's faces. Indira's double take, causing her to miss her own student's action, both amused me and told me she was paying very close attention to Joe and by extension, me. Joe had an enormous grin as she bounded up the stairs and slouched in the chair. He asked if I was a Merlin or actually strong in air. Her grin so big, I expected her face to be sore. Showed him my tat and headed back up. Pretty sure I aced it. No questions about the how? Nope. Heck, pretty sure they didn't care. They kept glancing around at each other was almost insulted except for the look on their face at the end, and I only had to offer about a quarter inch from a few strands. Now, I totally want to go flying. And get shot by scared people? I don't think so. Let's plan a vacation someday. The four of us, remote island, and you can fly over the water. Sable can make sure you don't break anything when you fall and hit it. Ooh, that sounds fun. Wonder if I could get good enough I could take you and Sable flying. I gave her a considering look. That might be fun. Over water. Water. Ick. Takes forever to keep your fur back to proper shape. Caroline's mutter had us both giggling a bit. The class got smaller, and I was actually sad I wouldn't get to see Charles do his. As with the last name of Wayne Scott, he was one of the last people. A commotion outside pulled my attention to the door, and I saw Charles glaring at Daniela as she sneered at him. She made a gesture that was anything but polite and stomped away. If I remember correctly, not that I paid that much attention to her, she had a class in the room next to us. Scowling, he moved up the stairs away from his normal seat. That woman is going to regret her choices someday, and I can't wait for the day. Joe laughed, 
<laughs> Sable will join you. She is a piece of work. Charles growled and threw himself into one of the seats in the row below us. Erichina scuttled down his arm, patting mine as she went by, then jumped on Carolyn. I could hear low chittering as her legs worked up and down his body. He groaned a bit and stretched out further. Is it just me, or does that look a bit indecent? Joe asked, watching the two familiars. Yes, Charles and I replied at the same time. He continued with a soft smile. But I'm also kind of jealous. Looks like it feels good. But she isn't strong enough to do that to me. His voice had a touch of wistfulness to it. Don't bet on it. Ask her. What I've been finding out about our familiars is we shouldn't assume they have the same limitations and abilities as their mundane counterparts. I watched them for a minute more, then shifted my attention back to the front. Some of the students' presentations went haywire badly. One of them had Indira shouting for assistance out the door when his fire experiment, instead of setting the paper on fire, exploded the sealed can of Coke he'd had in his cargo shorts pocket. From his screams and Indira's annoyance, I figured either the liquid had been scalding or aluminum fragments had embedded in flesh. An EMT came running in with a partner, and I crossed my legs and didn't move. This wasn't something I needed to get involved with. I couldn't afford it right now. Besides, he was hurt, not dying. Me sitting this one out wouldn't have any consequences either way. Instead, I watched them treat him. From what I could see, second-degree burns and some minor cuts. Not anything worth the level of screaming he'd done. This delayed us for a bit, and I was starting to wish I'd brought a lunch. My stomach agreed with that. They were at the K's, so hopefully I'd be called shortly. I watched a girl do a variation of what I had planned on doing, but where I could get actual visible electricity between my hands, she barely had a spark created and lost a good two inches of hair. Joe's phone pinged, a sound that told me it was stinky. It sounded like a long, loud fart. A few people glanced at us, and I snickered as Joe pulled out her phone. Her body language changed as I watched, growing tense and tight. That made me still and focus on her. I need to call him. I'll be right back. She was already halfway down the stairs as she said the last words. My own fear grew, and my imagination ran wild. Assassins had killed them. Marisol hurt. The lawyers got them. Each situation was worse and I felt myself starting to generate a Murphy's curse. I tamped it down and focused on breathing. Joe burst into the classroom and bounded up the stairs. Various people shouted at her, but she focused on me. I have to go. Someone blew up the garage. It's in flames. Mom is on the way there. So far, it doesn't look like anyone was hurt. My heart spasmed as I jumped to my feet, grabbing my stuff. I'm coming too. She didn't say anything as we sprinted down the stairs. Indira, I have to go. I'll make it up or dock me. I don't care. Corey, what in the world? I heard her yell as I reached the bottom of the stairs. By this time, the entire room had paused and was looking at us. Joe hit the doors and held them open. Emergency! Have to go! Explain later! When I turned to race through the doors, a gust of wind slammed into me, and knocked me down from the door and to the floor. I saw Joe get flung backwards into the hall, and the door slammed shut, cutting us off. You aren't going anywhere, Corey Monroe. Your death has been paid for. Someone said with an accent that sounded Asian. I looked up, my back against the classroom wall, and my ass on the floor as one of the guest instructors stalked towards me and the other held off Indira. Die now! Ah, oh, crap. Chapter 45 The United States is considered a very safe country. Crime is low, and mages are well treated. Other countries are not as lucky. While no country is stupid enough to treat mages as second-class citizens... Different governments enact strict controls, 
but always with a carrot attached. History of Magic On instinct, I pulled Lady Luck over me and grabbed for an earth shield, but there wasn't enough floating dust and random dirt. They had a very good janitorial staff, to my detriment. I felt his magic reach towards me, which was freaky as all get out. I glanced at the tattoos of the first mage, air, pattern, and transform pale. The second was a Merlin, water, and psychic. That wasn't good. Bane Jarl had been teaching us to defend ourselves against attacks, but water was one of the deadlier ones, and hard to defend against. Line of sight. Remember, most mages can only attack line of sight. Taking a risk, I focused on the other side of the room behind Indira and sent a plea to magic. I rolled and ended up rolling into the wall on the other side of the classroom. I jumped to my feet and looked around, trying to think. On most other occasions, people had tried to kill me. I'd hidden from them, and people had come running. I shied away from remembering the shooter and Joe. This time, people were simply trying to run out the door, but were blocked by the two mages. Before I could orient myself, a chair came flying at me, and I ducked with half a scream. The chair slammed against the wall behind me, shattering bits hitting my back. Shield! Carolian ordered in my head. His worry and franticness hit me hard. I started to panic as I tried to figure out what to use to shield. I'd had time to think when Joe was shot. I needed time to figure out what to do. A bolt of fire came flying at me, and I had to dive away, scrambling. Everyone was screaming, and I could barely think. I saw Indira out of the corner of my eye, fire in her hands. And the second I saw her, it looked like she was throwing a soap bubble at the attacker nearest her, but I had to scramble away before I could figure out what she was doing. Corey! Carolyn called again, but other students were throwing their abilities around and using fire and chairs as shields. The room filled with the sounds of things breaking and people yelling. I turned, trying to locate Carolyn. In the chaos, I couldn't focus on anything. Every flash of red caught my attention, but it was never him. I breathed in fast, short pants as I kept moving. One mage still fought with Indira, but the other headed in my direction. Where is he? Where is Joe? Are they okay? The doors flew open and students rushed out. I strained to see Joe, but all I could catch were glimpses of heads and figures. A flash of blue and white grabbed my attention, and I caught a glimpse of Arachina racing up Charles' shirt. He looked as pale and freaked out as I felt, but he had his bag and was headed towards the door. Delay. I need to get them out. But then what? I had no answer to that. Before I could dwell on it, a ball of fire came spinning towards me, huge and white hot. With a whispered plea, I sidestepped to my seat at the top of the room. I wasn't fast enough, and the flames seared the side of my left arm. A scream ripped out of me and I stumbled. Pain lashed through my body and brought me to my knees. Tears filled my eyes as I tried to see. I needed to know where they were. Glory! Carolyn, so near, but with all the jumble and the blurriness, the only thing I could see were the flames coming towards me, the white, yellow, and orange promising my death. I ran my hand up my arm, sobbing in renewed pain. I lifted up my hand, blood and ichor coating it. Protect! I begged, reaching for earth, pulling. I just wanted to be safe but I also wanted those two to pay for what they had done. I wanted Joe safe. I wanted Carolyn safe. I even wanted all the other students and Indira to be safe. I wanted this to be done. I wanted to make them pay. All of those thoughts, that need, were shoved into that one word and the offering of blood, skin, and ichor. The yes, the vaporization of what I offered, and the building collapsing all happened in the same second. Noise surrounded me with a physical power. I fell back, hitting the wall. A new scream of pain slipped past my lips, as if called by my cry of pain, a spear of earth, mostly concrete and tile, 
burst up from the floor less than an inch from me, blocking the incoming fireball. The flames dispersed across it, not even singeing my hair. The walls of the building crumpled down in perfect unison and created an arena around us. Within the remains of the classroom stood Carolyn and me, the two mages, and the slumped form of Indira. Dust filled the air, and a strange silence settled as I took in the new area. Brick, concrete, and wood created walls around us. The doors were blocked, and the ceiling looked precarious. The building hadn't been huge, two stories holding four classrooms on each floor. Now, it felt like a giant had stepped on it, crushing it down. The second story had crumpled, and I could see through gaps in the ceiling to the next floor. No one looked back at me, and I counted that as a minor miracle. I didn't want to think about how many people I'd hurt, or even killed by my actions. Why are you doing this? I cried out. I pivoted, looking around, but realized no one else was in here, and the other mage was a Merlin. I couldn't see what exactly, too far away, but Indira's body laying on the floor suggested psychic. Money. Kill one little girl and we receive a lot of money. Seems like a straightforward job, but you've proved challenging. Thank you. The Merlin replied, his voice calm, amused almost. I must say, I'm impressed that anyone as uneducated as you could pull this off. He waved his hand around the arena we found ourselves in. I swallowed hard. All of this, just for money? No, for a lot of money, and a favor from the Emperor of Japan and his pet mage. How could we turn that down? He started walking towards me, and I grabbed the earth under his feet and pulled, not asking, just pulling. It slid, and he fell backwards. Cute trick, but my brother has a solution to that. Japan? The Emperor? The Majutsushi is involved in this? Before I could follow that path any further, he waved at the man to his right and a moment later floated up into the air about a foot off the ground. The man, his brother, grunted, and I felt a gust of air head my direction. The Merlin floated with the breeze, coming right at me, though slowly. Well, crap. I spun through the stuff we'd learned, trying to think, It had been basic stuff, elements, which I barely had. How to talk to magic, working with my psychic skills to pull out memories, read the truth from people, and time. Moving outside of time did no good. It just let them kill everyone without me stopping them, and I didn't think putting us in a time bubble would do anything. Even if I stopped time, I had to restart it at some point, so nothing would change. All this magic and power, and I didn't know how to do anything. Granted, I never really thought I'd be in a fight for my life either. Stupid in hindsight. My experiment. I pulled on the electricity I'd planned on playing with, gladly offering a full inch of hair, and I threw a lightning bolt at him. The bright white snapping and cracking bolt ripped from my hands and zigzagged through the air, leaving the sharp smell of ozone behind. It streaked in his direction, then jerked to one side and slammed into the earth spear that had saved my life earlier. Impressive, but it takes years to learn how to control lightning, and you don't have years. I tried again, and again, being reckless with the blood still oozing down my arm, but the lightning never went to the target I was aiming at, and he just laughed, moving up the stadium seating towards me. Carolyn, go! Get out of here! Go home! I urged as my eyes locked on the man approaching. I had no clue how to protect myself from a water attack. I knew our bodies were mostly water, and obviously he didn't care about killing with magic. Never, my queen! Carolyn bristled with fierceness as he said that, and my heart threatened to snap what little control I had. I needed to do something. He crouched on crushed desks about six feet away, his tail lashing, ears laid back so close to his head that he looked like a snake about to strike. 
The movement of the earth and the building collapsing around us had created dust everywhere. I pulled it into a shield as the Merlin attacked. I felt him try to pull the water from my body, and I put the shield between us. It hit my earthen shield, dry and dusty, and bounced back, refusing to cross what I had created. That surprised me, but I sure wasn't complaining. Interesting. No worries. If I touch you, you can't stop me from killing you. But meanwhile, Tanaka, kill the woman. We don't need witnesses. He didn't look away from me as he spoke in a loud voice, just moved closer. He was only ten feet away. No! I ground out and created a wall around Indira, the blood seeping from my burns a constant offering. I struggled to stay standing as the pain lashed at me. Every offering exacerbated the burn, and burns hurt. But if I gave in, I'd be dead. You are full of surprises, but not an issue. He lifted his chin in an odd, jerking manner. Pull out all the air in that enclosure. That will eliminate any problem. I swallowed as his brother nodded and concentrated. A puff of dust blew out of the air created, and I had no doubt she was now choking, trying to breathe on nothing. Now for the cat. Can't have any witnesses, after all. And we know how intelligent familiars are. A ball of flame went whistling towards Carolyn. No! I screamed out the words and lunged, instinct taking over, trying to block the deadly fireball with my body. A rip opened before the ball, and it disappeared into it. I fell to my knees, gouging them on the torn stone, more blood on the outside of my body. My queen, I am not that easy to kill. My knees were screaming, but all I could do was shake in relief and anger at the voice in my head. Charles' words of just a few hours ago rumbled through my head. Could I? Did I dare? Better question. Do I have anything to lose? If I don't, I'm dead anyhow. My legs shook as I stood. This needs to end. My voice quavered as I said it, staring at the man sneering at me not three feet away. Yes, it does. You were worthy prey. He said, condescension in his voice. It won't hurt much. His arm reached towards me. No, it won't. I grabbed his arm and shoved my mind into his, looking for the image of the orders, the place that he would return to when I was dead. He shrieked as I was ruthless. I didn't care if it hurt. I didn't care if it killed him. He had just tried to kill my familiar and my mentor and because of him, I might have killed my best friend. I grabbed the image. Take me there. Chapter 46 It is a truism that magic costs, and more than one mage has squandered their life reaching for things outside of their grasp. Be smart, learn well, and never reach for things outside your knowledge. It might cost you everything. OMO Reminder The thought rippled into magic. I paid the too small price and stepped to the side. Reality shivered. I spent ten seconds or eternity in between. Then I stood in a large room, the man still attached to me. I felt a portal open. Then Carolyn was at my feet, sitting regally his ruby fur brilliant in the subtle hues. I slammed my electricity into the assassin as he fought me, and he convulsed, then slumped, unconscious. I dropped him to the floor and looked around. The room had a few people in it, all Asian, Japanese, I assumed. People were screaming, staring at me and pointing. I pulled down more electricity and created a halo around myself, trying to appear impressive, Fake it till you make it. I have nothing to lose. I channeled Joe at her fiercest, when she appeared like she didn't give a damn and no one could stop her. I needed that right now. With a grunt, I pushed the unconscious Merlin at my feet away from me 
and stood up straighter. I moved my eyes over the room, inspecting every detail. I hadn't taken the time to inspect the memory of the location, and for a place the emperor was supposed to be, it seemed almost plain. It had a bamboo floor, white walls with paintings of cherry trees on them. At the end of the room sat an elegant, gigantic desk. It had to be at least eight feet long and gleamed a beautiful golden red. Bookshelves lined the walls behind the desk, which had a huge computer monitor sitting on it. But where my eyes rested at the end of the room, there were two men, both dressed suits that fit them perfectly. One had touches of silver at his temple, while the other looked like a warrior about to attack me. A stream of Japanese came at me, and I had no idea what it meant. From the corner of my eye, I saw the other people in the room streaming out an opening where they had moved the wall, and I saw more people running towards us, people with guns, and more than one had a mage tattoo on his face. I want the emperor, Tamahito Takamado, and the Majutsushi Hisahito Yamato, I said, projecting my voice as loud as I could. I knew I mangled the pronunciation, but from the way the two men stiffened, I figured they understood me. People were getting closer. I didn't have time for this crap. Time! Reaching, I created the biggest bubble I'd ever managed, and the longest. The bubble encased me, the Merlin at my feet, and the two men at the other end of the room. It stretched out like a soap bubble between me and the men. I set it for an hour, so we were out of sync with time for a huge amount. Coming back in would suck, but better than allowing the onrushing guards to get to me first. I was tired of fighting. I wanted this over. Still channeling Joe, I stalked forward, aware of the blood soaking the knees of my jeans, running down my arm and dripping on the pristine golden floor. Carolyn paced beside me, his tail lashing back and forth. Another string of angry Japanese as I got close enough to get a good look at both of them. The Merlin stood to the side, the three tattoos visible on his face. The other man was rigid, with a frontry if I had to guess. Both were in their mid-thirties to early fifties. I didn't know enough to guess better. The Merlin had a sharper nose and fuller lips than the Emperor, but the big difference was his long black hair compared to the trim cut the other man had. I want you to stop this, or I'll stop it now. Japanese and glaring. Enough. I know damn well you understand English. Talk to me, or I'll bring this place down around our heads. They both crossed their arms and sneered at me. Fine. If they wanted to play it that way... I offered up more blood to the earth and pulled. The ground rocked. The bookcases caught in my bubble fell with a crash of fine china, snapping of wood, and the clatter of metal. I knew in an hour the rest of the place would shake like a 5.0 earthquake had hit it. I can do this until your palace is in rubble. I'll level it to the ground. The Merlin sneered and looked at me. I could tell he was about to attack so I hid first. I used the same trick I had with the shooter and reached out, grabbing his soul and pulling it out of his body. But this time, I could sense the tether, and before it snapped, I released it and felt him slam back into his body. Nausea bubbled in the back of my throat, but I pushed it down. The Merlin, Hisahito Yamato, slammed back against the wall, pale and gasping, hand clawing at his heart, for the first time, there was a look of fear and maybe respect in his gaze. He pushed himself away from the wall, a trickle of blood tracing from his left nostril. Are we done playing? I have nothing left to lose, and if I have to destroy this building and you, I will. I kept my voice hard and hoped neither of them could see how my knees were trembling. Carolyn snarled at my side, and I glanced down to see his red fur fluffed and tail bristling. Are you threatening the ruler of Japan? Tomohito Takamoto said, staring at me, his body stiff, his English stilted but understandable. Are you speaking of yourself in the third person? Yes, I am. 
After all, you've been trying to kill me for three months. Some of your idiots just crossed the line by blowing up the business of the closest thing I have to a family. Then they tried to kill me. I'm done. End this now, or I will. I had no clue how to do that other than what I had threatened, and that made me sick to my stomach. A string of Japanese and a sly look from the Royal Merlin. They are planning on killing you now. I have an idea. Do you trust me? It will take a minute or two. Carolyn's voice whispered in my mind. Always, I said out loud, then looked at the two of them. Trying to kill me? Even succeeding? Won't solve your problem. I can promise neither of you will live to see that inheritance. Or we can work together and maybe come to a compromise. I was bluffing. I had no idea how to fight. And while I could pull the building down around us, it didn't mean they'd die or that Joe and her family would be safe. A sharp pain pierced my mind, familiar and almost welcome. I did not think you understood Japanese, Yamato said. I don't. Some things are obvious. Choose. Work with me or die trying to kill me. I'll just kill you. I have no need to work with anyone. And I want the research James had. He sneered at me, and I braced myself for a magical attack. To my surprise, the emperor reached into his desk and pulled out a gun, pointing it at me. Carolyn snarled. I just felt my anger increase. A gun? Really? Did your pet mage not tell you who I was? What I am? I'd been using my chemistry classes to help identify elements, but gunpowder was easy to sense, and I knew where it was. With a whisper of a thought, I called fire to the rounds in the chamber. Stop! Yamato yelled, the word sharp and explosive. I didn't bother to listen, but made the offering to the gunpowder and the cartridges. At least I tried to limit it to that. The gun exploded in his hand. Shrapnel went flying out in a radius. They stopped midair, only a few pieces embedded in his hand. The Merlin glared at me as they fell to the ground. Oops. I guess killing the ruler of Japan might be a bad idea. I watched blood drip from his hand to the pristine desk, and I didn't care. You useless waste of magic. You will pay for that. No one spills his blood. The words translated in my mind, and I bared my teeth at him. My blood coats your floor. I see his as less valuable than my own. If you want to kill me, go for it. I took all the blood, skin, the tears leaking down my face from pain, and offered it to magic. I felt the acceptance and the question, but I didn't know what to ask for, so I waited for them to make the next move. There was a long look between the two men, and, wrapping his bleeding hand with a pure white handkerchief, the emperor nodded at the Merlin. I braced myself for the attack. I love you, Joe. I'm so sorry. This is all my fault. The Merlin lifted his hand and snarled at me, and I tried to figure out the attack, how to block or defend. A spike of pain slashed through my mind, hard and brutal. I stumbled back, wondering if this was how I would die. I think not. The voice of someone I didn't remember ever hearing before spoke in my mind, and I saw the two men flinch. A bird appeared out of nowhere and flew up to sit on the top of the computer monitor, his claws piercing it. Glass crunched and fell to the desk as sparks crackled between his talons. Hisahito Yamato. James would be ashamed of you. Do you think he would approve of this? I stared at the bird, unable to process what I saw. About the size of a large falcon, his feathers were white, blue, and green with a tail that fell in loose curly feathers to the floor, a rainbow of blues and purples. It shimmered as I looked at it, and I didn't know if that was my exhaustion or heat. Astonished Japanese burst from the Merlin as he stared at the bird. Carolyn translated seamlessly into my mind so I could understand. Geogas, you died. I saw you die. James mourned you. He had wide eyes, 
and I could see a trail of sweat appear along his hairline. Of course you did, and of course he did. He knew my nature, as he also knew he would die before I regenerated. Did you not remember what I am? Amused contempt filled the voice. Those don't exist. They aren't real. I heard the denial even through the language barrier, though Caroline did a fair job of making sure I got intonation as he translated. And the dragon that keeps the child of heaven safe is a mirage. The Merlin sputtered, then stiffened. It is still my inheritance. He broke off as the bird slashed his wings at him. It is not. It is hers, and you know it. I warned James that you were too greedy to allow anything to prevent you, but he still remembered the boys you had been and refused to see the man you were. He was a changed man, but he had his flaws. One of them was remembering people as they had been, not as they were. So listen to me now. Something changed in the timbre of his voice, and it rippled through my heart and mind as he spoke. Coruscant Monroe is the mage I felt emerge with James Wells before my burning. The inheritance is hers. I avow it as the focus from the spirit realm. Yamato growled, and Georgas raised his wings, exposing the colors of light blue darkening to purple. Hear me now, Hisahito. If she is killed or dies and it is in any way related to you, I will take you back to my realm, and you will be my toy until my next rebirth, which should take centuries. Cease this nonsense and provide reparation for what you have done. It was implacable, and I felt a tremor of panic at the idea of that voice being turned towards me. Yamato sighed, and his shoulders dropped. I hear. My lord, do you accept? He had turned to the emperor at this last part. I had no idea what their ruler's name was, and really didn't care. The man looked at his Merlin, then the bird, then me. After a long moment, he spoke. Am I to assume if I did not agree, the same consequences would affect me? Georga settled his wings back down. That would be a wise assumption. A brief look of anger flittered across his face, but then he gave a short, sharp bow, eyes never leaving the birds. Very well. The Emperor of Japan will cease the attempts to direct the inheritance. Japan will not interfere with Korosan Monroe after this point. She is considered Athama to this court, and word will be spread that she is neither to be attacked nor helped. There was a layer of spite to his comments that made me blink, but I'd take what I could get. The odds of me ever needing to work with the Emperor of Japan were fleeting. Tamahito Takamado, your vindictiveness knows no bounds. So be it. Georgas turned to me. Are you satisfied, young mageling? I swallowed past the lump in my throat and straightened my shoulders. They need to pay for the damage done to my friend's business. And what damages I cause protecting myself at Georgia Mage Tech. A stiff nod from both men. Excellent. I will be following up on this, Georgas warned. Japan keeps her word, the emperor replied icily. I would expect nothing less. Corey, are you ready to leave? I looked around at the time bubble. Don't I need to collapse it? It will collapse as soon as you step into my realm. I wish to speak with you. And if that didn't sound ominous. Epilogue The best mage is fat, happy, and with all their needs taken care of. Unhappy mages are deadly. Chin Proverb A spike of pain and an entrance to another plane opened. Enter, Koi. A healer is waiting for you. Step through. 
I glanced at Carolian as he rose and walked towards the gap. With a sigh, I let the magic go with an apology. A burst of humor washed around me and then was gone. As I stepped into the other side, a rush hit me. It felt like I'd slammed 20 ounces of Stinky's Mexican coffee, and that thought made me worry about Joe and the Guzmans all over. How could I have forgotten? What was that? And I need to get back. People were hurt, and the Guzmans... I protested, turning to look at the bird. Your friend is fine. You've been gone approximately 15 minutes. The time you spent here will not be noticed. Now, allow Esmir to see your wounds. Giorga said. His voice remained friendly, but at the same time, I recognized arguing with him would be like arguing with the wind. I turned to see Esmir padding towards me. I expected Caroline to go running to her, but he just sat next to me, purring. You seem to have damaged yourself. Remove the leggings. She sat in front of me, looking at or through me. I wasn't sure what she saw. With a shrug, I pulled off my jeans. It wasn't like they even had any concept of nudity, so stressing over that seemed stupid. I must apologize for my lateness. It took me a full decade for rebirth. The loss of James struck me hard, and it took time. Otherwise, I would have found you sooner. Um, what? I had no idea what he was talking about. With a trill of music, he settled his wings as he sat on a branch across two rocks. I found it odd how the landscape always matched their needs. Or maybe because they created it, it always did. That was an interesting idea. James and I felt you emerge all those years ago, but it was days before my ash day, and I couldn't go find you. I knew James was dying, but I didn't think he would go within weeks. Normally going from ash to flesh takes a year, maybe two. I felt his loss even in between forms. It hurt. It took me a full eight years to rehatch, then another year or so to get to a point my memories and my form could be of use. I was always going to come find you, let you know you were his chosen heir, but magic had other ideas. He said magic like it was a person, not a thing. Okay, thanks. Why? I had so many questions, I didn't even know where to start. You were the one to follow him. In normal times, you would have had me or Kellyan from the day you emerged, helping you and guiding you. But things didn't go as we planned. So many questions burbled in my mind, but I didn't know which to ask first. Why? How old is Kellyan? And who is we? Again, that trill of sheer amusement. He is only two weeks older than you think. He was freshly weaned when he went to you. As to why? Because you are a young mage of great power. Magic requires we assist her heralds. Wait, herald? Me? I swear, if I'm the chosen one, I'm running away. Now! That caused all three beans to start hacking and laughing. I watched them all, eyes narrowed. I was about to yell at Carolian when I realized my arms and knees didn't hurt. Hey, it doesn't hurt, I said, glancing at Esmir, who seemed to be laughing too, then focused on my wounds. The burned areas on my arm were pink and didn't ooze, while the scrapes on my knees were mostly gone. No, I helped heal. Small offering, as you had so much there to use already. I didn't know what to make of that, but before I could follow up on it, Georgas spoke. I lived with James long enough to understand your reference to a chosen one. No, you are not. There is no fabled savior or anything else. Herald simply means you are a representative of magic itself. Most of your Merlins are, though few realize it or recognize it. The actions of Japan against you were found to be against the wishes of magic, hence her assistance. You and magic are tightly woven, 
though you still have yet to explore how much, some day you will understand. I glared at him. Partial information did me no good. Tell me now. I need to know this. Georges tilted his head one way, then the other, looking like a painted magpie as he did. If I explained to you how to fly, what muscles it would take, the flex of my pinions and tail feathers, would it enable you to understand what flight is like? No, I don't have wings or tail feathers. Exactly. So how can I explain to you things about magic that you have no foundation to understand? I will when you are ready. It is impractical to explain now. He shifted his attention to Esmir. Is she well? Well enough. The damage was mostly superficial, though painful. I accelerated natural healing and soothed the pain receptors. She should be fine in a few days, Esmir said, sitting in the Egyptian cat pose. Thank you, I said with gratitude in my voice. Those burns had hurt, and only fear had kept me moving. Then let us return you. I would advise keeping up your lessons with Banyarl. It is not often one such as he designs to train a human mage, much less three. Chiorga said, watching. I gave him a tired smile. Carolian chooses good queens, or so he tells me regularly. I can see that, Chiorga said, and I thought the expression on his face might be a smile. With the beak, it was hard to tell. I looked around the area. It wasn't like the glade of Banyarls. Instead, it reminded me of a jungle, with vines and colors everywhere. Every flower shone like the brightest image I'd ever seen, and colors I hadn't realized could exist in nature. There were no birds, but the area felt alive. It felt safe. Thank you. I figured I'd die there. Wasn't sure how to win without killing a lot of people, and I really didn't want to do that. But I would do anything for Joe and her family. Yes, your restraint has been noted. Tursain spoke highly of you and what you call cake. I grinned. While well, having Tursain speaking of me caused visions of fear to run up and down my spine, the cake aspect was amusing. I took a deep breath pausing for a second to enjoy the sweet-tasting air. What do I owe you for the assistance? Nothing is free. I expected something. I didn't know what. Ah, there is truth there, but you owe me nothing. James was well-liked and earned many favors over the years. I promised him when I asked I would find you. It is to my eternal sorrow it was as late as it was. What did you promise him? I didn't ask the second part about what hold a dead man could still have. Just to help guide you on your journey. Magical heralds find life more interesting than they might expect or want. But you have an excellent focus in Kaelian. I am sure, if my presence or guidance is needed, he will let me know. The warning, an unsubtle hint, was obvious, but Kaelian washed his face, ignoring the phoenix sitting not six feet from him. Oh, Hesmir, he is your son. Yes, I know. She purred at the words, and her pride was evident in them. Everyone, thank you, but I need to get back. I ached to make sure Joe was okay, and Indira, Charles, heck, all of them. And for all I knew, the school would expel me. I would. The amount of damage I did to that building alone would be worth suing me into bankruptcy. The desire to hide here for a very long time whispered at the back of my mind, but I pulled myself up and smiled. Please? Georges looked at me for a long time, then waved his left wing. A square ripple, the first I'd seen, opened before me. I shall follow your life with interest. Spirit Merlin Corsand Munro, I suspect many things from you. I shivered at his words. That didn't sound like a nice, quiet life. She will be a great queen. You will see. 
Carolian rose and twined around my legs as the door to the university resolved. Oh, that I have no doubt. Be well, Coruscant. Georgas gave a weird parting whistle as I stepped through the door into the dust-filled arena. Indira lay there coughing. The brother assassin was gone, and the walls moved to reveal Joe looking in at me. I met her eyes, and we both smiled. No matter what, I'd be okay. Appendix. Magic Symbols. Chaos. Entropy, fire, water, time. Order, pattern, air, earth, transform. Spirit, soul, relativity, non-organic, psychic. Author's Notes This is book three in Twisted Luck, based in the Turnian universe. I have so much more planned that I can't wait to show you. If you loved this novel, please take the time to leave a review. You will be amazed at the difference it makes. I swear I'm working on a short story that you'll be able to get via my newsletter, all about Charles Wayne Scott and Erichina. Sign up to receive it. If you'd like to stay in touch, you can follow me on social media at the following places. Website badashpublishing.com Facebook facebook.com slash badashbooks Twitter twitter.com slash badashbooks Instagram instagram.com slash badashbooks bookbub bookbub.com slash profile slash Mel Todd And book four is now available to order! Get Inherited Luck now! If you're interested in free books, keeping up with what is going on in my life, as well as sales and launch announcements, you can sign up for my newsletter at my website. You never know what freebies might be in it. Take care! Mel Todd has over 20 stories out. Her urban science fiction, Kalid Chronicles, the Blood War series, and the new Twisted Luck series. Owner of Bad Ash Publishing, She is working to create a place for excellent stories and great authors. With over a million words published, she is aiming for another million in the next two years. Bad Ash Publishing specializes in stories that will grab you and make you hunger for more. With one co-author and more books in the works, her stories can be found on Amazon and other retailers.